9 a.m. So why don't we go ahead and get started with the May 22nd, uh, 2024 meeting of the Santa Cruz County Board of Supervisors. I'll turn it to the, cl the clerk for a roll call vote. Certainly. Supervisor Koenig. Here. Friend. Here. Hernandez. Here. McPherson. Here. And Chair Cummings. Here. Uh, second item on our agenda is consideration of late additions, revisions, and deletions. For today, I'll turn it over to uh, County Administrative Officer Carlos Palacios. Yes, uh, Chair Cummings and members of the board, we do have uh, several corrections on the regular agenda. Item number seven, there's additional materials. There's a revised attachment E, packet page 18, which is replaced. Two sub points were added to slide seven. The last bullet point on slide seven should read forensic evidence collections and analysis successfully employed on 89 of 107 case related digital devices, 83% success rate. On the item number nine, there's additional material. There's a revised attachment F. Packet pages 48 to 64 is replaced. Corrections to various slides. On the consent agenda, item number 19, there's a revised attachment A. Packet pages 195 through 215 are replaced. The finalized resolution is included. The new attachment insert inserted after page 215. That concludes the uh, correction to today's agenda. All right, thank you very much. Next item on our agenda is moment of silence and pledge of allegiance. Are there any board members who'd like to dedicate today's moment of silence? Okay, seeing none, we will uh, just observe a moment of silence. Y'all, please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, indivisible, with liberty and Okay, at this time, we will have a general public comment. This is an opportunity for members of the public to address us on items that are not on the board's agenda, uh, items on consent. And if you wish to speak to an item on our regular agenda, uh, you will not be able to speak when that item is heard, but you're able to speak to it now if you're not able to stay for that item. So with that, I'll invite up the first member of the public here in person. We'll have two minutes. I don't think this is on the regular agenda. My um, thank you for your hard work on all this. My name is Laura Chatham, and I'm a, a member of the County Mental Health Advisory Board, but I'm speaking for myself here today. I am also a math, retired math teacher, and I have some numbers for you. I went to visit the main jail a couple of weeks ago with a small group of concerned citizens. The main jail... that we would also like to see, thank, we would all like to see. Thank, thank you so much. Thank you. 
Chair, I'm so sorry to interrupt. We're experiencing a technical difficulty. Okay. Uh, we would need to pause the meeting for a moment to resolve this. Okay. Well, then let's uh, take a quick break until we can resolve this technical issue. Could I ask if my if my um, statement was recorded properly? We can ask the clerk. Testing Zoom, is Zoom able to hear testing? Zoom, Zoom can hear you. So much share, we've resolved the issue. Okay, we can resume public comment for folks who are here in person. Welcome. Hi, thank you. Good morning. My name is Julie Misasovic. I'm a licensed psychologist and executive director at Walnut Avenue Family and Women's Center, but more importantly, I'm a mother. Um, I'm also a commissioner on the Justice and Gender Commission. So first, I'd like to express gratitude for the reopening of Blaine Street and designating funding for education and therapeutic opportunities for incarcerated folks. We know from data that the majority of women in jail are survivors of crime themselves, and their trauma has likely contributed to the reason that they're incarcerated. Walnut Avenue provides support groups focused on healthy relationships in Blaine Street, also at the juvenile halls in Monterey and Santa Cruz. The reason we facilitate healthy relationship groups is to break cycles of intergenerational violence, relationship abuse, and the associated trauma. During these groups, the women are talking about their families, their kids, and other relationships and how important these relationships are to creating a sense of hope, a drive to get out of jail, and to stay out of jail. My point is that contact visits with family are crucial for inmate mental health. They're also a driving force for reducing recidivism. My second point is that in my experience of over three decades of working with children who have experienced trauma, including residential facilities for foster youth, I've witnessed all too often the suffering and the multitude of side effects that result from separating a child from their parent. In fact, children who are separated from their parent that separation and connection can be the determining factor for that child's mental and physical health, as well as their ability to develop the resilience and the self-regulation skills that are needed to keep them out of the same cycle of trauma, crime, and incarceration. If the intended outcomes of incarceration include rehabilitation and real genuine accountability, and if we wanna stop these cycles of violence, mental illness and intergenerational trauma, and if the end goal is keeping families together in safe and loving environments, we must do everything to reinforce healthy bonds, teach parenting skills, and encourage safe interactions between parents and children. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, supervisors. Thank you so much for letting us talk. I am Lynn. I'm the executive director of Casa of Santa Cruz, and I am also a member of the Justice and Gender Task Force, like my colleague, Julie, um, who so eloquently talked about what I'm here to talk about today, which is um, the most obvious, essential childhood right, and that's the right to run into the arms of your mother when you are hurt and scared. And right now in our jails, our, we don't have contact visits. And we know that when kids fall, right? You can all picture this. When a toddler falls, what happens? They look up, they run into their mother's arms, right? Or their father or their, their person, right? They run into them. Sometimes all they need to do is get close to them physically. We are stopping that from happen, happening in our jails. And make no mistake about it, when we unfortunately have to imprison somebody, that is a trauma for the person's child. That is traumatic. And we know there's bodies and bodies of research, which Julie alluded to, that when children are traumatized, they will have better outcomes for the rest of their life 
if they have the right to that thing which comforts them, which is their parents. Yeah, it is touching and hugging and running into the arms of their parents. So when you're thinking about budget issues today, it's a very serious issue in front of you all today, please, please, let's try to ensure that our children have the most basic thing, which is the right to a hug. Thank you. Thank you yep. for all that you do for our children. Hi, my name is Mace. I also too um, volunteer at Blaine Street every week and doing rehabilitation. And I have seen not one woman has been in my class that has not dealt with some sort of physical, mental, or childhood abuse. All of them are driven to be able to see their families again, to be able to see their children most of all. I've seen such great progress in them having their knitting program, having their rehabilitation program, and they're soaring. From when they came in, they were lost, they were struggling. I had a woman tell me, I'd rather walk the streets of San Francisco than ever be back and walk the streets of Santa Cruz again. The amount of brutality that the women are having and they're scared and they're alone on the streets. And half the time, more than half the time, they're scared to be released because their medications, they won't have their medications or being able to have their, um, the, the medication be able to help them with their cravings. And I think that we really need to put more programs into Blaine Street because it is working. What we have is working. And I really know Santa Cruz County really doesn't want to put more money into the jails. And it's really hard, but we have to because we these, will, these women will be out in the streets and causing more harm to themselves and other people if we don't figure out more programs and getting them more help and being able to connect them with their children. I really appreciate you guys for listening to me. I'm on the board of directors, Santa Cruz Community Health. I'm also CRC and I do neighborhood courts and restorative justice. And I am seeing these programs work. And I'm hoping that we can put more into the budget of helping these women in the jails. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good morning, Mr. Chair and members of the board and staff. My name is Sarah Newkirk, and I'm the executive director of the Land Trust of Santa Cruz County and the president of the campaign for the Water and Wildfire Protection Act. And I'd like to just quickly speak to you on agenda item number 19 on the consent agenda. Um, we received notification from the county clerk last night that the signatures that we have submitted in support of advancing the measure to the ballot in November were deemed sufficient. You have that in front of you, and I'm very, very grateful that you have uh, taken or you're about to take the action to call for an election on the measure. Um, I'm also grateful to all five of you for your expressions of personal support for the measure, which will do uh, incredible good in our county for our community uh, by helping us do accomplish projects that will uh, protect from water quality impairment, reduce fire risk, provide for wildlife habitat, and connect our citizens and their children to open spaces throughout Santa Cruz County. Um, I look forward to coming back before you sometime in the future in hopes of having a resolution of support from the whole board in support of the measure. Um, but with that, I just want to thank you for your actions today. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Mabel Rodriguez. Um, this is my first time speaking. So um, I am um, a member of the IHSS um, SEIU 2015, and I'm also a preschool teacher. And in both categories, I see that um, we require a lot of training, um, special, you know, to address um, a high expectation of our performance and knowledge to how to uh, take care of our client. So I'm asking you to please, um, our contract's coming up, and when you do your budget, you think about us. Um, I've been doing uh, 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 caregiving for 25 years to a non-verbal, mentally and physical client. And I need to be CPR trained, oh, actually all of us are required CPR training, know how to care for our client, whether it's medication, how to bathe them, how to uh, emergency, how to process their food, 
all that to uh, enable our client to be uh, feel like they're just one of the member of society to feel included, loved, and inclusive. Um, but it's hard for us because Santa Cruz County is the highest, you know, cost of living. And to see someone with all our expectations from us, to see someone, all they have to know how to do is that, you know, push that basket of fries in that oil and they get $20 an hour. We are with all this expectation is only getting 1875. So the temptation of us and need is high for us to leave what we're doing, which we don't want to, because we do it because we we care and we love what we do to make a difference. Thank you very much. Hi. Um this is my first time speaking to you. My name is Nicole Brantley, and um, I'm coming to you with lived experience. Um, I want to start by saying next year or next month on June 13th, I'll be celebrating nine years of sobriety. Um, I've also um, dealt with the FCS system and have been in jail and prison. And now I'm currently working at the Parent Center as a parent mentor for other parents that struggle with addiction. And I want to strongly encourage um, the Board of Supervisors to support contact visits with parents in jail. I know what it's like not being able to see your children. When I was in jail, my daughter was not even two years old and it killed me not to be able to see her. I wrote her letters every day, hoping that her caregivers would read them to her and that she would know that I was thinking of her. When you're in jail, you don't have a lot else to do, so you're always thinking about what is happening on the outside. Is she sleeping okay? Did she start saying words? Does she know that I love her? So many people that go into jail struggle with addiction. I personally want to help them. But even if we are going to punish them, jail is enough punishment. Um, we don't also need to keep their children from them. Um, my kids were my biggest motivator and are still my motivator today to stay sober and to keep me from going to jail. When you are on the inside, you need things to anchor and motivate you and to connect you to the outside to remember why you don't want to end up back in jail. Being able to see and hold your kids gives people that reminder and motivates them to get out and stay out. I will close with this. I hope that the Board of Supervisors will do the right thing and ask the Sheriff's Office to bring back contact visits for parents and children. The families in this community deserve it and need it. And I honestly believe that it will be a better change for our community in the long run and have people living an honest and true life and be productive members of society, just like me. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Yvette Atkins. I am here on behalf of the Parent Center, a nonprofit agency in Santa Cruz that serves families involved with child protective services including providing family time visits between parents and children that have been placed in foster care. Our agency's mission is to support reunification of parents and children, as all research demonstrates that children do best when they are with their parents or have strong connections to their parents and families. In line with that ethos, we strongly urge the Board of Super Supervisors and the Sheriff's Department to again allow parents in jail to have contact visits with their children. For those of the, you that may not know, prior to 2020, contact visits happened regularly. Our agency even helped to supervise the visits of families that were involved in child protective services. Now parents, even those who have not been found guilty of a crime, are only able to see their children through a glass wall or through a tablet with inconsistent connection that costs $15 an hour. For those of you that are not, that are parents, we invite you to imagine about what it would be like to not be able to hug, kiss, or smell your babies. Imagine your kiddos not knowing what happened to you or why they weren't able to see you or when they would see you again. Research shows that keeping families separated is not only detrimental and traumatic for children and families, it is bad for society as a whole. Parents that have contact with their children have more success with reentry when released from jail and are less likely to return to jail and children who have contact with their parents have better outcomes in nearly every measure. 
We understand that reinstating contact visits brings challenges. We also understand that this is not impossible. Nearly every county around us allows contact visits and we have have and we have had them here in our county prior to 2020. Our board of supervisors even approved a bill of rights for children of incarcerated parents in 2019, guaranteeing children the right to speak with, see and touch their parents. The value of these visits is indisputable and we all know and feel that it is the right thing to do. We simply need to make it a priority. We think that our children and families are worth prioritizing, don't you? Thank you. Thank you for your time. Good morning, Becky Steinbrenner. I support the last two speakers and I hope that you will allow parent contact in the jails with their children. I want to speak to you this morning about two items that are amazingly on the consent agenda. Uh, the first one is item number uh, 19. These are budget hearings, right? So why is the Board of Supervisors hiding the land trust ballot measure in the consent agenda for your approval today? And as Ms. Newkirk said, the certification wasn't even given until last night. This is wrong. Please take it off this budget hearing where people may not have even seen it and put it on the June 4th regular agenda ballot, uh, regular agenda. This is a tax measure that is going to be on the ballot. It is not a budget hearing matter. So please take it off. This is not uh, transparent at all. Um, the next item I wanna to speak to is item consent agenda item 23, county, county fire budget. County Fire is a public service uh, safety agency, just like the sheriff, like the probation. Why are they being relegated to the consent agenda yet again? Please, next year, <laughs> please do better and put County Fire budget on a regular uh, agenda during budget hearings. I really take exception and protest to the um, very vague information in general that is being presented to the public during these budget hearings. The drill line item drill down is nothing like that at all and nothing like what budget hearings included in terms of information to the public and to you in the past. A pie chart is drill down? I don't think so. Now there are charts that, are, that show very vague expenses, but in the instance of County Fire, there's no allocation of Prop 172 money. None of the public service budgets show Prop 172 public service money. Please, we can do better, and I ask that you give better level of information to the public. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Thanks for your service, commissioners. My name is Beth Friedman. I'm representing IHSS um, service providers and the SEIU 2015 union. And just here representing and encouraging you all to consider when you renew our contract to consider the pay raise that was quoted like a $20 an hour pay raise. The, the health benefits are really wonderful and I'm a particular proponent of keeping those. Very grateful for those. Um, of course, cost of living is something that people have addressed with Santa Cruz, but I want to speak to something I've spoken to this before is about retention. Um, I have been doing this caregiving. I've been in Santa Cruz for 20 years. I've been caregiving for five. Um, and I have been with the same client for that time, but I've seen everyone else come and go and sometimes very quickly. And it's actually a stressor on people who already have like the nervous systems are often in fight or flight. They they need like to be supported and for their own like self healing. That's kind of one of the areas of expertise because I also teach Qigong and I just see the stress of having to always hire new people because the retention issue with the pay is, you know, not sufficient for a lot of people. So I'd like you to consider this when you look at our contract. And um yeah, thanks for your consideration. All right. Have a good day. Thank you. Right. Thanks, Jeff. Okay, is there any other person who is present here in chambers who'd like to speak to us on items on consent, items not on the agenda, or items on the regular agenda that you're unable to stay for? Seeing none, we'll see if there's people online who'd like to speak to us on uh, public comment. Yes, Chair, we do have speakers. Katie, your microphone's now available. Hi, 
Hi, my name is Katie Mayetta, and I am a clinical uh, social worker who works in Santa Cruz County um, doing social change. And I want to start out, uh, start off by saying that I really appreciate how much work the Sheriff's Department has been doing over the last year with really um, kind of diving in deep on implementing Cal Ames, developing a MAT program, getting the uh, sober living or uh, the sobering center up and running again, and all the efforts that the sheriff has done to be committed to implementing Cal AIM throughout our system in Santa Cruz. But I want to come and talk to you as a child of incarcerated parents. And it's not my story that I want to tell. It's my brother's story. Um, my brother is eight years younger than me, and he was present when my mother was arrested. Um, and him and I kind of fell out of touch over the years, and I haven't really talked to him. And it wasn't until last year that his wife informed me that every time my brother at 32 ends up going to uh, or getting drunk, he talks about that week that my mother was in jail. It was one week, and he drinks a lot, let me tell you. So that story comes up for him years and years later. He was four or five years old when this happened. And in his mind, it was his fault that his mother got arrested. In his mind, it was because of him that this has happened. And so um, years later, this has still affected him. What we know about trauma is that trauma is not an event that happens. It's an experience that someone goes through. And we know that with trauma, we have to talk out the story and we need to do it fast or else children do not interpret the right things. My husband always says that uh, children are the best observers, but the worst interpreters. And so their stories that they create when their parents are in jail hurt. So I'm asking to really just focus on the children because those scars run deep and they're real. Um, thank you so much for your consideration and your time. Thank you. <laughs> Stephanie, your microphone is now available. Testing, testing. Yes, we can hear you. Okay. Thank you. Hello, everyone. My name is Stephanie brown -Liu. I represent Positive Discipline as their executive director. I'm also a local parent to a nine and one and a half year old baby daughter. Uh, Positive Discipline pre-pandemic had the ability to support our incarcerated population of parents and family members. Currently, we support our adult probation population of families looking to reenter their homes and feel effective in their parenting without the use of punishments or punitive bribes. Coming home, re-entering, and resuming a parenting relationship, it is a great source of hope and it is a great motivator. It is also a great source of anxiety. We know that contact visits for parents who are incarcerated supports a sense of belonging and reduces recidivism rates and allows for smoother re-entry into their homes and communities. We've seen the power of connection to mitigate the toxic environment and feeling of disconnection and self-hatred. Connection to a loved one and preserving a positive relationship with your child and co-parent, oh my gosh, it is, it's crucial. It is crucial to rehabilitate and it would mean that you're able to be the mother or father or caregiver that your child deserves as opposed to not even knowing whether you should make that phone call or attempt that virtual visit or even tell them about what it what it has meant for you to not be in the home with them. Small but meaningful changes can mean the difference between becoming systematically a part of the system to understanding that this is just one moment in your child's life and to reinvigorate that commitment to well-being and seeking resources to be your best healed self. I trust that the advocacy that you've heard today on behalf of our community of parents, caregivers, and service providers can really support reinstating and investing in contact visits. Thank you so much. Bernie, your microphone's now available. Yeah, buenos dias, chair and board. Um, I want to uh, foremost just kind of congratulate one of the speakers on her sobriety. You know, uh, keep up the good work. Um, I am Bernie Gomez with Milpa, and I also want to continue to irritate, irritate uh, the, the need for contact visits. Right, I know that this board may feel like you don't have a say so in it, um, but I strongly encourage you to believe that you do. I strongly encourage you to uh, press the sheriff to do 
uh, his duty, right? And not relegate um, to saying that he's understaffed or that he's uh, not able to because um, understaffing or whatever it is that, that the Sheriff's Department is going to express. I read about it. I heard about it. Um, however, this is, uh, I'll bring up this, uh, again, I'll bring up the, the issue of the jail is about 40% empty, you know? Um, so there's something, something needs to happen in this department, uh, at this time, right? There needs to be a restructuring and a readjustment, um, and uh, I'll just I'll save my the rest of my comments around the sheriff's department for his presentation. But I do encourage you to think about the families um, that have kids, right? Um, you might think, well, we shouldn't be in jail. They should have gotten locked up. We shouldn't gotten in trouble. Well, that's beyond the fact. You know, the fact here is that we, we got to try to continue to keep these families together. Um, continue to the children to to just be in contact. It might not be the best place. But touch, physical touch, the voice, the feeling of the love, it just helps everybody all around. Thank you. Charlie, your microphone is now available. Hi there. This is Charlie Edie, uh, Edie Consultants. I'm the uh, consultant for Pajaro Dunes, and I'm speaking on item number 23, the CSA 4 budget. Um, we did get a chance to review the budget uh, at the kind of the last minute last week with Chief Armstrong, and we appreciated that opportunity. At this point, as you know, we're in the middle of an election to uh, change the assessment level to have a higher service level. And um, so we're hoping that this budget that you approve today will simply be an interim budget, and then we'll be back in August to uh, redo the budget for CSA-4. So uh, fingers crossed on that. Um, and then I would like to say that in the past, we've gotten these very detailed spreadsheets uh, well in advance, and it's been really uh, useful for the Pajaro Dunes people to understand the budget. Uh, we find that so far, at least, the new system is kind of difficult to really get the detail that we're looking for. And so I would hope that you could um, spend a little time with your administrative staff in, in thinking how we could get more to the uh, process we had in the past where we could get the detailed spreadsheets on that. But again, uh, we support the budget and uh, again, looking forward to a successful election and revising the budget later. Thank you. We have no further speakers, Chair. All right, and thank you very much. And thank you to all the members of the public who uh, made comments today. I will just say as a, um, a matter of process, the second item on our regular agenda today is gonna be a presentation of the Sheriff's budget. So um, we will be hearing from the Sheriff and he's here today and I'm sure he's heard all the comments um, that were brought up. So we won't have um, any response to those questions and comments at this point in time. We'll take those up during um, the Sheriff's presentation. I, I guess I will ask um, if staff as we're going into uh, the budget manager's overview of today, maybe you could speak um, with Director Pimentel, maybe if you could speak to some of the questions about details in the budget. So I know there's, you know, what's what's in the packet and there's a lot of other stuff online. And so maybe if you can kind of help people understand where they can find some of the finer details, maybe you can speak to that um, as part of your presentation. And so with that, we will move on to item number five, which is the budget manager's overview. And so I'll turn it over to Marcus Pimentel to kick us off today. Good morning, Chair Cummings and board members, Marcus Pimentel, your county budget manager. Um, let me just speak to that right, right off. Uh, our April 9th the proposed budget presentation, the slide deck had about four or five slides with some quick tips about how to navigate our website, including we have over 90 preset reports that could all be customized and modified to look at revenues or departments. And and once you clear, click down on any pie chart or bar chart, it, it drills down all the way to the line item of, of department budget. So it's really dynamic and flexible. You can then pivot that to say, well, I'm looking at one revenue item in a department and you can see that revenue item across all departments. So it's really dynamic in how it works. 
and uh, maybe in the future we can spend a little bit more time when we're not working on disaster recovery and everything like that and these budget hearings that allow for a little bit more time to help the public understand that or even um, be able to offer some more online or uh, 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 quasi budget st study sessions or presentations to the members of the public be happy to do that in the future uh, so good morning good morning chair uh, Cummings uh, I'm going to start with the first this slide deck. You're going to say, wait a second, didn't we just hear that? Yes, I'm repeating the first uh, 12, 14 slides or so. I'll get through them a little bit faster from yesterday. We're expecting that there's newer members of the audience and the community watching and presenting today. So I don't want to uh, just presume that I'll go back and watch the tape. So we'll we'll quickly review um, the overview of the budget and then we'll get down. I'll get down into overviewing the department categories that you'll see today. But we're going to continue public safety. Uh, we're going to move into land use, community develop, development, um, community services, which are uh, parks, public works, planning, housing, and such. And then we'll finish with capital projects today. Where we're at in our budget cycle, we uh, sort of started our budget hearing planning on with the major report on February 13th. That did the first forecast and update to the board on where this coming fiscal year was going to look and where our challenges were at. Um, one of the new developments we've seen is certainly the storm disaster response, certainly our federal disaster recovery and the, and the broken federal system that is impacting our, our need to issue the last Tuesday board action. With already up to $105 million in new debt for the county. Um, so we understand that disasters are a big issue. It's going to cost this county and taxpayers $33 million in issuing that debt over the life of the debt, and that's new costs that we hadn't incurred and that are not claimable. We're issuing debt because of the slowness in the federal reimbursement system. It's gonna cost us $33 million in new costs, and none of that is eligible for reimbursement. Um, so that's that's the challenges we face. Um, but what we've also seen, and one of the new things we're diving deeper into are unfunded mandates by the state and the state's continual programs where they're shifting services to us or reducing our funding to the county while still expecting us to maintain certain mandates. And we appreciate the board and, and all the staff who are working collectively on this. This board has been um, leading the charge and, and asking us to keep pushing harder. And we appreciate all those efforts with board members who are actively participating um, on the state mandated games committees, as well as uh, working behind the scenes. So today's is our third budget hearing. Uh, we're going to, after today, we'll continue the budget hearings to our fourth uh, on June 4th. That's our last day in concluding actions. And then we bring back the budget on September 24th. That budget on September 24th is modified to include the projected year end results, as well as the final format of the budget as presented to the state controller's office. The budget is prepared um, largely by our friends in the auditor controller treasurer tax collector's office. They do a lot of work over the summer. Um, and we, we, part we, we partner with that development. So that'll be the last element of this year's budget cycles on September 24th. Uh, as we talked about yesterday, and you'll hear probably a little bit more today, we also have the state budget that's presenting some challenges to us. We expect there might be some conversations um, more mature in August with this board about the impacts of the budget. Before the doom and gloom, um, this county is doing a lot of amazing work, uh, and we continue to, and we will continue to do a lot of incredible work. Uh, these are just highlights of the countywide achievements, but you'll hear specific departmental achievements that are already contained in the board reports in today's packet, um, but will be highlighted as well with presentations today. Um, safe to say opening of the new South County Sub Government Ser Services Center in Watsonville will, is a huge multifaceted benefit to our community, reducing commute times, providing services to the bulk of the community where their services are needed, um, while we're also saving the county money over the life of, of that asset instead of leasing having five independent leases with different landlords and different rates of escalation. We now are a property owner and those lease rates are, are paying for the debt service to maintain and own that up that building. So we're really grateful for that uh, economic savings to the general general fund and county funds. Um, unveiling and developing the new child's crisis center um, that's in development now. That's a huge improvement in our community and already uh, HSA in partnership with local providers will be providing a resource for our youth to open a, a, a in partnership with the Watson Community Hospital an option and a resource for youth in crisis, well, they'll be able to have treatment and support services um, coming soon. And cool. much of these achievements are were highlighted in our April 9th budget presentation, where we encourage the public to really 
uh, watch that segment. Uh, CEO Palacios did a really nice job diving into the details and all that, but we're really proud of all the success we have. And we do have in front of you a proposed balance budget with the supplemental changes. Um, the problem with the balanced budget is that we've balanced it on the back of having to take some pretty big reductions. You heard about the reductions in health services yesterday. Uh, we've talked about the reductions in our general fund contingency. Typically, that's a 1% contingency available to respond quickly during the fiscal year to new new demands. Um, we've been able to budget at that at 1% of the general fund in, the, in over the last many years. That would have been 7.5 million. We dropped it to uh, 1.2 million this year. So over a $6 million reduction in that contingency, we have very little ability to respond to significant events uh, in this next budget cycle. We also eliminated all general fund funding to the capital projects. Last year, that was just over $5 million. There is no funding to that. And we've, we've talked about and we'll continue to talk about, and you'll hear a little bit later today about the capital projects of, uh, for our county. And that what we're essentially doing is going back to the great recession times when we've had to stop Collectively, agencies across the country had to stop investments in capital projects, um, which increased their deferred maintenance cost and increased the cost of, of doing capital projects in the future just to maintain operations. And unfortunately, we're having to do that in this budget cycle. I feel like if folks want to spend a lot of time in our natural disaster financing, the last Tuesday's May 14th uh, board agenda item really does in the details. But again, I want to reiterate, uh, we've had to issue up to $105 million in authority for debt. We expect the actual number in disaster findings to be about $80 million for, for the 2023-2022 storm disasters, as well as the 2020 CZU disaster that we are still waiting on nearly $10 million of unpaid claims. Um, so we've had to finance and issue debt it's going to cost taxpayers in the county $33 million over the life of the bonds because of the delays in the federal uh, reimbursement system. Again, the, the, the board presentation and the materials from last Tuesday to dive into this in a lot of greater uh, detail. As this board has known and, and helped us frame uh, discussions around just the complications and the uniqueness of our particular county, we are unlike most counties. Uh, most counties might have 20% of their population that they provide direct services for. Half of this county's population is relying on the county to be a city. So we function as the biggest city in the county, um, providing direct municipal-like services to over half of the county's population. That's atypical. Um, counties are typically in around the 20% range or smaller. Um, so we, we have to spread tax dollars over a greater base to provide municipal services as well as county-mandated services. Um, in addition to that, we're systematically unfunded, underfunded, and we've talked about that. Um, we are in the bottom right quadrant of the per capita funding levels and the population served. Uh, most communities have a higher uh, per capita property tax allocation. This isn't the rate that the taxpayers pay, it's just how much comes back to the counties. In our county, um, we get about 13 cents on the dollar in total. Uh, most counties on average are 20 cents on the dollar. That swing, if we just got a different allocation formula, not the same tax, the same rate and the same payments by taxpayers, but if we got just the county's average across the state of California, that's $36 million more every year the general fund would have to support programs and services. Um, our friends in Monterey County, if we had their allocation methodology, that's $80 million more uh, a year. And you know, we've talked about sales tax. We're losing at least $5 million a year and sales tax that our residents are paying online, and that that is being diverted to other counties due to um, uh, discrepancies and 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 um, anomalies in in the state's regulations about how sales tax is allocated. So we continue to get uh, a lost revenues. We are underfunded. We are these are allocation rates, not what taxpayers are paying. We're not. This wouldn't be a scenario where taxpayers would pay more. Just we get our fair share, and we're certainly underfunded for that. And a lot of the states back in the 1970s with Prop 13, we've talked a lot about that. Within moving into the proposed budget, uh, we have a proposed with supplemental changes at 1.15 billion. That sounds like a big number, and I appreciate the questions yesterday. Just trying to understand the size of our budget, and really, when you peel back all the federal programs and mandated uh, service areas that we must fund in the special restricted revenues we receive. Um, this really dives all the way down to about $220,000 a year, or excuse me, $220 million a year, um, that the board has discretion over of our general property tax base. Um, the $1.15 billion county budget is less than 
last year's budget by 135 million. So we're 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 declining and decreasing the size of our budget across the entire county. Um, a few of these slides in here are, are more for reference perspective to help the public just get a quick summary. Uh, this is a busy slide, but it tends it, it captures our revenues and expenditures, expenditures, how much is supported by the the county budgets across categories, and these are the categories that we bundled departments. So general government, health and human services and such. It also shows the changes with staffing levels. Um, we are proposing a budget, recommending a budget that reduces county positions by 25 positions, 25.3 um, over last year's adopted budget. Diving down into a little bit more into which departments are seeing position changes, uh, the schedule highlights in yellow, uh, the proposed and supplemental ch uh, position changes in total, again, reducing the county's workforce position by 25.3 positions. And you'll see the the, the variances. The, the biggest reduction is health and health services agency, who in yesterday really dived into the details of what is driving their need to um, reduce the workforce by 39.5 positions, 28 of those are COVID positions that we knew were gonna land, end and were hired with expectation that this is their last year of funding, but that's still 28 positions that are gone. Um, that still leaves 11 positions that were reduced that the county was unable to help sustain. Um, that's due to shifts in $10 million worth of funding that went from the county to the state to allocate through the Calhoun process. So. Um, Again, just another uh, another example of how we're being uh, asked to to do more um, with less resources. The general fund forecast in our out years we recognize needs to be updated. Uh, this last model was updated in March on our, assuming the general fund was going to have some higher allocation of debt service costs for the disaster debts funding. Fortunately, with the package presented to the board last Tuesday, uh, we'll be able to reduce and defer the general funds portion of debt service over these next couple of years. That's 1.5 and $4.4 .4 million. We still have projected cash flow deficits in those years, but at least the, the gap is shrinking a little bit. And we'll update this schedule um, following the state budget when we get into a deeper dive of what are the impacts of the state budget? What does it mean for the county and what types of lost revenue programs we have to uh, impact? Uh, so we'll update that sc the schedule by September 24th, as well as factor in the new debt service model when we issue the debt uh, next month. As a reflection where our reserves stand, so we talked about our contingency being shrunk. Fortunately, we're able to keep our 10.5% reserve level. Um, it's the In my career, it's the lowest reserve target I've ever been around uh, typically you know in, in cities you'll see that level at 15 percent a 20 percent as high as 24 percent um, for us at 10 and a half percent is still a decent reserve it's above our seven percent minimum reserve um, but we're dependent on medical funded programming for capital expansion in that reserve and if we take out those health services directed funding that's a general fund department cash flows available for medical projects if we take that out we're left about 5% uh, uh, available reserve, and that equates to two and a half payroll cycles. And we've talked about this uh, quite a bit. Uh, our general fund expenditures, again, I'll move quickly through these. We're proposing a revised uh, general fund budget at 778,000. Um, the supplemental increased our size of our general fund budget by $24.2 million. You heard 19 million of that was related to health services with some grant funding and federal medical Medi funding that, that is being recognized in next year's budget. These are not expansion of programs, just recognizing revenue and supporting programs and service delivery. Um, outside of that, there are smaller changes that are detailed in the supplemental budget as a separate PDF and each department's board letter and presentations today will identify those supplemental changes. So let me get into public safety and justice. Uh, I'll, I'll re preview the category as a whole, and then you'll have presentations uh, today by the district attorney, public administrator, and the sheriff coroner. Yesterday, you, re you concluded yesterday's budget hearings with presentations by the public defender office and probation department. Um, our public safety and justice category has a total countywide uh, budget of uh, almost 200 million, 198.1 million. I'm sorry, 214 million. Of the 214.8 million, 198 is general fund. So um, in this next chart, you can see that top right pie chart. This this category of departments and services are really dependent on the general fund to help maintain their operations. 
whereas uh, most other categories you've seen um, they're you know 80 to 90 percent funded from other resources and depending on the general fund 10 to 20 percent uh, public safety has a 60 percent need uh, 60 percent of their budgets are covered by the general fund directly uh, the largest uh, allocation to the sheriff coroner's um, op operations. The position changes within the public safety category, um, largely status quo. There's two positions being added in the sheriff coroner's uh, department for the DNA lab um, and some other grant funded programs. Um, the DNA lab is a, a new and innovative project that has funding and this is a long term plan to provide support and expansion of DNA, DNA services. Uh, the public defender has, is adding six positions. You heard the presentation yesterday. Three of those positions are conver converting contracting positions to in-house staff. So um, we're adding positions, but we're saving on the contract side. And three of the uh, three of their six positions are added through the CARE Act implementation program. Um, when we're done with the district attorney and sheriff officer presentations will move into land use and community services category. You'll have presentations by parks um, department and then our combined uh, community development infrastructure department. Community development inf infrastructure were the former planning and public works departments, which will cover planning, housing, public works, operations, CSAs, as well as uh, road and infrastructure projects. So that will move into those departments. In total, that's 277 million in countywide funding um, budget authority, of which only 36.7 million is the general fund. So you've seen uh, community development infrastructure is the biggest part of this budget. And a lot of their funding comes from CSAs um, and special uh, revenues as well as enterprise funded revenues. So um, they're, they're largely leveraged with other funding sources. Um, and again, looking at their allocation of how much these departments depend on the general fund, um, much smaller allocations and uh, like most of the other county departments, um, almost entirely funded with other revenue sources. They're only as a category uh, using 6% of the general fund to maintain their operations. From a position count standpoint, uh, the community development infrastructure department is being reduced by 6.8 of that amount. 10 positions are being shifted from community development infrastructure into the general government category for capital projects and real property. So you heard some of that information yesterday. So it's not a reduction of workforce as it is a shifting from one department to the next. Um, they're adding some additional positions to the department that you'll hear about later today. Canvas licensing, uh, we're reducing that department by one. This, the, the complexity and revenue streams of cannabis licensing have changed since the beginning. We've talked about that in the last couple of years. The revenues have dropped in half. They've stabilized. Um, but they're nowhere near the funded level that we, we had expected or had seen in the first couple of years of operations. Um, you'll finish today with a review of the capital projects uh, program. Um, while the pie chart is full, it's very small. If I were to compare the funding in last year's budget to this year, there's only $431,000 in new projects. Last year we had, um, I think, well north of $7 million in projects and, and capital facility projects. Most of these projects are being funded through parks restricted funding sources. Um, so we're really seeing new projects for our parks and not much else, really nothing else going on in new projects for county other county facilities. But you'll get more of that information later today and some of the impacts or, or, or concerns about that. With that, I'll, I'll end my presentation and available for any comments. Um, and then following my presentation, we'll move um, into the uh, public safety um, presentations by the district attorney, community development infrastructure um, categories, and then capital projects. So, Great. Thank you for that presentation. Uh, before we come to the board for questions, I also just want to give um, our CEO, Carlos Palacios, an opportunity to speak to uh, Measure K and how the county is being impacted uh, currently uh, by Measure K. Uh, yes, uh, Chair Cummings, members of the board, we recently received some very important information regarding Measure K, which is the half cent sales tax, which was approved by the voters on March 5th ballot. Uh, recently, an individual has indicated that he intends to pursue an existing lawsuit over Measure K. This individual uh, would prefer that would have preferred that only voters in the unincorporated areas vote on it, despite Measure K's benefits going to the whole county. Uh, and despite having lost a preliminary injunction prior to the election, and despite voters in the unincorporated areas 
um, supporting the measure, approving it, as well as every jurisdiction in the county approving the measure. Um, the funds would have been generated by Measure K would have been seven and a half million dollars in this next year's budget um, because it would we would only start collecting actually receiving funds from it in October. On an annual basis, Measure K will generate about $10 million a year. Earlier, when the board put this Measure K ballot on, on Measure K on the ballot, uh, the board indicated that it was going to allocate funds from Measure K to support homeless services, housing, road and infrastructure projects, and parks. And there's a whole list of projects that have been um, listed by the board as potential recipients of Measure K funding. Unfortunately, state law says that if there is a lawsuit on the um, on on a sales tax measure, the funds would be collected, would be, but would be frozen. Uh, therefore, we wouldn't be able to spend any of those funds until the lawsuit is resolved. The lawsuit, if it is filed. It could take anywhere from six months to two years to resolve. During that time, the Measure K funds would be frozen uh, and not be able to be spent. So I just wanted to make sure that the board and the community are aware of that very important um, issue that's confronted us. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I'll open up to the board to see if there's any questions, comments on the presentation. Supervisor Koenig. Yeah, I'd like to make um, a couple uh, points. Uh, thank you again for the presentation and all. And um, I think you said 778,000 uh, one time, and I think you meant million, but uh, whatever, you know, numbers. But, um, you know, in Prop 13, I think it's difficult for some people to understand it, that I think uh, uh, the Board of Supervisors back in 1978 with Prop 13 were very frugal, and they set a low uh, bar so people wouldn't be hammered with their property taxes. Um, and to change that, I think we'd have to go through a whole state operation to say, everybody else, you have the 57 counties, uh, you give to us so we can up it from 13% to, I don't know, 30, or I guess we we, we lose 30% of uh, what the average is in the state. Is that basically correct? Uh, yeah, it, it, for us, it would probably feel more within the county. So it, it wouldn't be taking funds from other counties. It's just how the allocation is done within counties. Okay. And typically what what would happen is the state would the state has a responsibility to fund schools so any any losses that you might see going to schools would be picked up by the state so it, it you know we we recognize the political challenges in it yeah we're just trying to articulate um why it's why we're so limited in our abilities and some of it's just structurally built that we have very little control and very, yeah, there's, very, there's very an big unlikely, to unlikely path to correction or to increase that okay thank you Sweater Hernandez. No. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you for that presentation. With that, I'm going to we're going to move by, on. By the way, I want to just say too um, that um, as was mentioned really in this presentation, we have an award-winning uh, budget presentation and the package that Mr. Pimentel and under uh, CAO Carlos Palacios has got that said statewide at CSAC, you, you're doing the best job of anybody in the state so people can find out how your money is being spent. And I think that should be recognized and uh, congratulations to you and the whole staff, administrative staff. All right, thank you very much for those comments. So with that, we'll move on to item number six on our agenda, which is um, consent. And so I'll go to the supervisor friend to see if you have any questions or comments on consent. No comments on consent, Supervisor Koenig. Supervisor Hernandez, Supervisor McCann. I'm going to ruin this, but uh, just a couple things. Um, an item 19 that was uh, uh, referred to with the budget, the ballot measure on wildlife protection and uh, wildfire protection. Uh, it was clear that there was an adequate number of signatures to qualify for the ballot, although it was just qualified officially yesterday. So I think we're taking the appropriate action now to let people know what this is, this measure is about. Uh, it doesn't in the end, it's not that the Board of Supervisors is going to say yes or no, you can put this on the ballot. They got the signatures to get it on the ballot, and that's why it's going to be there on, in November. So I just want to make that clear. Uh, and, two th and a second thing on item number 25, the Office of Response, Recovery, and Resilience. Um, I want to thank OR 
three director, uh, Dave Reed and the staff for this budget and, and thank him for working so closely with my office in the CZU fire as I know as it was with others, but I've had big basin water and a variety of other issues in the last several years too, because of the storms and fires and so forth. Uh, we, we appreciate his ongoing efforts to uh, put it, pull down some grants. Uh, amazing what he has been able to accomplish is uh, really something. And with uh, climate action and adaptation also on his plate uh, and the office's plate, uh, there's a great deal of vision that will be required with uh, his work in addition to organizing emergency response and recovery. And I, I would like to add um, some additional direction, and I, I don't want to make this a habit. I mean, we had something like this yesterday as well, but we still have hundreds of uh, property owners going through the recovery and rebuilding process related to the CZU fire. And I'd like to explore the possibility of providing some extended case management support for those property owners through uh, the long-term recovery group, which uh, now is uh, a standalone nonprofit dedicated to continue working uh, with the disaster survivors. So. Um, I'd like to ask uh, that the county provide um, or consider uh, in the future uh, that not, I'm not recommending that we do this, but uh, provide $40,000 for part-time case management in fiscal, fiscal year 24-5. Uh, um, the private funding that used to underwrite that position is drying up, and that's why it's going to be needed if it's going to be continued. So the additional direction would be to have the staff explore uh, how we could add forty thousand dollars and believe me we've just got a, a dire a budget message i know to the last day actions for the office of response recovery and resilience um, for the uh, disaster case management and depending on what we learn uh, the future measure k funding and the other what the state's going to be doing and its unfunded mandates or how it's going to address its deficit uh, i we need to get that as a foundation but i would like to have us consider uh just uh, how we could get uh more funding to that office if um, if we could yeah. great so I'll return to Supervisor McPherson for a motion. I'd, I'd like to make the, the motion to accept the consent agenda with the additional direction on the long-term recovery effort. Okay. Motion. Second. Okay, so we have a motion by Supervisor McPherson with the additional direction by Supervisor Hernandez. And I'll just um, make some brief comments as well. I, um, I do also want to just reiterate um, what was said about item number 19, the, um, the land trust initiative. I uh, just want to congratulate all the people who were able to go out and get the signatures to <clears throat> put this on the ballot. Um, it's an opportunity for the community to weigh in and to determine whether or not they would like to you know, further contribute to our parks and open spaces uh, throughout the entire county. And, you know, um, approving this today is, you know, one step in the democratic process. You know, we the group went out and got the signatures. The signatures were validated and it's the job of the board to then put this on the ballot, given that they successfully were able to meet the number of signatures to get gathered. So this is not us trying to, you know, um, sidestep any form of, any part of the process. It's really us trying to support um, the, the democratic process that's before us. And so it will be up to the voters to make the final decision as to whether or not we would like to um, contribute to this effort. Um, as it relates to the, um, to the additional direction. I'm very supportive of that. You know, a lot of people are trying to rebuild and I will say that the um, long-term uh, disaster recovery group has been really um, instrumental in trying to help connect people to resources and services that they need to rebuild their homes. Um, they have just launched a partnership with the Mennonite Disaster Services and they're planning on building five to six homes annually using volunteer labor from across the nation for the vulnerable families without, in our districts who haven't been able to rebuild. And I think it's been a, a very, you know, we've been the District 3 office, my predecessor and myself and the District 5 office have been extremely committed to trying to help people rebuild as quickly as possible, knowing that some people don't have the necessary resources. And I believe that, you know, with the uncertainty with Measure K and with, uh, you know, support from the board, it's providing um, op an opportunity for um, our OR3 director working with our county CAO's office and other staff to try to see if we can find funds that would be able to contribute to this. And 40000 is a very small amount that can go a very long way for many people mm -hmm. who um, were victims of a devastating disaster in our community. And so I'm supportive of the uh, recommendation that's been made by the supervisor McPherson. Any other questions or comments on this item? 
So just as clarification, so that would be in the June 4th, the last day budget, yes. there would be whether it's possible and how it would be possible and what cuts would be needed if like we did for the other items yesterday. Okay. Thank you. All right. Okay. Any further questions or comments on consent? Seeing none, I'll turn to the clerk for a roll call vote. Supervisor Koenig. Aye. Friend. Aye. Hernandez. Aye. McPherson. Aye. And Cummings. Aye. That item passes unanimously. Okay, so with that, um, that's um, our consent item. So we will move on to our regular agenda. We're going to continue with public safety and justice. And so item number seven on our agenda is consider approval of the 2024-25 proposed budget for district attorney, public administrator, including any supplemental materials and take related actions as outlined in the reference budget documents. And I'll turn it over to our DA, Jeff Roselle. Welcome. Can you hear me now? Uh, good morning, Chairperson Cummings and board members. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to come before you today and talk about our proposed budget and ask for uh, the approval. Before we get started, I would like to thank uh, the CAO's office. I would specifically like to say thank uh, Mr. Palacios, Carlos Palacios, the CAO, Nicole Coburn, Marcus Pimental, and uh, more specifically, uh, our analyst, Sven Stafford, who has been instrumental in helping us um, get our proposed budget together. So the first thing that we'd like to talk about is our mission statement. It literally guides everything that we do in the DA's office, and that is to promote and ensure public safety through ethical and just prosecution. And similarly, the vision that we have is to foster a community where justice is served, public safety is paramount, and victims' voices are heard and valued. The guiding principles for us, and we would also submit uh, for, for this board, come from the California Constitution, Article 13, Section 35, that states public safety is the first responsibility of local government and local officials have an obligation to give priority to the provision of adequate public safety services. We in the DA's office follow various uh, bodies of law and mandates. Those are the United States Constitution, the Constitution of the state of California, California statutes, as well as the rules of professional conduct. Our duties are to protect the rights of victims, to protect the rights of defendants, which surprises some people, to review and investigate cases, and to prosecute cases and seek justice and act ethically. The district attorney's jurisdiction is laid out on this slide. And as you can see from this slide, every single law enforcement agency uh, in this county, and there's a couple that aren't on here, refer cases to the district attorney's office where we review these cases and make decisions about whether or not to charge cases and if we charge them, what to charge them with. Last year, the DA's office reviewed over 10,000 cases and of those 10,000 cases, we filed approximately 60% of those 6,000 cases. But the ones that are not filed still need to be reviewed by our office. And what that entails is going through body cam footage, which now exists on virtually every case, reading the reports, and spending a tremendous amount of time on the front end to make determinations about whether or not these cases should be filed. So a lot of our time is spent on cases that never make it to court, but nevertheless, because of our mandate, because of our job and what is expected of us, we still have the duty to go through these cases. 
of those 6,000 cases that are actually filed uh, and go to court, those cases are divided among the public defenders, alternate public defenders, as well as private attorneys. The organizational structure and leadership of the DA's office is laid out as follows. And it's funny, when you look at an org chart, uh, it's it, it gives you one piece of information, but what it doesn't really talk about are those people in the office that are absolutely committed uh, to a person, to making our community a safe place, and to making sure that victims' voices are heard and that they are represented in the criminal justice system. Our achievements, we're talking about this last year, uh, neighborhood courts is one of the things that we are extremely proud of. Neighborhood courts is a restorative justice program, a model that we started um, in this county. One of, I, I think we were the fourth in the state or thereabouts to start this program. Last year, we had 164 cases, and these cases are cases that are diverted from the criminal justice system. They don't go before the judges. Uh, public defenders don't get appointed. It is a tremendous cost savings for the system and for this county in many ways. Of those 164 cases that were referred, we have 114 cases that were successfully completed with volunteer panelists that are, that is members of the community who act as panelists that will lay out uh, measures to get a person who has committed uh, offenses back on track. 28 of those uh, cases have also been completed on a modified model. That model does not involve panelists. We have 17 from the last year that are still in the process and outstanding uh, in terms of achieving the end goal. And we have had five out of 164 that have been unsuccessful. In the consumer protection unit in our office, uh, we are still continuing in the statewide task force. Uh, they're in the process of obtaining a judgment, uh, an enormous judgment against nursing homes, protecting the elderly, that uh, they have caused new implementations in nursing homes uh, for monitoring and frankly unique uh, in our state and something that we are extremely proud of. They continue to do outreach to the elderly and uh, try to alert community members about pending fraud, which is, as we know, constantly evolving and changing. Community outreach and early intervention of underserved communities. The DA's offices in many jurisdictions simply focus on cases once they have come to them through law enforcement agencies. But we at the DA's office in Santa Cruz County have always and have really bumped up our efforts to do front end work so that communities have engagement, excuse me, and don't wind up in the court system. And we have done that through a number of uh, activities, the Victims Rights March, Trunk or Treat, Adopt a Family. Uh, we have touched uh, by all estimates about 6,000 people just last year with all of the early intervention and the things that uh, the Santa Cruz County DAs have done. Our third achievement that we are proud of is the forensics. As we've spoken about a moment ago, forensics, uh, phones, computers are now a part of virtually every case that comes our way. And one of the goals that we had listed last year, and I'm pleased to tell you that we have had uh, an 83% success rate in, is getting into digital forensics, getting into phones, finding valuable evidence that enables us to uh, go forward with cases and uh, bring justice to victims. You can see by the 2025 budget request, and I'm, I don't need to go through all the numbers, they're in front of you, that we have had some changes, and I would submit uh, moderate changes. Most of those involve personnel and benefit costs. Uh, increases for existing staff. And as stated in the board letter, and it is our goal uh, to intend to avoid reductions and avoid layoffs. 
Our primary budgetary goals uh, as laid out are to improve communication, education and transparency to the community. Number two, to enhance outreach prevention and early intervention practices. And number three, to augment resources and to assist with digital technologically forensic evidence and collection and analysis. We are uh, in criminal prosecutions uh, requesting a change of one uh, body. This person is to be a full-time departmental analyst. Uh, it's a limited term of two years. It is initially going to be funded by salary savings. And we are anticipating that this individual will be able to look at grants so that they can become self-funded. It ties in not only with the first goal that I mentioned earlier, which was to improve transparency uh, in the community, which an analyst will do, but also the second to enhance outreach and early prevention. Finally, in uh, the consumer environmental protection, we are looking at a status quo. We are not requesting any new asks in, in that. Uh, the general fund contribution uh, is uh, the same as it was last year. There is none. And we will report to you that we have a $5.8 million balance that is in a trust fund used to fund consumer protection, outreach, and criminal prosecutions. Finally, the Victim Witness Association program, and I know there was some questions about this. Um, we are not requesting a change in the personnel for Victim Witness. We are pleased to say that we have applied for and um, received about $380,000 in grant funding from the state. But uh, as you may know, the state has been cutting uh, and proposes to cut funds to victims and victim witness. So um, with that, you can see that the request that the DA's office is making um, is on this final page. It really includes one full-time uh, person, as we said, funded for two years, most of it to come out of uh, salary savings that we have on the front end. And with that, I would be open to any questions that the board may have. And um, I want to thank you for your time. Yep. Thank you so much for that presentation. And thank you all for the amazing work that you do for our county. Thank you. Um, with that, I'm going to open up to the public to see if there's any members of the public who would like to speak to us on the district attorney's budget. We're here in person. You will have two minutes to address uh, the board. Thank you, Becky Steinbrenner. Um, I looked at this budget on the award-winning budget site, which does not give very much information. I'm sorry, it won an award, but it's giving less and less information. Um, and I could not find how much Prop 172 public safety statewide money you're getting. You've gotten that in the past. And I, I didn't see any uh, clear uh, reporting of that. So I would like that information. Um, I want to thank you for especially the consumer uh, advocate that your office has. Uh, Mr. Brown is doing a, a great job. Um, is his position still self-funded by, yes, okay, so he's he's got to work hard to get his own paycheck. He's doing a good job. I want to um, congratulate him on past environmental violations, notably the Aptos Village Project and uh, going after them and getting a, a cursory amount, albeit, uh, for them pulling out a, a storage tank, a fuel tank, and hauling it out in the middle of the night. It was the only action that was ever taken, and I really appreciate that. Um, I want to find out what is happening in terms of credit card fraud. It's huge in this county. I've talked with Mr. Brown. I'd like some reporting on that. I'm happy to hear there's some oversight on elder abuse, especially in the nursing homes. Um, I would also like a report about the uh, fentanyl and uh, that that issue, gang involvement in our county. What is the DA doing about that? Thank you. All right, is there anybody else here in person who'd like to speak to us on items on the district attorney's agenda? Seeing none, we'll go online to see if there's any members of the public online. We have speakers, Chair. Bernie, your microphone's now available. 
Good morning, Chair and Board. Once again, um, I think I just want to uplift the uh, uh, neighborhood courts, right? I think we've seen uh, <clears throat> amazing, uh, amazing, um, an amazing process, right? Of uh, what it looks like to divert people from being involved in the justice system. Uh, in the criminal legal system, right? Uh, using an alternative, um, an alternative approach where community members are involved, uh, systems are involved. You know, partnering up to ensure that, you know, we have a restorative justice uh, practice and process. You know, to to address some of these, uh, some of the things that are coming up in our in our community. Um, I just, uh, yeah, and I just encourage the board to, uh, to continue to uplift and support. Uh, the alternative, right? The restorative justice practice. Uh, we see in successful rates, you know, and I think uh, we can uh, make more success, you know, and create better impact in our communities and folks that are, um, yeah, you know, just having a hard time making bad choices, you know, but not allowing that those, those choices define their future, you know, and giving them an opportunity um to rectify uh, and redeem um their mistakes so you have my time thank you we have no further speakers chair all right thank you very much um with that i'll bring it back to the board but before i do i, I just want to see if you maybe could comment on the questions around the prop 172 funds and the fentanyl and gang prosecutions that were raised by a member of the public good morning board members i can address that we get approximately three million dollars in that budget line item. And with respect to uh, prosecuting cases involving fentanyl, um, the penalties as they stand right now, uh, the legislature has not seen fit to uh, add serious enhancements for that. My understanding is there's legislation afoot. Uh, but as you know, we continue to prosecute uh, cases that are appropriate. We continue to prosecute cases involving fentanyl and other narcotics. And unfortunately, um, those are the things that we see in our community. And uh, those are extremely dangerous. We've never really faced dangerous drugs like we have uh, at this moment in time when it comes to fentanyl. But rest assured that when the cases come in, those are reviewed as I have indicated and that we file those cases and we prosecute those cases. Great, thank you. Thank okay, you. I'll uh, go to the board to see if there's any questions for the district attorney's office. Let's start with Supervisor Hernandez. So a few, a few comments and a question. Um, you know, one of the things is that I've been really uh, glad to see the district attorney's office out in the community doing a lot of uh, community participation events and outreach. And I'm glad to see on the, I think the second slide, um, the amount of, you know, diversion programs that we're participating in. Um, those are things that are really positive impact for our community. Um, just for clarification, the, the, full-time employee it's two years on wages and then after that they're going to be on grants no, well it's, it's funded years? for two years and that funding is coming from salary savings i guess we're going to reevaluate in two years but it is our hope that an analyst will be able to you know we're also busy this person will have time to explore grants as i said we've gotten two right. for victim witness already um, but we're hoping that this person as an analyst will be able to go out, look at grants and literally bring money, not just to our office, but money to the county as a whole and sort of self fund. Uh, so that that's the anticipation, uh, along with several other duties that need to be done to achieve our goal of transparency and continue. And thank you for your kind comments uh, about community outreach. Yes. So. All right. Supervisor McPherson. Yeah. Uh, first of all, I, w I think, want to thank you for reminding us that the uh, California Constitution, and I'll say this to the, the those that follow in the sheriff's office, public safety is the first responsibility of, of local government. If we don't have that, everything else kind of disintegrates. Um, I on I want to give congratulations to you and your whole staff 
um, you know, for starting neighborhood courts now several years ago. And uh, you had uh, 164 cases, you said, I think. And that's this year. We've had year. over 300 completed. Okay. So yeah. that's just this year. Is that about what you anticipated or? That's a very interesting question. When we started it, like I said, there was only about four models or so in the whole entire state out of 58 counties. So I'm not sure we entirely figured out what to expect. We started it. We were expecting uh, to divert uh, significant p cases. And as the caller said, people who just need a, sort of a break to get their life back on track uh, and to have members of the community in a in a restorative way sort of supervise them. So I, I would I would be lying if I said that was exactly the number that we uh, that we anticipated. But we did think that it was a program that would grow and uh, would evolve as as we went through it. But um, it, we knew it would be significant, but I don't know that we knew it would be right. at the level that it is. But I can tell you, we're absolutely thrilled with it. It is nothing but a positive thing for our community, as Supervisor Hernandez mentioned, uh, and others. And uh, we are committed wholehearted to going forward with it and expanding it. We've had 14 monolingual Spanish uh, hearings, which we are extremely proud of, and uh, just a lot of community engagement. And like I say, it keeps these folks out of the system. They don't get public defenders appointed. They don't go to court. They they don't have anything on their record uh, if they successfully complete it. So. All right, and um, I want to thank you again and your whole staff, uh, especially the consumer protection and the target so often is is the elderly, okay. and they just get is, is Doug Allen still in charge he is, overseeing he is there. that? He is there, oh. ready, willing, and able to go out and I speak know. to anyone. And community. I want to just say thank you for the outreach because these people are confused. They don't know. Uh, you know what's right or what's wrong it's really a big problem and the outreach that you've provided have i think saved some serious uh situations for a lot of people especially the elderly so thank you for doing that and uh, the you. outreach that he has done he's been excellent he is thank you very much uh, supervisor mcpherson and i uh, echo your comments about mr allen right uh supervisor Koenig. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, DA Rosell, for the great presentation, all the work uh, by your department. Um, yeah, I would also want to commend you on the uh, success of the Neighborhood Courts Program um, and, you know, really just the sheer volume of work that you guys get through every year. I mean, your 6,000 cases is a heck of a lot. And as you said, that's not even the whole amount of work. It's it's got only the file the other 4,000 that take plenty of work. Thank you for right. recognizing that. Yeah, well, I mean, the question I have for you is how many of those 6,000 cases actually get resolved every year? Um, well, that's a, it's an interesting question. I, they don't all get resolved in one year's time. Uh, a lot of the misdemeanor cases clearly will get resolved within a year. Um, sometimes you have people who abscond uh, and those cases just a warrant gets issued. But uh, most of the felonies that are not the homicides and the, the heavy sexual assault cases that carry uh, punishment, many of those get resolved. The larger cases are the ones that typically will go outside the year, depending upon mm -hmm. uh, the volume of, of uh, forensic data that needs to be analyzed and that sort of thing. Right, right. Of course, obviously, some of these cases can take years. I um, don't have a specific number, and sure. I apologize. I well, get back to you. With I mean, I, I guess what I'm getting at is, are we seeing the, a backlog grow or shrink? No, I think yeah, we had it. We definitely talked about this. I think I talked about it uh, a couple of years ago during COVID. So we are working away on the backlog. We've got many cases that are in trial uh, and the courts are sort of back up and running and spooled up. So we are chipping away at uh, the backlog, but I would, we're not adding, we're not adding to the problem. We are trying to solve it and correct it. Okay, so it, it, the backlog is getting smaller. It's that's getting great. smaller. Well, okay. oh, that's that's just, uh, moving in the right direction. Yes. Thank you. No further questions. Supervisor Brown. Thank you. I don't have any questions. Just some some praise for the team, in particular um, those that that don't necessarily get seen as much. The inspectors, for example, do remarkable work behind the scenes. Uh, unquestionably, the work that you've done. In fact, um, you were a leader uh, among the fifty-eight counties and your victim assistance program and have been consistent with that in particular dealing with uh, children victims as well. Um, Doug is an invaluable resource for the broader community and has been in each of our districts offering up 
uh, resources. And something else that uh, since I had chaired for multiple years, the Criminal Justice Council, uh, you would help really lead that with me in many respects. And, and uh, uh, so you and your office have been very, very uh, forward thinking in how to ensure that, that front end issues are dealt with, but all the back end issues are still also adequately dealt with. Every major issue from a criminal perspective that's happened in our community, your department's had to take, your team's taken a lead on uh, all the high profile ones. I know it takes a toll uh, emotionally and physically on some of these cases, in particular, some of those violent ones, but um, I think that you have a really good culture and good team there. So I just wanna thank you thank for you. that. And Eric, don't die on us right yes. now, if you don't mind. If you need some water, these are things we can provide. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Jeff. Thank you very much for your kind comments. All right. Um, I did have a couple questions. Um, the first was when mentioning neighborhood courts, and you were saying that there were five that were unsuccessful. I'm just wondering if you could kind of speak to you know, what happened. So, th those are folks who, frankly, haven't followed through with the plan. So they'll they'll show up at neighborhood courts. They'll uh, have a panel that speaks to them and lays out goals and, you know, benchmarks for them to to do and those are folks who for one reason or another have not accomplished that and typically picked up maybe a new offense or that sort of thing but haven't really availed themselves of the opportunity and so as a result they kind of get they go back and they'll go the well a couple of things will happen sometimes they will get you know depending upon their reasons and and all that and sort of the group's decision uh, they can go back through the program and then others, if they've picked up a uh, rare occurrence, but picked up a new criminal offense, they're going to be dealing with, with that in the court. Right. Um, so. Great. Well, I just want to, you know, again, congratulate you all as my colleagues have on that program. Um, I remember being on the city council when it was first rolling out. And I think a lot of people were excited to see, you know, the county and the DA's office really taking seriously, trying to move forward with, you know, diversion and keeping people out of the criminal justice system. And, you know, I think one thing that we all forget is that is, is how much money actually saves the county and the community from not from having an alternative for people to, you know, not necessarily go in the criminal justice system, get their lives back on track, and as a result, save the courts, save the jails, and save all of us, and save these people a lot of money as well, too. Mm -hmm. um, the next question I had was on the $20 million um, Task joint task force with right. the uh, the other other county. It's with the attorney generals, and it's also uh, attorney general. It's also with other counties. So what we're finding is uh, nursing homes are literally located in various jurisdictions. So it makes sense to partner up with the counties mm -hmm. that they exist in. It also makes sense to partner up with the attorney general. So we have had uh, some that are just sort of inside the borders of. Santa Cruz County, but the one that we're speaking about is a statewide and it is in process as we speak and it looks like it's coming to a resolution. That will be great to hear how much, you know, funding the county receives um, out of that settlement. So fair enough. Yeah. Um, to be continued, I guess. Yes. Yeah. Thank you all for your hard work on that. Thank you very much. Um, and then I do also just want to um, express appreciation for the DA's support of um, kind of the restorative justice process that was used around the individuals who had done the burnout on the Santa Cruz mural, um, at the Black Lives Matter mural. I mean, this was, as we were hearing, and as I was in the court proceedings during the kind of final days, you know, this was a new approach right. to dealing with how we're, you know, how we want to address the situation. And I think many people in the community felt like these are two young individuals that did something that was very harmful, very stupid, but at the same time, did this necessitate them going to jail? And the answer was, you know, resoundingly no, but they did want to have a process that, you know, these individuals could go through to, you know, recognize the harm that was caused and hopefully heal from, um, help the community heal from the trauma that was caused and then help these individuals heal themselves. And I know that your office was very instrumental in helping us resolve and working with the community to resolve what would be most appropriate. And so I just really want to thank you all for that because it's it's creating a new model of how we can also kind of divert people from the criminal justice system as this has been done with neighborhood courts. Thank you very much for those kind comments. Yeah, and then I guess the last thing I'll say that I'd like to, I've, I've been meaning to follow up with you on, and I hope to, that we can uh, discuss it, but, you know, um, with Santa Cruz being the most expensive rental community in the United States, 
I've heard on numerous occasions, um, you know, um, people who are victims of predatory landlords, whether that's, you know, if they receive exorbitant rent increases um, or what have you, you know, housing is something that everybody needs in our community. And I would think it would fall under something that is, could fall into, you know, something that we consume as something that we pay into. And, and, you know, we're doing our best to try to, you know, fund, um, uh, tenant defense, you know, tenant advocates, people who can inform the tenants, but you know, I think we need to, it's a kind of an all hands on deck approach to really deter predatory behavior in our housing market. And so to the extent that we can, you know, explore options there, I think would be really great. We are always open to exploring those and um, to trying to make the community a better place. So great. Thank thanks. You. Yeah. All right. With that, um, I'll see if there's a member of the board who would like to move the, I'll move the recommended actions. Second. All right, super, we had a motion by Supervisor Friend, second by Supervisor Hernandez to uh, move the district attorney's budget as outlined by staff. With that, I'll turn to the clerk for a roll call vote. Supervisor Koenig. Aye. Friend. Aye. Hernandez. Aye. McPherson. Aye. And Cummings. Aye. That passes unanimously. Okay, before we move on to our next item, I'd just like to see if everybody's comfortable with moving forward. Do we want to take a quick break? Nope. No. Okay. Nope. All right, so with that, we'll move on to the last item under public safety and justice is item number eight, consider approval of the 2024-25 proposed budget for the sheriff corner, including any supplemental materials and take related actions as outlined in the reference budget documents. I'll turn it over to our sheriff, Jim Hart and his staff. Morning, Chair Cummings. Board of Supervisors, Morning. Jim Hart, Sheriff Corner. Is this on? Yep. Okay. Uh, just to quickly introduce the, my uh, executive staff that's here. This is my administrative manager, Kathy Sams, under Sheriff Chris Clark, our corrections chief, Dan Freitas, and then our law enforcement chief, Jake Ainsworth. And uh, just real briefly, just uh, the comments is we're very much in a status quo budget uh, this year with the county absorbing negotiated salary and uh, labor increases. Um, we really appreciate the work that the CAO, Carlos Palacios, and his team do all year long on helping us manage this pretty sizable budget. And so just want to reach out and say thank you, Nicole and Carlos, for your, your work. Okay, much like the DA, we do have a mission statement. And you, everybody can, uh, can read that on their own. But really, our, our people are proud to work in this community and we're proud uh, to serve the community. And this is a great place to live and it's it's a great place to to work in law enforcement. It's it's a supportive community. They ask people ask a lot of questions. They they want to know uh, why things are happening, but at the end of the day they're very supportive and so I know I've been here 36 years now. I've really enjoyed uh, being a law enforcement officer in this community. That's organizational structure we just talked about. And I, I don't want to read all six of these, but I, I do want to touch on a couple of our achievements that are, are really important. And fentanyl has been brought up a number of times today. It's by far the most lethal street drug that I've, I've seen in my career. Uh, some scientists are saying it's 100 times stronger than heroin. And so, as you probably heard last year, we had 133 of our community members overdose and die. And not just overdose, but overdose and die in Santa Cruz County. And it's so prevalent that you admit year last year we had to we had to fund an additional death investigator in our court corners unit because of the workload. And our our police officers that work in the different city jurisdictions, our deputies, we all carry Narcan. Narcan's in the jail. It's in all the housing units. And there's hundreds of saves every year as well between EMS, fire, and law enforcement. And so it's just it's just been a devastating drug. And so with that, uh, we created a fentanyl crisis response team a few months ago, and the focus is on the drug dealers. And it's, the, and it's a more of a holistic approach. We're working with treatment. We're working with, H, uh, with health services. We're working uh, with uh, the schools to try to educate kids and stop that first use. I think that's so critical is stopping that first use because this drug is so addictive. It's very, very hard for people to get off it. And so we've we've uh, have a five de uh, person, five detectives assigned to this team, a sergeant, a lieutenant, and also a, a detection dog. And they've made some really great cases. We're working closely with the United States Attorney's Office out of San Jose, and they're committed 
to prosecuting a dealer for either manslaughter or homicide when somebody in our community dies from fentanyl overdose. And so they've already have accepted a couple cases and we're, we're gonna keep working with them because as the DA said, the state law is just not that, not that tough right now, whereas federal laws is, is much more serious. Uh, we did open the sobering center a few months ago and we're currently diverting between 175 and 200 people a month from the main jail to the sobering center. Our partner is Janice Santa Cruz and they're doing a great job. And they're also providing mat services. And so when somebody leaves the main jail, they can walk right over to the sobering center and get started on that and, and get, get enrolled in some treatment and some programs. And then our DNA laboratory was just completed. And we're really excited about that. We're in the hiring phase now. Uh, these are scientists, so they're they're very uh, hard to recruit and and bring on. But but we're we're making progress there, and we're thinking that somewhere in the next eighteen to twenty four months we'll be actually uh, certified and processing DNA. And then the last thing I want to touch on is we are working close closely with the Office of the Inspector General. Uh, we meet quarterly with them. And then also they call frequently about certain things that come up. And so we're, we have a very good relationship going with them. And so far the program's working well. So you, you guys we are very aware of our services, but we're basically broken up into four different groups, the law enforcement side, which is under operations, administration, corrections, and court security. And I just want to share crime rates with you guys because uh, I, I know that sometimes there's talk out there that Santa Cruz is a dangerous town or uh, Santa Cruz County is a dangerous area. But for unincorporated Santa Cruz County, which I think the slides had said had about 132,000 people living in unincorporated Santa Cruz County, you can see our violent crime rate is is less than half of the state average. Those are those are crimes per 1,000 county residents and 1,000 state residents. And so obviously the, the state average is 4.66 and we're under two. And then you go over to the overall crime rate and we're about 30% of the state average in unincorporated Santa Cruz County. And just to look at it a little bit differently, Kathy, if you can go to the next slide, you can see right before prison realignment, uh, Santa Cruz County, not cities, but unincorporated Santa Cruz was about 27 crimes per 1,000 people between violent crime and uh, and property crime. And so that number has been reduced all the way down to 8.4 now. So we're, we're, we're proud of those numbers and we're gonna keep working on that crime rate and push it down. And then uh, lastly on the data, just sharing our, our homicides in, in the county. Uh, as you can see, we've gone 11, in the last 11 years, we've only had uh, two years where there's five or more homicides. And if you go back to the 80s and 90s, uh, particularly in the mid 80s to, to late 80s. It was a lot of double digit numbers during that time. And, but we brought that, that number uh, down significantly. And now I'm gonna turn it over to Kathy to talk about the budget request. Um, our department is looking at a $3.4 million increase and primarily that, continue, that is continuing the funding for all of our staff, operations, and correctional officers. Our current requested changes includes the DNA lab associated costs, including staffing, continuing the contracts and safety equipment that is much needed for our officers. Our revenue key drivers is continued funding from our grants and all the initiatives, including Cal AIM PATH funding. Our expenditure key drivers is salaries and benefits, and then the continued uh, funding for our programs and contracts associated with those. And Chris, you're gonna talk about the funded staffing. That's right. Good morning, Chair Cummings, good morning, board. I thought I'd touch on a few things. The first being uh, our staffing. Uh, when it comes to uh, deputy sheriffs and sergeants, 148 funded positions is what we have. One vacancy we're sitting on. Uh, we have seven in the police academy right now, and then four in field training, and then we have a, a, a nine that are on leave. With regards to our correctional staff, 116 total fund positions, and then 17 vacancies, uh, seven in training right now, nine on leave. In terms of civilian staff, 81 funded positions, four vacancies there, and then uh, two of those on leave. Um, in, important, and in, in terms of a recruitment strategies, our bonuses that we've been giving out, 
So I thought I'd touch on that. It's something we've been working with personnel on uh, right now in terms of our lateral bonus for deputy sheriff. We've given out one over the over this fiscal year that we're in right now. Uh, we anticipate we. It, it's really unclear whether or not we're going to see another one uh, in in terms of a lateral bonus, but uh, but that that program is still there. In terms of hiring bonuses, uh, we have not given one out. We have not given one out to a deputy sheriff position, but we anticipate one in 24-25. And, uh, and then in terms of correctional officers, no lateral bonuses given out on that program. 13 hiring bonuses, though, that, so that has been successful with an anticipated 16 coming up in the next fiscal year. And then in terms of referral bonuses for folks that get referred by existing correctional officers, we've seen four uh, bonuses as far as just our existing COs uh, recruiting others. Uh, in just, just this is just a snapshot of kind of where our funded positions have been uh, year over year, going back from uh, fiscal year 2006 to seven, and then moving all the way to uh, this coming uh, fiscal year. So that kind of gives you, gives you an idea of that. And then in terms of recruitment strategies, again, I'm not going to read all these. We we worked with personnel on a number of things to really boost our staffing. Uh, critically, especially especially for us, is our correction staffing, where our folks have been on mandatory overtime and then increasing our numbers uh, of deputy sheriffs. Uh, but uh, two things I wanted to touch on was a combined written physical and interview test day that we've implemented. Basically, it's a one-stop shop for folks to show up on one day to, to interview, do uh, uh, or to rather to take the test, to do a physical agility test, and then to interview. Uh, taking time, you know, it, it's more convenient for them. It's obviously more convenient for us, but that saves days and weeks, obviously, in the recruiting process. And then importantly, something that we kind of found uh, was that we, it was our written test. And so looking at equitable um, testing methods, we, we found that uh, there was another method out there. It, up until just a few months ago, it was a written test that really allowed for people to come in and apply and, and, get, and kind of walk their way through the application process and the hiring process. Uh, but for folks with English as not their primary language we saw, or folks that aren't just really focused on grammar, that could be an exclusionary factor. And so what we did is we ended up finding a scenario-based testing process uh, that's accepted by post, accepted by BSCC that we can use for recruiting both correctional staff and deputy sheriffs. And so it's scenario based. It's focused on common sense answers to questions. And so it kind of gets rid of this whole if you're not you know super familiar with grammar and 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 English, obviously, it provides an alternative to that. Uh, in terms of future considerations, your board's aware that we're working through Calium and kind of that's a challenging program, but we're working through that. Uh, we also we also are uh, increasing our medical and mental health services to incarcerated folks at the jail. Importantly, what your board's going to hear on June 4th is for the first time in 12 years, we're moving away from WellPath. This is a, a big change for us. It's a welcome change, frankly, uh, and we're hoping for, for better service with NAFCARE, which your board will hear more about that come June 4th. Um, and then in terms of the sheriff touched on it with our DNA lab, that, that lab is built. Now is the process of staffing it. It is a challenging uh, recruitment for this, for not only the DNA supervisor, but also for the criminalists that will end up uh, running that lab. And then, as the sheriff mentioned, we're hoping to accredit the lab within 18 to 24 months. Uh, the sheriff mentioned the recovery center, which was open in February. And then in terms of just two things we're looking at doing over the coming fiscal year is, is updating our main jail locker room. It's, uh, it, it, it is in a state of of uh, it's in pretty sad shape, I should say, with with both correctional officers sharing lockers as well as sewage backing up into the locker room when we have plumbing issues at the main jail. And then uh, lastly, as far as um, as far as uh, future considerations, is an outdoor wellness area. We we surveyed a number of staff and just giving corrections folks who work the main jail an opportunity to kind of get outside the building, have some fresh air, just taking a break from the from the the routine nature of corrections work and giving them an opportunity to get outside and and, ha and take a break and have their lunch. So uh, those are those are future considerations and I'll turn it back over to the sheriff. So our, our request is for your board to approve our proposed budget for the sheriff coroner's office, including any supplemental materials. All right, well, thank you for the presentation and for all the work you provide and service you provide for our community. Okay, so at this time, um, I will open up to the public. Um, for any member who's here present who has not already commented on this item, like you will be given two minutes and you're uh, able to approach the podium. Thank you, Becky Steinbrunner. Um, you had a slide there that mentioned Prop 172 money, but it came and went really fast. Can you please uh, clarify how much Prop 172 money uh, your department is going to be getting this year. I also
also didn't see um, a, a separation of county service area money that the sheriff's department receives. There is county service area money allocated for the sheriff's department, but I didn't see that clearly included. I would like to ask that um, your budget includes providing bottled water to the inmates at the Roundtree um, Detention Center. Their water is contaminated. Their well is contaminated. And uh, they have no way to go get any water from another place. So the uh, County Water Advisory Commission received a report from this from Mr. Beaton, the General Services, that confirmed it is contaminated. And the commission wrote a letter to your board to ask that bottled water be provided to the, the people, staff, and inmates at Roundtree. So please include that in your budget. Um, the, I would like to ask if the, um, the, if counties, the rape victims in the county are still, whether they can be, have their exams done locally or if they're still having to go over the hill. We've talked about this in the past, but I'd like an update on that if that is related to the DNA forensics lab that is not yet open. I'd also like to ask um, that there be uh, mental health uh, be training with these new recruits. Um, your board has heard from Mr. and Mrs. Arlt, whose son was killed in the city of Santa Cruz, but there was also a case in Corlitos where a young man was killed simply because the officers panicked. And we need to have someone like the city has uh, behind these officers so that they are getting a uh, second eyes and ears. And then my last request is that there be sign language available for, uh, or somehow a rec training so that officers responding have recognition when someone is deaf and they're not uh, being able to respond to questioning in a normal way. Thank you. Thank you. Morning, my name is Susan Cohen, a member of Sur Santa Cruz County, and I really hope you think about what truly keeps people safe, considering the $47 million sheriff's budget. Um, the sheriff said that violent crime rate in our county is half the state average and it is, has reduced. Um, and um, we're wondering why continue with the same staffing numbers when crime numbers are down. Keeps people safe is providing the kinds of things that allow people to live healthy, connected lives. It's not news to you that we need to invest more in housing in our county, but making the connection between the number of people who end up in our jail repeatedly because they are lacking housing and the supportive mental health services needed to hold on to that housing has to be accounted for. What keeps people truly safe to live healthy, connected lives are things like parks and programs for families and children, which are seriously lacking in South County. What keeps people really, truly safe is addressing what causes people to use drugs like fentanyl to the extreme that causes harm to themselves and others that leads them to be housed in our jail. Over 50% of people in our county jails are suffering from mental health issues. And we know it costs less to provide housing and services than to house them in jail. I'm not saying we don't need to have a place for people who commit violent crimes, but we don't. We need to question what we currently have. When they're released from jail, there's nowhere for them to go in many cases. There are not enough services or they can't connect services because we don't know where they end up. And what keeps children safe, you mentioned concern about children. We must restore those contact visits. The board, you voted on them in 2019. Somebody mentioned the Bill of Rights earlier. And um, so we've already determined this is crucial. And um, if, if, if there are, you say there aren't funds to pay, again, the reduced numbers have gone from 40% reduced numbers uh, of 31% of reduced jail beds um, and 70%, 80% are not are on pretrial. Some, some of those funds must be able to be used for other purposes. Thank you. And that's also recruiting staff for mental health with mental health training. Thank you. Thank you. Serious. Thank you. Hey, is there any other member of the public here who'd like to address us on this item? Seeing none in person, I'd like to go to the clerk to see if there's any folks online. Yes, Chair, we do have speakers online. Call in user two, your microphone is now available. Excuse me. 
uh, Marilyn Garrett, I want to express my um, criticism of so-called wellness checks as I witnessed one. And Supervisor Koenig, I put my complaint form in your hands in person. Uh, so I'll just go through a little bit of this. And what I witnessed was frightening and um, looked like a military-like assault on my friend in SoCal. Uh, this was on Friday, July 22nd, 2022. There were uh, about three sheriff vehicles, uh, an ambulance in the area where we had celebrated a summer solstice a month earlier. And I came to deliver requested groceries to my friend. And there were two of us, and um, my friend was uh, held down, injected, uh, taken off in an ambulance, and uh, handcuffed, it went to telecare. Uh, my concluding comment on my report, violent force injection wellness checks, in quotes, should be prohibited. There should be a full independent investigation of the violation of citizens' health and human rights. And I know there have been complaints about telecare. Uh, this um, <clears throat> Thank you, Ms. Garrett. Handled Bernie, your microphone's now available. Uh, once again, good morning, Chair and Board. Um, yeah, I think my comment around this is going to be, how can the county save money? Uh, I believe Mr. Koenig asked that question yesterday to the Public Defender's Office. Um, and uh, I would like to see it asked here. Um, I would have loved to see it asked at the DA's office too, right? But and probation, right, and all those things. But one thing that I believe where the county can save some money, especially now during this uh, budget deficit and crisis and cuts happening everywhere and kind of just the budget overlook um, seems a little kind of dire, right, is uh, really thinking about deactivating uh, empty units right uh i've been saying it um and i know yesterday during the probation's office uh presentation right uh there was mention you know that we can't uh shut down and save money by closing like one or two beds or something but i think this is a different circumstance you know at roundtree there is an empty unit there is a uh, there's many empty uh cells in the complete system of the jail here in this county but I just want to speak to uh, Roundtree. Um, one of those units is empty, it's closed. Uh, it was reported that because it was lack of, uh, the lack of staffing, but I think it's just the, the lack of folks uh, going through the system and being housed in jails, right? So I think there's something that we should consider. Um, you know, if, if at least just for this year, what, how much money, how much uh, reinvestment uh, can the county make, you know, by closing and, and uh, again, what does that formula look like? Um, I'll leave that up to the budget folks, you know, but those are my comments. Close down the empty unit at Roundtree. Kathy, your microphone's now available. Hello, um, my name is Kathy Lass. I'm in Aptos, California. Um, I appreciate the work that the Public Safety Department does here in Santa Cruz. However, I want to um, push back on the notion that this is the only department that um, that is that participates with public safety. Um, I 
by the time uh, things become to policing and punishment, it's it's a little bit too late. So I want to put as much sacred um, protection around the health and human services parts of the budget and um, push back that policing and punishment is not what ultimately keeps us safe. So I wanted to, just to remove any notion of sacredness around policing and um, and punishment when it comes to considering how to keep us safe and in terms of considering how we should spend our money. Thank you. We have no further speakers, Chair. Okay, I'll bring it back to the board and want to thank members of the public for the comments. I'm just wondering, um, Chair, part of some of the questions that were brought up by the community, maybe we can touch on. I know there was some mention about Prop 172 funds and the county service area funding and water issues at Roundtree. Maybe we can start there in terms of responses that maybe you can give to those questions so our prop 172 funding is somewhere in the neighborhood of 15 million i think and then csa 38 is another two or three million i believe but i don't we don't i don't have that in front of me right now yeah. and then uh and the water issues came up the round tree I'm just... yeah and then according to general services based on the letter that i was given and I, I believe it to be accurate is that the the water it contains a small amount of a certain what whatever it is they're concerned about but um, under who, whatever the governing body is, is still considered potable. So that, that's my best concern. Right. We've got Michael Beaton here. He might be able to speak to that as well. Uh, thank you, board. Michael Beaton, Director of General Services. Uh, we do have the water well tested quarterly at the Roundtree Correctional Facility. The water well testing did uh, identify a prevalence of a chemical called PFAS. It is well below the state's mandatory level for drinking water. So it is safe to drink. Right. Thank you. Um, and it, it, I think what one of the members of the public was trying to get to is the, I think it's the sexual assault response team that I think at one point have been closed down in Santa Cruz County, but then has been reopened. That's my understanding, but maybe you could speak to that as yeah, well. So we, we uh, had a nursing shortage and that program was temporarily taken over to Santa Clara County, but it's been back here locally for at least three years, maybe, right. maybe four years. Yeah. And uh, they even have a, a, a new facility too. So um, we, uh, Dr. Lauren Zephro from my office operates and runs that program and uh, it's it's going very well. Great. And then, um, and that was my understanding as well that had been brought back online. And I think it's just helpful to point that out so people understand that that program does exist uh, here back in Santa Cruz County. Um, the mental health training for offices, I know that there's the mental health liaison program with the sheriff's department. Uh, but maybe you could speak to that as well. Yeah, I think the person might have been talking about two different things, but I but I think she was talking about the mental health liaisons that uh, are assigned to the sheriff's office that actually ride with our patrolmen people. And I believe Santa Cruz has uh, Santa Cruz Police has two. I think Watsonville ha uh, has one, and we have two. Yeah. And it's a great program. Um, but I think the pro the county's talking about maybe transitioning to. Uh, a different model and that, right. that might be more we might hear about that more down the line right um and then i guess um there's been discussion about capacity and i've been just and i also just want to think think the opportunity when we're talking about jail capacity i've now been able to go to visit all the jails with the exception of the juvenile detention center and so i want to thank chief dan freitas for and your your staff for being available um, because visiting the jails really does provide a different perspective and understanding about what the current situation is so but um members of the public have brought up capacity at the jail and closing certain units and and had comments around that and so i'm just wondering if you could speak to that as well so most of our costs are in labor and whether we have 20 people in a housing unit or 30 the labor costs are not the same and then medications costs are roughly the same food services are roughly the same and those are all big ticket items in terms of our, our corrections budget um, but think about if you were running, let's just say you were running a school and you had one year, you had 15 kids in class and your costs were $100,000. And the next year you had 25 kids in class and your costs were roughly the same. It's it's very similar like that in corrections. And then we have a whole classification system where we can't put, put certain people with others. And so that kind of dilutes the population sometimes. But I remember just a few years ago when the main jail had like 480 people in it and I was getting complaint after complaint about people sleeping on floors and in bunks and uh, in day rooms. And now that there's ample room, people are complaining that there's too much room, right? So 
Uh, you know, we you you don't want your jail running at 100% all the time. That's how mistakes are made. And so like the industry standard is between 80 and 90% so that there's a little bit of breathing room in there for not only the incarcerated population, but also the folks that work there too. And so is our population low right now? Yeah, it is, but it's a it's an evolving system. So we don't know what's coming tomorrow either. Right, and I guess that that, that also just highlights um, the fact that a lot of the diversion techniques that the county has implemented are actually helping to keep more people out of the jails, which is yeah, you know, and kind I, of what everybody's been asking yeah, for. Yeah, I don't so. think they uh, a lot of people fully understand, but but sixty percent of all jail bookings are misdemeanors. So say we book ten thousand people a year, six thousand are misdemeanors, and our our main jail population is ninety eight percent felonies. So the point is, is, those people all they get they get fingerprinted, photographed, and then they get released. They we're, we're not holding. Uh, a person who's doing doing low level crime. Right. And I guess the last question, because it came up a lot, was around the contact visits. I mean, we had a long line of speakers who were here today, and I think all of us have been getting emails about that as an issue. And so I'm just wondering if you can maybe speak to that. Sure. And we, you got to put it in a little bit of context in that in 2020, CDPH, Governor Newsom, everybody shut down all congregate living environments, right? Uh, we you couldn't have we couldn't have programming in the jail facilities. We couldn't have uh, uh, in-person visits in the jail for about two years, and then that was lifted, and now we had this fentanyl surge, and so I'm super concerned about that drug getting in the jail. And there's already been a few instances of it getting in the main jail, but in this budget that that we're talking about today, we do have a body scanner built in for the Roundtree facility. Uh, where where we can uh, operate that that body scanner out there, and um, but the 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 concern is it's mostly primarily around staffing. I mean, we have, we're at seventy percent of staff right now. Our people are work, working five, sometimes six, twelve hour days a week, and so uh, we do have a plan to to begin implementing the program sometime around August or September. And uh, Chief Freitas has additional information on that if you want to hear it. But it's uh, the, the, these aren't things we take lightly. I, I, I get it. We we want our inmates to be healthier. We want them to be to have family time or kid time. We're all parents ourselves. But when you're when you're working staff five or six days a week and people are leaving in droves because they can go work in another county and only work three days a week. Uh, we have, we got we have to do some things where we're we're not only protecting our incarcerated population but we're protecting our employees as well. Great, thank you. Um, so I'm going to stop right there with the, the comments that we heard from the public, and then I'll bring it to the board. See if there's other any other questions or comments that board members might have, and I'll start with Supervisor Koenig. Yeah, thank you, Sheriff Hart, and uh, the entire Sheriff's Office team. Um, you know, it was mentioned that. Sort of law enforcement alone is not the answer. And um, I think that you guys do a good job of sort of understanding that and representing that within the community and taking a much more holistic view of your role. Um, I mean, I see that in all of the um, public outreach that you guys do, whether it's events like Trunk or Treat, which I mean, probably the biggest uh, trick or treat event in the, the whole county, if, uh, if not beyond. Um, so many smiling faces there. Um, but then also a lot of the uh, just town halls um, that you guys have hosted and I've been able to to join both at the summit uh, in SoCal and Live Oak. Um, and, you know, just really available to the community. Um, and I think, um, you know, offer sort of support and uh, role, uh, act as role models in addition to, of course, uh, upholding our laws. So really appreciate uh, your approach to law enforcement. Um, and and really, um, you continue to build on that, right? And so I'll just mention, for example, um, uh, working with Chief Ainsworth on a handle with care program, which is really the idea of can we give um, our our deputies even more information when approaching a case uh, where someone with um, uh, you know a disability or a mental health issue uh, is involved, so that we can further re reduce uh, the risk of a negative interaction there. 
And I just have to say, so this was an idea brought to me by a constituent. Uh, I brought it to Chief Ainsworth, and I was just, I've just been incredibly impressed by um, his embracing of the program and looking at ways that we can uh, you know, introduce it quickly. And again, I think it speaks to um, the fact that your department is always looking for ways to improve. Um, and so, um, now I want to talk a little bit about the correctional officer issue. I'm, I'm really glad to hear uh, that there's money in this budget to update the main jail locker room. Um, I mean, I'm, our working conditions really dictate uh, how we feel about our job. Um, and of course, we're going to overcome this issue with, um, you know, really a significant amount of turnover among correctional officers. It's a, it's a great place to start is the working environment, um, to both in, in main jail and of course, outdoors with the wellness space. Um, and, you know, of course, we heard, I've heard a lot about uh, being able to offer contact visits. And I mean, it sounds like uh, we're, we're working towards being able to offer that again. Um, and, uh, you know, I think as, as uh, Sheriff Hart just said, this really is an issue that in many ways cuts both ways, because, of course, we have correctional officers that uh, many of them can't afford to live in our community. And so they're commuting long distances, whether it's from Salinas or uh, somewhere in the Central Valley. And so now uh, they're not going to spend time with their kids. Because they got to leave before their kids wake up. They get home before or after long after their kids go to sleep and they're waking up to do it again the next day. And then they get to the weekend when, uh, hey, it's time for the baseball game. But, oh, guess what? You're called in for mandatory overtime. Um, so, you know, this is uh, this is just the impact of, I mean, really ultimately our housing crisis uh, in this community and, and not being able to house the people that work in this community close to uh, their jobs. And, um, you know, that's then having these cascading effects, of course, on quality of life uh, for inmates. So, um, you know, I'm glad to hear that uh, personnel has uh, really made some improvements and that um, we're starting to, uh, you know, even just around, you know, basic stuff around testing, um, I think reaching out to people if they miss a test and trying to offer other times um, so that we can, we can get um, more of those positions filled. Um, and I hope that, uh, you know, as a board in the future, we can look at other sort of, you know, maybe it's moving uh, some of those retention bonuses up a little bit um, sooner, right? I mean, we cycle through, what is it, two thirds of all uh, correctional officers will, will actually leave within the first couple of years and three quarters within the first three years. I mean, that is a huge turnover, which of course has real costs. I and mean, I think um, under Sheriff Clark, you said it was something like $3 million and Three three point six million dollars in training costs between the money that it takes and time it takes to get them through a correctional academy and then the field training once they get back to to custody. So three point six million dollar investment on essentially a seventy five percent loss in yeah. terms of those leaving after three years. Is that like over a certain like per year or over like a few years or something? Uh, Fifty two thousand is the cost to train one correctional officer just to get them as a solo you know uh, officer working within custody. So you take that number, multiply it against the folks that leave that 75% number over th three years, and it equates to about 3.6 million on the loss for that uh, for that investment. Right. So I think in the future it would definitely uh, behoove us to look at ways to maybe spend some of that money that we're, we're losing on training, but it, uh, move up our, our retention bonuses. Maybe figure out ways that we can turn that into uh, you know some kind of down payment assistance or other ways to make sure that we're getting. Uh, correctional officers house because um, what I have heard um, you know, working on a, uh, the sort of retention um, uh, task force with uh, with you guys is uh, and Chief Freitas you know I really um, appreciate all of the concern that you bring to everyone that works in your division um, and trying to improve the working conditions for correctional officers um, what I've heard is people really love the uh, camaraderie and um, just the overall work culture of our department. And I think that's great. Um, but we are competing against these long commute times and higher salaries in neighboring uh, jurisdictions. And so um, I think with a, with a few te tweaks, we can get there. Um, uh, but just, yeah, well, again, we'll, we'll close by just commending uh, your entire department on all the great work. Thanks. Supervisor Friend. Thank you. Thank you, Sheriff Hart and under Sheriff Clark, um, in particular for your availability, always your exceptionally um, accessible 
your entire department really is. And I think that it's something that is actually more unique in our county than, than we recognize as uh, Supervisor McPherson and I have uh, served both on the CSAC and NACO. Uh, it's not necessarily common that the sheriff has a working relationship with their boards of supervisors or their DA. So we have a, we're just used to, I think in this county, a culture where there's a collaborative environment between the electeds and law enforcement and law enforcement and law enforcement. That isn't necessarily the case, uh, but it's a very, I mean, I've watched other budget hearings across the state. This is normally a very contentious moment. This is not a contentious moment. I think we should just take a moment to appreciate the culture that, that your department's created as a result of that. Um, we can continue to praise your department, which I think is deserved, but I think the person that never gets enough praise, but should more is Kathy, let's be honest. I mean, I've worked with uh, Ms. Sams for over 20 years, if I can admit it, that, that um, in both of my capacities, and the numbers are always good. The numbers are always clean. You, you're always amazing at helping your team find the, the funding, and, and um, you know, you've been really one of the unsung heroes of the Sheriff's Department, so I just want you to recognize it. You're a huge part of this team. So that's nice sure to say that's true too. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Supervisor McPherson. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Uh, and I, I just want to repeat again, thank you for implementing what our state constitution says in Article 8 that public safety is our top priority of local government. And thank you for doing that and keeping us safe as we are in Santa Cruz County. Um, I, I really want to thank you too for looking ahead too about. The reopening of the sobering center, which I was there at the February uh, open house or ribbon cutting, uh, really that's a really step forward of some of the issues that people are talking about. Um, and the, the DNA lab, uh, that's what, a year or two away at least, but how much time could that save of you getting results that you want if it's here and not over there? So it takes six, about six to 12 months to get DNA returns from the state. Uh, and, th and those are primarily in homicide cases and sexual assaults. With our own lab, we'll be able to turn it around in 48 to 72 hours. Phenomenal. That yeah. is gonna make a huge difference in you know, we're addressing our uh, public safety issues here. And I, I know you've been waiting for this for a long time. <laughs> and uh, and I, I was waiting too uh, for a long time uh, to have some substations in Felton first and now Boulder Creek. I can't tell you how much, how appreciative people are in the San Lorenzo Valley to have those close at home that they can go to those offices. So thank you very much for doing that. And I knew it started before your time, but you have really carried through and uh, expanded it in Boulder Creek. Uh, those people are very, very appreciative of that. Um, on um, the jail situation, if Proposition 47, which some people want to overturn to make, uh, to result in more felons, do, do you have any idea of what the impact, and we've had a lot of, you know, the jail, there's only half that are being filled or two thirds or whatever the number might be, but if Proposition 47 is overturned and it might be in November, that would have an impact on the jail, wouldn't it? It, it absolutely would. It, there's, we're going to see an increase, increase in the incarcerated population. Now, we just haven't done the math yet to really yeah. look exactly what we're looking at, but I, it, there was that there will be a creep going up. Yeah, as you've heard too, people are concerned about the jail, and I. There was a statement made that half of the fifty percent of the people in jail are suffering from mental illness. Is there any data to substantiate that? I think what they're talking about is they're they're on some sort of mental health medication. Okay. Um, well, it's um, it's just really impressive of what you've been able to do with what you had and the turnover that you have. And and to repeat what uh, Supervisor Friend said, you have a uh, your the attitude is really great in the sheriff's office and under some really pressing and and uh, situations. Um, the the to update the jail facility. Uh, what would that take, or is there any timeline? I, that's been talked about for a while, uh, but uh, so, yeah. obviously it's a huge multi-million dollar effort. If it, is, and, it is, and so we're we're out on an RFP for a needs assessment right now, so that uh, a company that does this kind of work will come in and 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 look at our jail population, look at our mental health needs, look at our female population, and really try to drill down and then give us an idea of what kind of facility that would be and then what the what the estimated cost would be as well. Okay. So we're really not clear on what the cost is. Uh, the next step is getting this this needs assessment completed. Well, it's, big, it's a big challenge, I know, and it's something that's going to take a long time to uh, correct, if you will. Um, and I just want to say thank you to everything that you've done um, 
to make uh, our law enforcement the response efforts um, to uh, this. We don't know how five years ago we weren't even talking about fentanyl, and now you say it's 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 probably the biggest uh, immediate crisis that we have, and how you respond to that as quickly as possible. All this it will help, I think, with the lab situation and all. Uh, I'm uh, I think you're you're trying to get ahead of the curve as quickly as you can. You should you you deserve a lot of credit for that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, um, Sheriff uh, Clark, for, I mean, Sheriff Hart for being here and uh, um, Mr. Clark for being here. Um, first of all, I'd like to commend you on your revised um, hiring practices with the one-stop um, mental test, physical and written, and the new hiring practice with the tests as well. Um, I, I've seen on the report that we have 16 full-time detention officers for next fiscal year. Is that what I read? I thought we had 16 vacancies. Oh, vacancies. Are we, do we have new, new full-time employees that we're getting this fiscal year? For deputies, not for correctional yeah. officers. 17 yeah right so yeah we are in constantly uh in in hiring mode uh but we could hire five and get them trained in the meantime another five leave or go to another agency or, or you know whatever it is they're going to do so it's it's really hard to catch up yeah. part of that was covid because we didn't hire for over a year this the county wasn't hiring because of of the pandemic so we're we're also kind of playing catch up from that as well so it's the uh, if we're able to hire folks, we'd be able to end this with this new body scanner. Which, by the way, ID does ID is fentanyl the body scanner? It will show other drugs. It, it will show an abnormality in the scan, oh. much like an airport scan would. Okay. Um, so with if we're able to hire people, we, we'd be able to get folks at Roundtree, Blaine to visitations. Yeah, if if we if we can get even. To close to full staffing, even another eight or nine hires without anybody else leaving, then we, we could probably get there. Because according to Chief Freitas, it's going to take uh, about four per day. four overtime shifts per day, or four positions a day. Okay. Uh, when are we pl we're planning to have those visitations? Like after school, kind of hours three to five or something? Mostly weekends. Weekends. Okay, that's even yeah. better. So I, I've heard the figure. Um, Close to, I think it was 68 or almost 70 percent folks in in the detention um, ha, are dealing with either behavioral health and or addiction. Uh, the question was asked of officers and and mental health training. Do detention officers also get that mental health training? I believe they given do. the numbers. Okay. Good morning, uh, Dan Freitas, I'm the Chief Deputy of Corrections. Uh, our staff do uh, receive mental health training. Uh, they receive ICAT training, which is integrated communications uh, and tactics during a critical incident. We're actually one of the few jails in the in the nation that are doing that, and we're recently recognized by the Police Executive Research Foundation, PERF, uh, for being one of the on the forefront of that. A lot of that has to do with under Sheriff Clark uh, really wanting to to get our Corrections Bureau involved. Um, but yes, they do receive mental health training. Thank you. And I guess the last question is, have we looked at, you know, with the forensics uh, department now open, have we look, looked at the numbers that Watson, Capitola, Santa Cruz, and Scotts Valley have in terms of cases where it could create a positive fiscal impact on us? Yes, and you know, we've developed a fee schedule that, that we're going to apply uh, for that. And uh, we we know about roughly what our cases will be, and then we will take in extra work uh, as there's uh, as there's um, uh, criminalists available to do the work. Is it limited just to our county, or can we? If I think our county is going to max this group out because oh. there's there's only going to be four criminalists and supervisor. Um, but if there was, if say we weren't completing the workload that we thought we were, yeah, we could send it out to Monterey or San Benito because they. Neither one of them have a lab as well. Well, thank you. 
that concludes my comments. All right, well, thank you again for, for your service and all your hard work. I do have a few um, additional questions. And um, first, I just wanna start by really congratulating you all and thanking you on establishing the fentanyl crisis response team. Um, a lot of folks in the community have been, you know, really concerned with fentanyl and how it's impacting um, people throughout our community. And um, I'm just wondering, alongside, well, I'll stick with this topic for for now. I'm just wondering if there was any press release or anything that's gone out about that, or if there's a way for us to be able to amplify that message on our newsletters, because I think a lot of people would really appreciate just knowing that there's this team out there that's doing this work and really trying to reduce the amount of fentanyl coming into our community. So I'm just wondering if there's ways that we can work with you all to help amplify that message. So about two and a half weeks ago, we put out a press release and then a video on our, our social media and uh, a number of media outlets responded that did some interviews. So we're, we're trying to push it out to the community so that they're aware of it. Great, well, we'll we can, I guess we can contact Jason Hoppen and try to get a, get that press release so that we can put in our newsletters as well and let folks know, so yeah. Um, but along with that, I also had some folks who were concerned about fentanyl and wondering if there's any kind of data on the county's website about fentanyl related deaths or, you know, fentanyl overdoses. Um, I think some folks are just interested in knowing like how big of a problem is it in the community. And so I'm wondering if, you know, if there's any information uh, that's available. I, I know that we, uh, maybe Chief Ainsworth can answer it. We track our death investigations uh, that we put on a public facing website, but um, do we, are we tracking the fentanyl solely? Good morning, Chair Cummings and uh, board. Uh, no, we don't produce the, uh, the data for the overdose deaths. Um, we do produce data from our fentanyl response team, the, the amount of narcotics that they're collecting, the, the weapons associated with that, and now the number of overdose deaths investigations that they're conducting. Okay, that's helpful. Um, along those lines, I do just want to also highlight, you know, the reduction in homicides that we're seeing in the community. I think that some folks see, you know, what is what is actually poverty in terms of people who are experiencing homelessness and kind of commit, like they connect that with criminal activity when the, you know, the reality is that you know, homicides are really low in Santa Cruz County. And when people are suffering, that's, you know, a symptom of change that needs to happen with our community. But I do want to con like being from somebody who wasn't originally from Santa Cruz. And I just contrast that with, you know, being from Chicago where last year, you know, we had three homicides here. They had 617 and 2,450 shootings. And so if people want to think about Santa Cruz not being a safe community, it's like there's many other places you can live that are not as nowhere near as safe as this place. And I think that's a lot of you know, the work that you all do to make sure that this is a safe community. And so I just want to thank you so much for ensuring that this is a safe place for people to live. Um, Again, also want to um, share my appreciation for the Sobering Center and how that's being used as diversion. Um, and the reopening of Blaine Street, which last year at this time of year, there were a lot of people coming to us saying, we want Blaine Street reopened. You all have done a good job of that, even with the limited staffing capacity you have. And, you know, my hope is that we can continue to just see improvements over time that are going to really make people feel like that they're being heard and and, um, and really improving the lives of people who are in, in our jail system. Um, I guess the last question I would have is maybe um, just to um, take you up on the offer to have Chief Freitas come up and talk a little bit more about the uh, contact visits because, I mean, that's overwhelmingly what what I'm getting, what I'm hearing about. I'm extremely supportive of wanting to see that happen, but understanding the constraints that you all are faced with around staffing over time and trying to really be able to, you know, reinstitute this in a way that's going to be beneficial for everyone. And so I'm just wondering if you could speak a little bit more to that since it's been such a big topic for our community. Yes. Good morning, Chair. Um, yeah, so we've been, for the last several months, we've been looking at a plan for what that would look like. Um, we've, we're exploring the option right now of one, one day per month per facility. So Blaine Street would have one day per month, as well as Roundtree would have one day per month for that contact visiting. Um, per facility, we need at least two people on overtime to help cover that and safely um, monitor those visits. And so that's kind of what we're looking at. Um, and so really, if we do that model, it'll be four days, or I'm sorry, four positions per month, uh, which we believe is a lot more uh, achievable than having it on uh, two days per weekend and every week, which would be uh, significantly higher and have a much higher impact on our uh, mandatory overtime shift. Right now we have shifts or correctional officers that are working anywhere from five to six mandatory overtime shifts every six weeks. So on average, they're working at least one 
uh, mandatory overtime shift. That number varies from shift to shift, and it's dependent upon like sick, vacation time, uh, training, people at the academy, things like that. So, um, and as Sheriff Hart touched on, uh, we're also trying to do it safely. When, before when we had contact visiting, we didn't have fentanyl as much. We didn't have the epidemic that we have right now. And so really trying to prevent fentanyl from coming into the jail is a, a significant concern, which is why we've requested the, the body scanner down at Roundtree. Uh, we're hoping to get two additional uh, detection canines to assist with that. Um, and we're re revamping a lot of our procedures. As Supervisor Koenig uh, touched on, we've had significant turnover. So a lot of our staff has never had contact visiting. So we're, we need to train our staff to adequately monitor that and try to keep all of our inmates safe. It only takes a little bit of fentanyl getting into our city, to uh, our facilities to really have a dangerous impact on our, on our sentence population. Great, right. well, you know, I think that many of us here on the board are supportive of, you know, all the efforts that you're making um, towards trying to, re you know, get contact visits reestablished and to the extent that we can be helpful. I mean, even if it's revisiting this at the mid-year budget, to, you know, depending on what happens with Measure K, you know, I think that many people in communities see this as, you know, a really important thing when it comes to health and wellness of not just the people who are in the jail system, but for their families, for their children. And, um, and so to the extent that we can be supportive of that, you know, I just want to let you all know that that I, I want to be a help a player in this and a, a team player in this and um and really just thank you all for responding to the community concerns around this issue i guess the, I, I do have one more question on that is there any role for nonprofit partners to play we've kind of worked within this this Not inside the correctional facility itself okay Great. And I guess the last thing I'll say, because this is not just with the sheriff's department, I think more broadly when it comes to recruitment and retention, you know, I think as we, we start exploring, you know, um, uh, workforce housing and some of these other um, issues around housing that we're really taking into account, what are the needs from different departments in terms of um, what can help retain people in the, this community? I know recently at the state level, there was um, some um, first time home buyer assistance programs. And I was actually looking into it for myself personally, but in those conversations learned that Alameda County has some first time home buyer programs for their employees. And, you know, to the extent that we can continue to explore what Santa Cruz County has done in the past or what we may be able to do moving forward around, um, you know, housing assistance for whether it's renting or buying uh, to really keep people here uh, for a longer period of time. I think it's something that we should also start thinking about together. So. With that, um, I don't have any further questions or comments, and so I'll turn it to the board for an action on this item. I'll move the recommended actions. Second. Okay, so we have a motion by Supervisor Friend, second by Supervisor McPherson, and with that, I'll have a roll call vote on the item. <laughs> I told you guys both said the same time. <laughs> Thank you. Supervisor Koenig. Aye. Friend. Aye. Hernandez. Aye. McPherson and Cummings. Aye. That passes unanimously. Thank you all. Thank you very much. Um, all right, so we'll take a five minute break. Actually, actually we'll take a quick break and uh, we'll come back in about five minutes. Yeah. Back.
Recording in progress. Okay, next item on our agenda, <clears throat> item number nine, consider approval of the 2024-25 proposed budget for parks, open space, and cultural services, including any supplemental materials and take related actions as outlined in the reference budget documents. And with that, I'll turn it over to Jeff Gaffney, Director of Parks and the Park Staff. Thank you, Chair Cummins and fellow, fellow board members. Uh, glad to be here today, and uh, we're going to quickly go through uh, the first couple slides so we can get into the good stuff. There we go. Uh, so for today, we're going to go over our mission vision, some of the achievements we've had over the last year, 18 months, some of our budget goals, and some of the budget details, and then we'll have, of course, some questions at the end. our mission and vision, and then um, and we included into this are also our strategic plan, which was completed in 2018. And then we just updated it with a five-year update last fall, um, and we added the goal of equity. So um, those goals were reaffirmed, and adding the goal of equity was something we all knew we needed to do. I want to talk about our organization a little bit. Our department is a diverse, is very diverse with many different types of programs sections covering a wide array of, front, way, array of functions. <clears throat> Within all areas of our department, we have continued to develop and maintain a mosaic of open space, parks, arts, cultural and heritage sites, as well as recreation programs ac across our entire county. Whether these places are physical land or just moments in time, they serve as refuge for the community we serve and places for us to educate them about and how we can better coexist together and places for people to find physical and mental health. On the forefront of developing these spaces and programming is our diverse and dedicated management team, led by our deputy director, Rebecca Hurley, sitting next to me, who is by far the longest serving county parks manager on our team. She has also taken on the role of managing the natural resource management program, and now she is going to share some of our recent achievements. Good morning, Chair Cummings and fellow supervisors. Um, we, over the past fiscal year, we have completed a number of achievements, um, one of them being at the reimagining project at Willowbrook County Park in honor of Sergeant Damon Gutzweiler. That was a three um, component project where we uh, enhanced the entry at Baseline Drive with a flagpole installation. We renovated the play area with new playground features and a pour and play surfacing. We also included a new um, newly constructed memorial seating area in honor of the fallen deputy. We were able to unveil this feature on March 13th with support of the Def Deputy Sher Sheriff's Association as well as County Park Friends who helped fundraise for it. Uh, we've also completed many non-infrastructure projects including updating the park strategic plan as mentioned earlier, updating the Monarch Habitat Butterfly Habitat Management Plan at Moran Lake, and also presented to the Board of Supervisors on April 30th, completion of the multi-agency collaborative North Coast Facilities Management Plan. Parks is also fortunate enough to receive discretionary funding this past fiscal year to support the complete overhaul renovations of Baseball Field B at Polo Grounds County Park. Around Parks programming, we are excited to state that we have reinstated and continued many new and previously established adult programs, including dance classes as seen here at Aptos Village Park, and also, and, and also now provide new Tai Chi classes that are actually run by our own staff that on their own accord went out and got certified to teach that for the county. We've also ret um, returned to our previously outstanding enrollment numbers in our aquatic and youth programs, with youth program being spe specifically supported through the Pajaro Valley Unified School District's Extended Learning Opportunity Program that provides after-school programs and summer camp programs, as well as youth volunteer programs, one of which I am an alma mater of. Thank you, Deputy Director Hurley. Um, throughout my career, I've been witness to the volunteers providing hope and energy. They are the long-term investment in our community and they are the people who keep us grounded in the needs of the community. I am thrilled we have fully recovered from the loss of volunteers and volunteer programming we endured as a result of the pandemic. As you can see, as of right now, the last year we had over 764 volunteers and 11,600 plus hours of volunteer work. That equates to about $434,000 worth of uh, resources that have been contributed to this county on behalf of people who just wanna be contributors to their community. These numbers do not reflect the amount of impact that our nonprofit partner, County Park Friends, has made with their staff and volunteers as well. 
as we look towards what the budget request we're looking for is it is also a status quo. We're looking at an anticipated contribution increase as status quo of $471,000 from the general fund with a $53,000 increase from revenue that we'll be generating within the department. As you can see, we are actually at just about 48% of our department is using general fund money. So the rest of it, the remainder 52% is non-general fund. I wanna talk about for a minute, just some of the budget goals. From a budget perspective, we strive for a fiscal sustainability as well as natural resource sustainability. We continue to create new programs while working with partners, all with equity as our core value. We know that resilience does not only exist in the lands we care for, but also within the way we approach our budget. So I'll go over those numbers again, just to be clear. The first thing we'll be asking for is one refunded park maintenance worker three. That was an unfunded position that we're asking to refund without general fund money. We want to eliminate a pilot program for program budgeting. We also want to increase our extra help staffing that will be funded by the increase in revenues we discussed. So that would be a total of 55 fully funded positions going from the 54. <clears throat> I want to take a moment and just illustrate one thing for you. I know that we've talked about a lot of different stats this morning in different departments. Over the last 20 years, our, our maintenance staff, the people who you see in the field the most, who get the most work done for people to see, um, have gone from 29 positions back in 2004 to if approved today, we'll have 28 positions. So we've taken quite the ride up and down as you can see over the years. And I think it's a, a great moment that we are actually getting almost back to where we were 20 years ago. The only downside to that of course, is that we've increased the number of areas that we're responsible for and the number of parks. So we've gone from 60 of those to now 74. That's over the last 20 years. Um, and I think we have done a great job of incorporating, as I've said, some of the volunteer work to supplement it, as well as some of the other activities we've incorporated, plus our nonprofit partnerships. I'm sorry, I was gonna just say one thing before we get into this. I, I know that uh, CAO Palacios um, had mentioned um, Measure K being embargoed, and um, despite those, that embargo, we do still have some restricted funds. I think uh, Budget Manager Pimental also mentioned that as well. Um, so what you're gonna see here um, that I'm gonna turn over to direct, Deputy Director Hurley are some of the areas that we're gonna still be able to use for a handful of projects. This is also in partnership with some of our nonprofit partners and also um, some of the restricted funding. Deputy Director Hurley. Thank you. Um, so some of the upcoming projects that we have for this fiscal year is looking at what type of interim amenities we can put in at the South County Park located at Whiting Road. We recently conducted a survey and we're now analyzing the results of what the public would like to see put out there as just one component. And we are hoping that we can open it to the public for use in the next six to 12 months. We're also working with the Santa Cruz Resource Conservation District on creating a natural resource management plan for Anagene Cummings County Park. Staff is gonna use that as a template to then take it and make, create natural resource management plans for our other regional and large open spaces. We are very fortunate to have received a uh, Habitat Conservation Fund grant to uh, construct the connection trail from Quail Hollow County Park to the Pace Family Wilderness. This is going to allow the public to finally access um, public space that they were, no, uh, they were previously inaccessible to. We're also putting in a plumbed restroom at Hidden Beach County Park adjacent to the playground. We will be renovating Floral, uh, Floral Park Playground, um, putting in a new play feature, additional landscaping, and new inclusive corn place play servicing. We will continue to work towards um, the work on final design and right away for the rail trail segments 10 and 11 that are under the county's jurisdiction. We are planning on bringing to this board on June 25th, the MOU with California Department of Fish and Wildlife to be the first step in um, the process of transferring that parcel from state ownership to the county, as well as we continue to work with the Santa Cruz Mountain Trail Stewards on what this board um, approved back in December is the understanding with them to fundraise, design, and construct a pump track at Belton Covered Bridge County Park. I will give it to Director Gaffney to finish up the presentation. Thank you. So where are we right now? Currently, we are facing increased costs of operating and developing parks while climate disasters and their impacts continue to increase as well. 
We are balancing the need to act as a dedicated land manager, and we also balance urban interface with our habitat protection. The mosaic of green space we mentioned earlier is very real and often provides the only safe space for our residents and wildlife, a connected web of resilient corridors and parks for all. This was never more apparent than during the pandemic, as we saw record numbers of people going outside to embrace nature in the outdoor space. As a result, people have become accustomed to having these spaces, and the numbers using them have not diminished. We will continue to plan and develop how to maintain and connect our web of green spaces, watersheds, and corridors using the latest science and nature-based solutions. Developing systems that provide for a robust and healthy environment for our community and natural spaces we are trusted to steward and protect. Wanted to just take a quick slide to thank all of the partners that we regularly work with, and we continue to find others all the time trying to accomplish these high goals and centers that we are always wanting to achieve. Yeah. The last slide for everybody is the overview of our department's requested 24-25 budget, approve the county parks budget, and refund the one unfunded worker three, eliminate the pilot program for program budgeting, and increase our extra, extra help staffing, but we'll fund it with the revenues that we bring in. And we're ready for any questions that you might have. Thank you so much for the presentation and for all your hard work. Okay, at this time, we'll open up to the public to see if there's any members of the public who would like to comment on the parks budget who are here in person. Okay, seeing none, we'll go online and see if there's any members of the public online who'd like to comment on the parks budget. We do have a speaker online. Bernie, your microphone's now available. Uh, good afternoon, Chair and Board. Uh, honestly, I, I I missed the presentation. I had to step out real quick, but if I'm thinking about parks and open spaces, the only comment I'm going to make is thinking about South County. Um, there is a great irrefutable disparity between access to open spaces and parks between North and South County. So um, I think in South County, we have what uh, the county park, um proximity there is scott's park um there might be another one here and there but um yeah uh we would like to see i would like to see and i think my family and folks in south county would want to see the county invest in developing creating maintaining just a county um county land right um opened up for for people to have access you know it's just interesting that we we live south county only has one access to the beach right uh and it's surrounded by by uh by farm fields right it's surrounded by mountains yet there's there's no yeah there's just a very there's a lack of um open space that can be accessed and utilized um yeah, and just thinking about equity again, you know? Uh, so we need to start implementing the equitable participation and creation of open spaces and parks and all that stuff. So I do appreciate all the work that the, the, this department does. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. We have no further speakers, Chair. Okay, well, with that, uh, I'll bring it back to the board for any questions, comments, and action. We'll start with Supervisor Friend. Well, thank you. I, I believe that some of the greatest investments in parks occurred in my district because of our partnership. And to me, it just shows um, that small amounts of county contribution can go a really long way. And they also help seed public private partnerships and public nonprofit partnerships that really brought us over the finish line of unquestionably the largest investments in parks and arc our district in, in a generation. And so uh, the Measure K component is is uh, really personal because of the commitments we've made to our district for additional improvements. And we're, we're hopeful um, that we can get this, this issue resolved as quickly as possible because as the caller noted and, and others have noted, this is an essential space for the community to utilize. Uh, it came out of the coming out of the pandemic. It was clear how much these open spaces are used. Um, a lot of these areas need modernization. It's been quite some time since they've been touched. 
And again, because of your team's willingness to also do a lot of the labor around it, which really has reduced the cost. I mean, these polo grounds fields are, I mean, the baseball field's unbelievable and your team deserves so much credit out there. I was glad I was able to go out there while they were doing some of the work, but these are small investments. If you actually think about the discretionary fund, the, the 50,000 to redo an entire field, uh, the same with the work that we're doing in the bathrooms, these are small county investments that go a long way. So. Um, something that Supervisor Cummings and I, Chair Cummings and I was talking about behind the scenes, it does feel like in bad budget times, parks are always sort of the first that people look at um, in, in terms of discretionary funding, but but ironically also during those exact same times, because it doesn't cost anything to use them, those are the times that people want to use them the most. So I want to make sure that we do everything we can to preserve uh, the funding and access for that you provide. So thank you for your work. Supervisor Hernandez. You know, with the uh, the caller that mentioned about equi equity in parks and open space, uh, I just wanted to ask if you know we could potentially get a plan, not not affecting to the the county budget as much, but get a plan to get more public private partnership uh, together so we can move forward with that park. Uh, just the way uh, Supervisor Friend described, I'm um, hoping that with partners like land trust, the, the park, friends of the parks, and we can get something established there. Is that a possibility? Oh, for sure. Thank you for bringing that up. Uh, we absolutely have actually signed an agreement with the county park friends to help us get more funding for that, specifically the South County Park that we purchased last year, actually. Um, and so that has been a huge lift for us, and we're working together with them. We've also met with the Land Trust, and we are also talking with the Pajaro Valley Water Resources Management Agency. Um, and also with the fairgrounds. Um, and also, as I, I highlighted in, in my overview, um, how we look at land and open spaces and how we look at parks um, is three-dimensional nowadays. And how can we tie in potential easements or private land holdings and some of the other things out there to develop and continue to create that mosaic for connected corridors of travel where somebody can step outside their door and be on a, a trail or an open space area within five or 10 minutes. Um, and it's absolutely something we're also working with as far as um, we're working on a state of the trails plan where we're working with several other partners to, to develop that and what our state of the trails are for our entire county. That takes into account all jurisdictions and then also some of our natural resource management plans. So very much trying to get that park open as quickly as possible because people need it. And now that you mentioned the trails, um, I think me and uh, Supervisor Friend sit on a, on a PERFMA and they had mentioned the uh, Army Corps of Engineers had mentioned that we're the first uh, uh, project that has design with nature program. And so about creating trails and making those places accessible. Um, so hopefully we can work together with them as well. I think that's the final phase for the levy project though. Absolutely, um, we, are, we are working right now. We actually just got a grant from the Coastal Conservancy working on nature-based solutions for mid county here and as sea level rise comes in and it affects these lagoons so it's similar to that project down there and we absolutely are looking for ways to help in south county in regards to that and that might be an area that we have to look to in the future for acceptance and or looking at how we might accept maintenance or operations of that trail system once the levy goes in thank you that's it supervisor mcpherson yeah thank you when what you're doing uh with what you have is remarkable and thank you for just using for uh 48 percent of your budget as general fund we appreciate that very much uh and what you have done uh with what you have uh increasing from 60 to 74 uh parks over 20 years uh is really amazing and i would like to i don't know how we can reach out and say thank you to the volunteers and you said how many hours and i was at the annual get together at quail hollow and i think they alone had 3500 hours up there that's a, a diamond in the rough in the park system in my estimation but uh it's uh just tell those volunteers how much this county board of supervisors appreciates their efforts because i know that's why you are able to do more with less or not much more uh it's much appreciated and i know that you well aware of my office working with you uh and the parks team uh to explore the pump track in felton and a downtown gathering place in boulder creek and what i am really impressed by though is you're out 
the outreach that you have, not just in my district and up in the San Lorenzo Valley, but what you had mentioned, uh, the the Pace properties connecting Quail Hollow, uh, the uh, Whiting Road issue in Watsonville, I know you've got your eye on that target, um, and you, the polo grounds in, in, uh, <coughs> in Aptos and the Willowbrook uh, County Parks in honor of uh, Sergeant Damon Gutzweiler. What a tremendous uh, event that was not too long ago. Um, in the North Coast Management Plan. I mean, you've, you've spread yourself, well, I don't, I'm probably pretty thin, but you've spread it throughout the county. And that's, I really appreciate that. And I know there's a lot more that you want to do and that you have on the, uh, on your, on your uh, uh, list, but um, the legal challenges measure K is holding us up from doing some of the things that you really want to do that we want to do to provide more park services for people of Santa Cruz County. So um, hopefully that'll be resolved soon. And uh, what you're doing uh, with what you have is uh, really impressive. So I appreciate everything that you've been doing. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Supervisor Koenig. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Uh, Director Gaffney and Deputy Director Hurley, um, we, we, we talk a lot about um, all the wonderful parks. I mean, the First District does have quite a number of those parks given that we're centrally located and so accessible uh, to um, really folks in both um, North and, and South County. Um, you know, the Parks Department definitely benefits, as has been mentioned, from a lot of public-private partnerships, all the work that County Parks Friends has done uh, to help raise money for parks. Um, and of course, we have them to thank in a big way for uh, floral park renovation, which I'm really excited about uh, having a ribbon, well, I guess a groundbreaking soon, um, but a ribbon cutting not far behind, given that um, it doesn't take too long to put some of these uh, play structures together. Uh, happy to get out there with a, you know Ikea wrench if I can help. Um, and, and I mean, that's the other point, right? Volunteers, Parks Department really benefits from both of those. Um, you know, but as Supervisor Friend says, it also is, tends to be the first place people look to, you know, when we're in a, in a bad budget year um, to cut. So I'm glad to see we're not cutting the department at all this year. That's a, that's a win. Um, you know, how, but this sort of, I mean, you pointed out there's 29 positions in 2004. 28 positions in 2024. We've added 14 parks during that time. Um, by my calculations, we used to have roughly a, a, a one to two ratio, one staff person for every two parks. And now um, if we were going to get back there, we need 37 maintenance staff. So we need like an additional nine um, maintenance staff. Um, in your estimation, would that be the best way to bring a better level of maintenance to parks? Would it would be increased staffing, or is it um, you know, how how do we make sure our parks are in better condition? Because I'll be honest, I mean, I I, I think our parks are heavily used, and I get a lot of concerns from people saying like, why does my park look so shabby? I mean, I'm not blaming you. I think it's a budget question. Um, but how do we how could we ultimately improve the quality uh, and maintenance of our parks? Um, I don't think it's any secret that I've worked for a couple of other jurisdictions in my career, and um, some of those are very well-funded jurisdictions. And um, in those jurisdictions, you would have one maintenance worker assigned to each park unit. And so if you're comparing to other jurisdictions, it can be a, a little bit of a, um, a morale buster at, at best. Um, we, I am absolutely stunned and impressed by the amount of work that our maintenance workers do get done. Um, but I absolutely guarantee you for every, every position you bring on, the people will see improvements in our, in our parks, our signs, our landscaping, our resource protection, our facilities. Um, they take pride in those facilities. But when you're asking, um, you know, you've heard it from other departments when you're asking a single maintenance worker to drive all over Santa Cruz County in and out of traffic to cover seven parks in one day, um, you can imagine do the math on how much time they get to spend there. Um, so I think moving forward, it is continuing to develop alternate resources for funding and how we how we fund our maintenance workers and how we fund our staffing, um, continuing to build on the partnerships and collaboration. I'm, I think it's a momentous occasion just to be back to where we were in 2004 with staffing. Um, it was different fee structures then. Um, but yeah, I'm, I would, I'm not to pick on anybody, but you could go to the city and county of San Francisco where they have an over, yeah. overlay of both city taxes and county taxes. Um, and it's a, it's a 
it's a far cry from where we are, and um, I'm very proud of where our, our, our staff get us um, with the limited resources we have. Yeah, I mean, you, you, you alluded to other funding sources, and of course, uh, hopefully Measure K will be freed up here soon. And this board has already said that we want to spend another million dollars on parks uh, per year. Um, and then, of course, earlier at this meeting, um, you know, the um, measure driven by the land trust, which would ultimately fund open space and, and parks, um, you know, re received uh, enough signatures to be qualified for the ballot. So um, I think you know, we all, every supervisor here endorsed it because we are hopeful that we can uh, get more money for parks and open space that way. Um, so, you know, I think a larger conversation uh, around how we get more funding for two parks is, is coming soon as we have more clarity around uh, those funding sources. Um, I just want to, one last question for you, which is what's the where are we with the state of the trails plan? Um, and, you know, you, you brought up that it's it's not just parks play structures. I mean, it is all this open space that you manage and really our parks serve a, a dual role that way. And to that extent, I'm really eager to see a trails plan done for our parks. Um, is that something that can be accomplished this year with this budget and something that, you know, or is further out? I'm going to defer to Deputy Director Hurley on that one. <clears throat> um. Thank you. So we are working um, with multiple agencies on a collaborative State of the Trails project. As you know, we are anticipating getting a final version of that um, by the end of this year at the latest. Um, in that measure, then we could be able to work on our own um, trails master plan for county parks um, within the county park system. So um, that endeavor could take um, a, a year or more. But using that state of the trails plan that we're getting um, here very, very soon, and we would be able to put something together that's specific to the trails master plan for county parks. Right. The state of the trails plan is collaboration with Santa Clara County. And mm -hmm. I mean, I think maybe even like there's five San Mateo County. Was, and, yeah. San Mateo, Santa Clara. Um, there's a couple of nonprofits involved and um, a consultant that does this full time all the time. Mm -hmm. So it, it's a. Uh, it's definitely how do we connect, as I talked about, sort of that web of, of corridors and wildlife space and also for humans to use that same space, right? So we could, the state of the trails could be completed this calendar year and then potentially, we, you know, given appropriate funding, we could uh, embark on a trails master plan for our county, maybe next calendar year. Yes, we're only about um, 25 or 30 years behind on it, but we, okay. we would be able to do it. Right. We're, we're trying to catch up. Well, I'm glad it's at least uh, on the horizon. Absolutely. Yeah, all the surrounding counties have theirs in place already, so we are a little behind. Great. Thank you. All right. Well, <clears throat> just want to uh, express my appreciation for your department and all the work um, that you've all been doing across the county, but in particular with the third district. It's just been a um, real pleasure over the past year being able to work with Parks Department, especially with the amount of effort that they put into um, kind of coordinating and corralling folks for the North Coast Facilities Master Plan, which is a multi-year effort that culminated um, with approval of that plan by this board a few uh, weeks ago. I just want to touch on um, kind of the, the projects that are underway and was just wondering if you could speak to, you know, it seems like the projects that have been proposed are ones that are likely going to start kind of breaking ground and moving forward. But I know in the North Coast Facilities Master Plan, there are a number of projects that committee members are really kind of eager to see move forward as it relates to safety improvements at Greyhound Rock and also Cement Plant Road. So I'm just wondering if you could speak to kind of, you know, um, how we're going to be able to move forward with those as well. Um, um, Go ahead. Uh, so I'm happy to say this so that you've you've denoted the top three prioritized projects for the North Coast Facilities Management Plan. And we are moving forward, as I noted in my presentation, that we'll be, we're going to finalize an MOU with the California Department of Fish and Wildlife, which will be the first step in, unfortunately, many steps, but a very optimistic outlook on transferring that property to county parks, where then we would work on the low-cost accommodation um, project there. So that's one of those um, projects and the Conservancy has already um, denoted that they have retained funding for the planning component of that. So we are planning on, in a, in the, we're going to attach the MOU to our planning application and we're um, anticipating that to go to the Conservancy board in August, I believe. We have to submit it by July. Um, and then in regards to the cement plant road and um, I, I think you said shark fin cove parking area, 
Um, those items, we are continuing to work on the application to submit to the Conservancy, who previously had stated they could look into funding those. Um, most recently, they've um, noted that because of the state's budget, they're not anticipating being able to fund those currently. However, we are going to move forward with continuing to in you know provide the application to them. So it's kind of in the lineup. Great, appreciate. It. Um, also, just want to you know touch on the fact that. Our parks and open space, when we think about health and well-being of our community, like that is one of the number one assets that our county has in terms of making sure people can not only connect with nature, but they're able to be in a healthy, um, safe environment in the outdoors. Um, as we saw during COVID, um, many people uh, were trying to figure out where they could go to get out of, you know, the concrete jungles of, of some of our larger cities in the Bay Area. and you know, fortunately or unfortunately, depending on how you want to look at it, you know, the, the beaches, especially the beaches on the North Coast became a safe haven for folks to visit. And so I just really want to, um, you know, we don't have many quote unquote parks in, in my district, but we do have some of the most amazing, well, I'm just going to like highlight my district, but we have some of the most amazing beaches yeah. in Santa Cruz County. And I think that um, the work that you all have been able to accomplish over the past year with trying to, you know, uh, with especially in regards to our North Coast facilities plan is really going to make those places more welcoming. Um, it's going to make them more ecologically friendly with, you know, improved bathrooms and trash. And so really just want to um, thank you all for that. And, you know, let the community know that we're going to see some great improvements coming to the North Coast. Um, and then I guess I just touch on county parks and I know the Whiting Road purchase, which happened a year ago, and this desire for public par private partnership. I've been talking to some folks who are interested in rugby, and I was able to have them meet with Supervisor Hernandez. But they, you know, UCSC, for example, they can they'll have rugby and soccer use the same fields at different times of the year. But there's funding from the rugby community that's interested in helping with that. So I'll continue come conversations with Supervisor Hernandez to see if that's something that they'd be interested in. But just an example of another group that could help support that effort. So. Um, that I don't have any other questions or comments, and so I'm just wondering if anybody on the board would be willing to make a motion. I'll, I'll make the motion to move. <laughs> yes, yeah, that's cool. I got a real quick comment too, if you want to. Second. Okay. So a motion to move the parks budget by Supervisor McPherson, seconded by Supervisor Hernandez. Supervisor Hernandez has another question. So yeah, can, more of a comment, right? So I'm hoping that we can move this uh, Measure K. Um, forward um you know district one we're really looking forward to having complaints about shabby parks <laughs> and uh i think district one also really looks forward to ground breaking breaking ceremonies and ribbon cuttings that other supervisors are commenting on so i want to gladly support this motion <laughs> okay well with that i'll turn it to the clerk for a roll call vote on this item supervisor koenig aye friend Aye. Hernandez? Aye. McPherson and Cummings? Aye. That passes unanimously. Okay, so with that, um, we're going to move on to uh, community development and infrastructures presentation, which is next item on our agenda, after which we will take a break for lunch. Um, but and depending on what time, we'll see how much time we'll take for lunch, probably about a half an hour before we finish up with the rest of the items on our agenda. So welcome, Matt Machado, Director of CDI. All right, good afternoon. Thank you, Chair Cummins and members of the board. Great to be here today and uh, really great to present a combined budget this morning. Ready here? Um, make sure we get everything working. I'm always worried about this to make sure it's gonna work for me. It's, looks like it's going to. So um, thank you, good afternoon. Uh, Matt Machado, Deputy CAO and Director of CDI. Um, I'm leading off with a photo here that's very uh, exemplary of, of our year, our past year, and I think our future. Uh, road failures and natural disasters seem to be a part of our everyday life here in Santa Cruz County. You know, these road failures affect how we live, where we live, and our economy. Access is critical to all members of our community, uh, and this picture really shows that. Um, this is a failed culvert at Main Street at Bates Creek. Uh, this road is the only access for about 500 homes in the Soquel area. Uh, and it really shows the integrated and critical nature of land use planning and our built environment. 
So today I plan to cover these items. Um, and I wanna start by thanking our CDI leadership team. Um, they really provided all the content for this presentation and for all the hard work. Um, you know, I wanna thank them for that. They, they do it day in and day out. Uh, they make our department effective and successful. And just to let you all know that our assistant directors are all here today and uh, they are available if we wanna get into some of the details of their work, details of the numbers, uh, but we will cover this agenda. I'm gonna start with uh, the, the mission of our department <clears throat> and I'm gonna read it because it's really gonna, it, you're gonna hear more about it throughout the presentation, but it's to improve customer services, streamline projects and to align public infrastructure and private development to further county goals in attainable housing, reliable transportation, and sustainable environment. <clears throat> and today I'm, <clears throat> sorry, excuse me. <clears throat> I do plan to cover accomplishments this past year, which were quite amazing actually. And uh, you'll see based upon these accomplishments that uh, we're on the right target for this mission. We we've achieved this mission. Uh, but as we go forward with our current financial crisis, which you're gonna hear a lot about today, uh, this will be much more difficult in the future. <clears throat> So this slide is our leadership structure. Um, I do want to note a change, and this is you'll, you'll hear more about this, and you heard it this morning from uh, Budget Manager Pimentel that our Capital Projects Division is being moved into General Services, and so and so the Director of Capital Projects is not on our leadership team, uh, but they're moving, and you're going to hear more about some of those changes here here briefly. Okay, let's dig into some of our achievements, and they're they're worthy and, and noteworthy and and I think uh, you'll appreciate them. So these are the larger achievements that, that we saw this past year. Uh, on our planning side, uh, we saw the sixth cycle housing element uh, approved by the state uh, just last month. And this housing element is projecting 5,000 new housing units over the next eight years. Our sustainability update, our general plan update was certified this past March, and it included code modernization and streamlining uh, also with increased densities to provide critical housing, really large milestones. And then a few other uh, achievements in the planning side of our, our house, the expedited housing development. This is really driven by state law, but it really is gonna result in some expedited uh, plan check services for new single family homes. <clears throat> our vacation rental enforcement saw 90 citations this past year. And uh, we are currently developing a new program and dashboard for reporting that action. Our new website went live on May 1st. Very exciting. If you haven't seen it, check it out. And then uh, we've really started a new, a new focus on equity and public participation. This is really uh, important to hear from people that we don't typically hear from. And so we're really focused on uh, bilingual outreach and uh, focused on, on um, other barriers such as economic barriers, uh, trying to encourage more participation from people that typically don't participate in our processes. On the public work side, um, and we all have seen this and we'll see more about this today, but we had a, a really a, a Herculean, amazing response to our 2023 emergency response. Um, it did result in 122 repaired sites. And uh, I gotta, I've gotta share with you right here that, that responding in an emergency fashion <clears throat> not only saves time for the permanent repair, but it also saves costs. We estimate it, it saves about 30% cost by making repairs in an emergency fashion, which is a real benefit to the community and to, and to our agency. Uh, we did see 26 miles of resurfacing done. Uh, this was the largest single year of resurfacing in the history of our department, so major milestone. And our sanitation um, groups, uh, our, small, our small districts, saw vast improvements to improve resiliency and environmental protections bolstered by numerous grants. We've been really successful with securing grants for many of our small sanitation um, agencies. Our big basin wastewater effort uh, saw some great success with a recent vote of uh, the people, the community there that um, said yes, transition this from a private wastewater facility into a public system uh, for longevity and for better service. And then our SoCal uh, buffered bike lane project. This is such a critical safety and congestion project. It's really, uh, I think the largest single construction project our agency is undertaking in, 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 in our history. Um, and it also includes one of the largest grants we've ever received. 
Um, the Green Valley Bike Path Project, that's a $5 million grant um, for Great Lenia Safety and Mobility in South County. And then our Buena Vista EIR, the notice of preparation hit the street this spring, and that will lead to some really critical needed projects, uh, the construction of new transfer stations, uh, organics facilities, and the closure of our new of our, our aging landfill. So let's look into some of the numbers. Uh, this slide is a combined budget um, of both planning and public works. I will show you each of those individually as well. I just wanna uh, make a couple of notes here. Uh, to begin with, you see a dramatic uh, reduction in revenue and expenditures. That's really driven by the public works side, the disaster projects. Uh, and I'll, I'll show you the specific numbers of, of why that is, but there's gonna be a dramatic decrease in what we can do for uh, repairing storm damage uh, road sites. Uh, the other thing that uh, this slide shows, and I, I just wanna show some clarity on this, um, it's on the, uh, the planning side of it, and we'll get into details here in a minute, but last year's final budget uh, for planning included a prior grant revenue carryover, which is yet to be adjusted. And absent this adjustment, the, con the general fund contribution is so shown as this significant change. And that's just, uh, that's not really the case in actual spending. Uh, the actual general fund contribution is near status quo from last year to this year. And I'll show you those actual numbers here in a bit. Um, so I'm gonna also speak to the, the funding change here. You can see that minus 6.75 uh, budget manager Pimentel uh, shared this this morning but I'll share a bit more about it on this next slide. And so here's the breakdown of that 6.75 uh, reduction. This is really driven by the shift of capital projects division into general services. And you can see in the footnotes, the real details of this number. And so capital projects has 10 positions that will be shifted to general services. And in uh, public works, we're uh, proposing to add uh, three new positions and that would be a co-compliance investigator for recycling and solid waste, which their one of their primary missions is going to be to address illegal dumping, which is important to all of us. Uh, there's also a new accounting tech proposed for recycling and solid waste to manage uh, all the workload being generated by some of the new state legislation. And then one accounting tech being added into administration to help do the uh, federal disaster uh, invoicing for, um, for reimbursement. So that's the, the details there. So I wanna look at a, the next couple of slides, the details of each of the budgets for planning and for public works. And even though we're presenting combined, they really are separate budgets because they're on a different um, uh, basis, a bit different financial basis. <clears throat> this is the public works one. So you can actually see the, uh, the overall reduced expenditures and revenues due to reduced level of investment for storm damage roadway repair. Uh, we'll further detail this in some coming slides. And, but this is all due to a combination of excessive storm damage repairs and, and a bit of reduced overall revenues, which I'll brief, uh, brief you on in a minute. Uh, one note I wanna make here is that uh, there's a gen, uh, zero general fund contribution. The negative general fund contribution they can see on this chart is really a part of the capital projects division and will be going to uh, general services. So I know it's a bit hard to see, and I just wanna use this as a graphic really, uh, but looking at the, uh, still looking at the public works budget, looking at revenues and expenditures, the pie charts, on the left-hand side, um, the revenue is really generated from projects. And so the bottom left of that pie chart, the 50, it's almost 54% is job cost billings. And so that's uh, us doing work and, and billing, for the, billing for that work. And then the top right, the 38% uh, is really, state and federal reimbursement, mostly in the disaster uh, arena. And so that's what's really driving the revenue side of our public works division. And then on the expenditures, the bottom left, the services and supplies, almost uh, 57% is really um, the cost uh, that we spend with contractors actually doing the work. And then the top right uh, at 22% is really our staff cost. <clears throat> Shifting gears a little bit into the planning uh, budget, um, I mentioned earlier about the um, about the carryover uh, that's that really didn't materialize, and I'm going to show that in actual numbers. Uh, but but the point I want to make here is that from a staffing perspective, it's a status quo. We're we're not adding any positions uh, to the planning side. 
let's look at the details of what's really driving the, the numbers here. <clears throat> and I know this is a little bit hard to see. I'm just going to point out a couple numbers. And so if we look down to the, uh, to the bottom right, if you look at the year-to-date actuals and the estimated actuals, uh, the general fund contribution is somewhere between six and seven million for this current year, fiscal year 23-24, and our projected uh, general fund contribution is is about six million. So it's really a status quo budget, um, and so I just wanted to point that out. If you really wanted to look closely, um, you can actually see in the 23-24 adopted budget uh, a fairly significant grant that just didn't materialize, and that's that five million dollar number on the second column. Uh, on the line of intergovernmental revenues. The other thing I want to point out uh, in this slide is that the majority of planning is driven by land use permitting. And you can see in the top right uh, that the vast majority of our revenue uh, comes from a permit center, our permit revenue. And it's about nine and a half million dollars. And uh, the permit center, the interaction that we have with the, the community, with our customers, is about 8.8 .8 million, and I'll show you a little more of that here in a second. Um, and there's also needed support, obviously, to uh, to complete that pie. But this really defines our customer service level. And so the direct interaction that we have uh, with our community providing direct services is about 90% of our revenue. The cost to provide our service is about 90% of the revenue. That's really That really defines our customer service model. And I want to com compare that and contrast that to our RPC, our contract with Four Leaf. And so the service they provide, which is exceptional, uh, and very happy to have them a part of our, our team, uh, but the cost to provide that service is approximately six million, while the revenue they generate is about four million. And so their customer service model is closer to 150% model. Um, in addition, uh, we provide additional support, which which I'll show you here in a second. So I, just, I wanna show that because as we talk about the transition from the RPC four leaf model up to our fourth floor model, I want um, us all to understand the customer service model that, that we live under. So here's a little more detail of, um, of how we spend that revenue and the general fund contribution. And so you can see the direct interaction of the permit center is about 50, almost 55% of the budget. Uh, you can also see that we provide significant uh, support to the RPC uh, in addition to the contract amount with uh, with Four Leaf, and so um, just to point those items out. Okay, let's move into some uh, budget goals. So I'm going to start with the public work side of it, <clears throat> and you can see our goals. And uh, as I mentioned, moving into this new year, new fiscal year, uh, we will be seeing some challenges due to the fiscal crisis. But I can tell you that um, that we will still strive to achieve these goals. And so um, while striving to achieve our goals, we also try to manage expectations within our available resources, <coughs> fiscal responsibility. <coughs> Excuse me. I should have brought some water up today. Uh, fiscal responsibility with our current financial outlook will result in a more metered approach to responding to road failures and natural disasters. And grant funding opportunities will be focused on critical safety and road failures within the limitations of our local match. Some of our goals for <clears throat> our planning group, uh, we are finalizing the fourth floor remodel plans in an effort to provide a more customer friendly UPC lobby. Um, and also during this coming year, you'll see a sig significant steps forward to implementing our housing element program. This is pretty exciting. Um, a part of this implementation will be the rezoning of a number of parcels and then also the completion of a, a new nexus study looking at a housing fees and program, including the inclusionary housing percentages for new development. And for goals three and four, I'm going to um, move to the next slide to, to describe, describe those efforts. <clears throat> so some of the changes that, that we're anticipating and that we're requesting as part of this budget include um, expanded consultants, expanded use of consultants, and this is to maintain level of service in some of the new requirements that were, that were mandated by. Um, it also includes this transition of the RPC from the four leaf contract up to our staffing. Uh, thank you for extending that contract uh, through to December, and then we'll be transitioned into, uh, into mainstream services uh, for those customers. <clears throat> 
We also uh, are looking at, um, due to the status quo for staffing, we'll be looking at using extra help, interns, and consultants to provide uh, gaps in service uh, due to lack of staffing. And, um, and our digitization, digitization project is on hold for now, but we hope to continue that in the future. Um, on the public work side, we've, we've discussed a bit about uh, the move of capital projects to GSD. We discussed the, the change in staffing levels. Uh, the next item there is some equipment investment. That entire 2.1 million is in the solid waste division to meet the needs of, um, of managing our landfill. And then that bottom right is really um, kind of a summary in it. And even though we are going to face financial challenges this year, we're still delivering a lot of great work. That $66 million of investment includes uh, transportation, sanitation, and flood control. So we don't want to ever lose sight that we still will be delivering some great community benefits and great projects, even though it maybe doesn't meet the total need uh, of people's expectations and, to be honest, needs. <clears throat> so some of those uh, benefits, uh, just a, a little bit more about on the planning side, uh, we're really focused from a policy and a funding standpoint to increase affordable housing. Uh, we're really focused on permit streamlining which will include uh, some of the consultant work that we propose. Uh, we're looking at promoting infill development with our general plan update and our housing element. The ADO incentive program uh, includes reduced fees and also pre-approved plan sets that are available today. <clears throat> and then uh, we discussed the improved outreach that uh, we are using and we, can, we plan to continue to, uh, to use. On the public work side, um, safe, reliable road network. And uh, that's gonna be a challenge, of course. <clears throat> Responsible collection and treatment of wastewater. We've seen great success in our sanitation group. And then of course, on our solid waste, continue the diversion of materials uh, to reduce generation greenhouse gases. So I'm gonna shift gears into a very focused next half or dozen slides or so. And I wanna talk about storm damage and uh, what we've done and what we have yet to do. So. <clears throat> in 2023, uh, we had a, a very major disaster. In fact, in the past eight years, we've had eight federally declared disasters. And so it's put us in the situation we're in today. Um, 2023 was really one for the record books. You can see the, the, the significant damage we saw in our roadways. Um, I'm gonna go through the ones that we've completed and the ones that are budgeted and the ones that we really don't have a plan for yet. Uh, so in total, we had 208 sites with damage at a total cost of $135 million. Keep in mind, this is just on county maintained roads. So it was a very, very significant impact to our county. Here are the projects that we were able to complete, all of these under emergency contract, which had some advantages. Um, I can tell you that uh, in an effort to implement all these projects, we did use criteria, prioritization criteria that we did share with your board um, back near the time of the disaster. And I wanna share with you right now, that criteria still holds true to today. We may be looking at additional criteria, but, but for today, that that prioritization um, criteria was developed based upon road classes, whether it was a collector, major collector, uh, whether the road was a one way in or not, uh, whether the road lost an entire lane, and whether it was compromising utilities or culverts, and then whether the project was ready or not to go to construction. And so that was the criteria. We gave every project a score. Uh, these projects uh, are the ones that we completed based upon that, that criteria. And you can see, um, the coverage, it really covered the entire county from the furthest south to nearly the furthest north. Everyone was affected by, by this damage, but also by these repairs. So the 122 sites of repair had a cost of nearly 70 million, uh, plus we had about 10 million in debris removal, which is Cat A, Cat B as part of the initial disaster. And, um, you know, this is still on the, on the, desire to highlight some of the good work we did because we really did do some good work. Our staff worked tirelessly to, to see these through. So the next few slides are gonna be examples of this repair. So here's Glenwood Drive, post mile 2.6. 
This was a $1.6 million project. Here's this next slide is the same site. And look at the effort that had to go into that repair. That road completely collapsed and required significant repairs to get it back open. Here's Highland Drive, post mile 4.55. Uh, this is a $1.5 million project, um, critical road. Here's Redwood Drive, Redwood Road, sorry, post mile 0 0.4. This was about a half a million dollar project. And then I'm going to end on, on the really the big one. And this is how we started the presentation, but this is Main Street. This is uh, at Bates Creek. Um, this is a culvert that washed out. And the repair on this was four and a half million dollars. And so significant damage. Um, and here's another great picture of the completed work. You can really see the connection between roads and where people live. You can see the homes in the in the background there. Uh, in all, we uh, spent right at $70 million to make all these repairs. Uh, but due to slow federal reimbursement and uh, lacking a federal match, we had to finance much of this work. And your board um, has heard a lot about this and you you supported this bond effort. Uh, just to fund these repairs alone, uh, we uh, had to secure debt of about $56 million just for the repair work alone, not to mention all the other disasters, but for the 23 repairs, $56 million goes into this initial response. And with debt comes debt service. And so the point I wanna make here is that, is that a significant portion of our fuel taxes is now going into debt service. Um, you can see that 2.7 million, uh, that's kind of a combination debt service payment. For the 23 disasters, the debt service is just a little over 2 million, but that accounts for about 16% of our total fuel tax revenue that's now going to debt service. And so clearly that's going to impact our ability to not just continue repairs, but also do other good work for our community. The conclusion here is that um, new funding sources will definitely be needed. And I'll, I'll speak more to that here in a minute, but um, there's really no other viable solution to see this through considering the debt and the, and the needs, the un, unfunded needs going forward. So speaking of unfunded needs, this slide is showing 54 projects just from the 2023 disaster that is not currently budgeted or funded for repairs. And you can see it really does cover the, the vast majority of our county from the south to the north. It's really everywhere. Um, the next slide is, is going to be a little more detail about, that, about, about these projects and more. And so the purpose of this slide is to summarize all of the unfinished work from major disasters in recent times. So 2017, uh, we've completed 160 sites worth almost $100 million, but there's still 31 to do. And uh, those are valued at about 24 million. And our vision for the 2017 completion is over the next three to four budget cycles, we'll complete those 31 sites. 2017 has an advantage over other disasters. It has ob federal obligations. So it has the best chance of getting federal re reimbursement. So 2017, uh, even though it's gonna take three to four more years to complete, is, prob is hopefully in good standing. For 2023, uh, we have very little federal obligation, which makes it a riskier proposition. But we did complete 122 sites worth almost 70 million. You saw some examples just a minute ago. But what's uh, proposed to be done over the next three to four budget cycles is just 32 more sites valued at about 27 million. Seven of that million is funded from debt service or debt, um, debt financing. And what's remaining in 2023 is 54 sites worth about 30 million that we don't have budgeted and we don't yet have a plan for. And I'll speak to that here in a second. In 2024, we had more damage. We had 34 sites valued at about 20 million. Uh, we, we don't yet have a plan for that either. So in total, we have 88 sites without a plan to fix worth about 50 million. And some of this work that's not being um, funded today, and, and I'll speak to this a bit, but it includes, it's, it's real sites and it has real risks. And so some of those sites include Trout Gulch with eight sites of damage, Mount Charlie with seven sites of damage, Eureka Canyon with four sites of damage, North Rodeo Gulch, four sites of damage, Vienna Drive, three sites of damage, 
Hazel Dell, three sites of damage and dozens more just like that. And I bring that up because when a road has multiple sites of damage, if one or more of those fail during the next winter, we have a serious problem on our hands. We have people that cannot access their homes at that point. So it becomes an, another local emergency. And so there's real risk with not having a financial plan. Uh, but that said, we're committed to figuring this out in the coming years. And the way we see it going forward is developing new funding sources, working very closely with the CAO's office and with your board. I think the only viable solution here is finding new revenue sources. Um, the need is great, the funding is not, and we need to solve that problem. And we're committed to doing that. We will be bringing ideas, solutions, strategies back to your board in the coming months uh, with a hope to come back with a solution in the near future. <clears throat> So I hate to show you this picture, but I'm gonna anyways. This is two of our road closures. What we have here is Mount Charlie with a major uh, mountain slide, and we have Paulson Road, uh, hard closures on both of these. These are two examples of unfunded road closures, and we have six more, six more across the county that are closed. Some of those uh, will be repaired in the, in the near, in the future few years, but some will not. And these two do not yet have a plan for repair. So, I'm gonna shift out of the 2023 um, specifics and just highlight a, a bit of the change from this current fiscal year to the proposed fiscal year. And I mentioned the dramatic decrease in expenditures and revenues due to reduced work and disasters, uh, due to federal reimbursement and a lack of local match. You can see it here that um, in this current fiscal year, we had significant uh, disaster relief revenue, uh, both in the form of of um, actual reimbursement and actual debt proceeds. And so that won't be occurring this next year. Also, I wanted to highlight here uh, about a $600,000 reduction in fuel taxes. And this is just from the state's perspective. They give us projections and this is one of them that's gonna dramatically affect us. So not only are we spending a significant portion, about 16% on debt service, we're also seeing a reduction in fuel taxes, which will impact our general maintenance and our road system in general. Uh, next, I'm going to shift gears on you and highlight some of the uh, budget details of our of our planning budget, and uh, and I'll finish on touching it even a little more on the public work side. So, um, in our planning side, uh, we are projecting some um, increased revenues from construction cost multiplier increases. Uh, we are expecting increased residential permit applications, will, which will increase revenues. Um, another area of note is the um, ADU reduced fee program that'll actually reduce incomes. Um, and then we also are projecting, this is more on the housing side, but <clears throat> a decrease in state grant revenue, which I'll speak more to in detail here in a minute. Um, we are pursuing fee studies in, in multiple areas. Uh, the first one would be looking at our fee program, our entire planning fee program to see if it's covering our costs. And then also looking at our housing program, the Nexus study, which will look at impact fees and uh, inclu inclusionary rates. I mentioned earlier about the, the need and use of increased consultants for plan check services. We will also be using extra help and interns. Uh, we're looking at ways to solve some of our staffing struggles, uh, in particular, our chief building official. Uh, we've been, our, our last true full-time building official was a year and a half ago. We haven't had not great success with filling that position. We're looking at continuing recruitment and also contracting that service out. And, um, and the struggles continue there, but that's, we're, we're finding alternate ways to, to fill those positions. On the, um, on our housing front, uh, mostly our housing funds are passed through and in an effort to, it's mainly to uh, increase affordable housing. Um, I do wanna comment that in general, these sources of funds are being depleted. Uh, and so in the future, we will have to uh, deal with that. Um, and that will affect some of our affordable housing delivery. Here's a few projects in our, that we're uh, funding with our housing funds. And so you can see those three projects listed. Uh, the home grant listed is from 2019. We do not expect a future home grant beyond this one. Um, so we, we expect that in the future. And then, and then as I wrap up here, 
um, some of the details of our public works division. And I think this is an effort to try to show some of the some of the other work besides just the disaster work. And so um, you can see in the top right a significant um, a dollar amount for salaries and benefits. This funds 277 full-time positions. In special services, the, bu the proposed budget is $48.6 million. This, is, this includes budgets for solid waste, sanitation, and flood control. Uh, it also includes revenue for, for the staff that do that work. The 83 and a half million for transportation is, uh, is budgeted for um, some storm damage from the 2017 and 2023, as I described earlier. It also includes great projects like Soquel buffered bike lanes, the Green Valley Pathway Project, and some resurfacing projects, and then of course, road operations. The 4.6 million in fleet operations uh, includes the labor and the fuel costs, and also some of the equipment notes that I, I said I mentioned earlier, um, some equipment, uh, equipment replacement for solid waste. And then lastly, the, um, uh, the overhead costs, which really, you know, we talk a lot about this, but overhead's real. It covers things like risk management and the county cost allocation plan, which is the county's overhead. Some of the, uh, some of the state budget impacts, um, the housing side of it, uh, we are seeing a reduction of the REAP2 grant by about 50%. I would mentioned the reduced fuel tax uh, and the downward trend. And then just quickly on the unfunded mandates, stormwater permitting, the um, uh, CARB zero emission vehicles, that's the Air Resource Board, 1383 solid waste requirements and AB 2234. I wanna mention though that <clears throat> all of these state mandates uh, or most of them are, are probably critical to us that we probably do support them. The struggle is, is that these new requirements come without money. And so it spreads our existing resources very, very thin and it really impacts other services. And so even, all of, even though all of us would agree that cleaning our water, um, moving to a zero emission vehicle, um, taking more waste out of our landfill, expediting building plan checks, all that is really good things to do, but it comes without money. And so we're having to use our existing resources to do these expanded services and it impacts uh, the other services that we provide. So some future considerations. Uh, we talked a little bit about recruitment challenges like with our CBO. Um, we talked about some declining revenues and housing uh, those funds will be running out in the near future, the RDA funds and some other state uh, grants. And then we, I did mention a bit about the permit center um, and the service model. And uh, we, will, we will see this as we transition the four leaf contract upstairs into our, our front counter permit center. On the public work side, uh, we've discussed the fuel tax decline. And on this slide, you can see that Deferred maintenance is still a very, very large number, and it will continue to uh, uh, impact us in with regard to magnitude of damage when we're faced with climate change. And so together, it's really a, a massive challenge, and it's going to require new funding sources, as I mentioned, and we will all be working together with uh, alternatives and strategies to try to solve that problem. My last slide is our staff recommendations today. And as I share this on the slide, I would also like to thank our CAO Carlos Palacios and the entire CAO team for their support and leadership. We couldn't, we couldn't be here today without their help. And we hope that we'll continue that relationship in such a positive way as we did this past year with getting through these hurdles and finding new solutions that we can bring back to your board. And with that, we're here to answer any questions that you may have. Great, thank you so much for that presentation for the work of your department. Um, I'm gonna open it up to questions from the public to see if there's any member of the public here in chambers who would like to speak to us on the community, um, the Department of Community Development and Infrastructure's budget for 2024-25. Okay, seeing none, we'll go online and see if there's anyone online who'd like to speak to us on the CDS budget. Yes, Chair, we do have speakers online. Colin user two, your microphone's now available. Uh, 
Wow, uh, sounds like arranging the chairs on the deck of the Titanic is the county sinking. Doesn't sound good. I think maybe the county could declare we're like Ukraine or Israel, and we must have funds for real self-defense here. Regarding climate change, I urge you to listen to Dane Wigington of Geoengineering Lodge about climate weather intervention engineering and, and get educated and speak out against that. Um, let's see what else here. I think of how corporations privatize the profit and they socialize the cost. We're paying for corporate pollution like with plastic, which you referred to, and I'm looking at your zero waste publication for summer 2023, the cost of waste and how during the, I call it a pandemic lockdown, all of this plastic additional use production was required, filling up our landfills even more. And a figure here, 430 million tons of plastic are produced each year, according to Dane Wigington. Why isn't the pollution stopped? at its source, instead of us good Samaritans trying to deal with it. Um, in terms, anyway, those are, and it sounds disastrous financially. I, um, you want more money to monitor illegal dumping, get the corporations to stop producing the plastics and other toxins in the first place. Thank Public you. work. Nancy, your microphone's now available. Nancy's put her hand down. Watsonville Yoga, your microphone is now available. Good afternoon to the County Board of Supervisors. Good afternoon to the County Board of Supervisors. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. My name is Linda Aaron. I'm a resident and homeowner on Paulson Road since 2010 and have seen our road lay unrecovered from yearly flood damage each winter. Other than repaving once during the 14 years we've lived here, this road has been left as an unsafe mess. This winter, two levees on privately held land broke and caused sustained flooding that rendered Paulson completely broken and impassable. Not sure if these are levees that serve leasing to private ag production, but it is likely. If two levees that were on private land failed and caused this extensive damage this winter, isn't that grounds for the county to sue for damages and recuperate some of the cost of repairing our road? After many months of closure, two weeks ago, an 8,000 pound cement barrier suddenly appeared and blocked our road indefinitely. It has angered our community. Our road is used by a large percentage of 900 students and staff twice a day at Watsonville Charter and Alianza Charter School is a byway also for MSD school. Hundreds of people drive it to cross town to get to 152 and 129 and downtown from Eastern Watsonville. Our charter schools do not have buses for emergency evacuation of students. It would be a nightmare of fright and chaos for families to all converge on Whiting Road in case of emergency to get their children. There are were countless others who use the road for varied reasons and work crossing from one side of town to the other. We parents and working folks currently have to use Casserly Road at a cost of significant extra driving time each way, and the hundreds of extra cars are impacting pothole-ridden, narrower Casserly Road now as well. Blocking Paulson with a large cement barrier is not a solution. In addition, there are unbelievable amounts of illegal dumping of immense amounts of trash, refrigerators, toilets, a dozen cars just this year. Hundreds of garbage bags appear nearly every day while the road has been broken. Aesthetically, ignoring damage, Paulson Road is inviting the crime of dumping to flourish. It's a cycle of reinforcement that says our neighborhood doesn't matter. This did not happen to residents at Main Street when Soquel Creek flooded. Those repairs came very quickly to that region of the county. People worked 24 hours at a time to get Main Street open. Thank you very much. User iPhone, your microphone is now available. Yes, hello, my name is Olivia Flores. I'm from District 4. 
I am a parent of two students out at WCSA. I am also a trustee on the school board for Pajaro Valley Unified School District. I'm calling to petition you to make um, action for Polson Road. That road being closed not only affects the two schools out there, it has also wreaked, wreaked a lot of havoc on Lakeview and um, St. Francis with creating just excess traffic coming down 152 in East Lake. I just petitioned that those road, that you do put make Polson Road a priority. Thank you. We have no further speakers, Chair. Okay, just want to thank members of the comment, uh, members of the public for their comments, and I'll bring it back to the board for questions, comments, and action. I'll go with Supervisor Friend. This is the most challenging budget facing public works in recent memory. Uh, we fought a lot of hard fights at the local, state, and federal level to increase funding just to see it, in many respects, taken away from things outside of our control. Um, I think that your team has done um, pretty remarkable work with the storm damage work from starting in 17 to today, but I think that it's uh, very sobering what what uh, the reality is going to be on road maintenance in an already challenging environment in the next one to three years at least. Um, so I appreciate your team. I appreciate this report. It, um, I hope that it it also is is fully internalized and understood about um, there isn't a magic pot of money. There's a massive desire. I mean, your entire team wants to go out and build stuff. That's what they want to do. They want to fix it. They want to maintain it. They want to have new things for the community. And it's just not possible right now. So um, we'll keep our advocacy at the federal level, which is where the largest money can really shake free from the FEMA. But uh, Mr. Machado, you and your entire team planning and public works. Um, good to see them sitting together, too, to kind of show that they're one department over there um, are doing really remarkable things, even with very limited resources. So appreciate that. Supervisor Koenig. Thank you, Chair. Um, well, Director Machado, I just want to start by highlighting, uh, again, uh, uh, all the great work that your department is doing. Um, and of course, it's really sort of a double header here, um, you know, both planning and public works. Um, there's a lot to be proud of. I mean, on the planning side, the uh, getting the sustainability update approved and getting our housing element approved uh, are massive. I mean, this is setting the stage for a transformation in our community. Um, I'm already, we're starting to see uh, projects of a really significantly different type in the first district. Um, and uh, I'm sure we'll see a lot more soon. Um, and then of course, on the public works side, I mean, you showed Main Street before and after, um, that was huge um, for 500 residents that really their lifeline to uh, the entire community, to to food, to schools, to, um, I mean, to life. Um, I mean, and that highlights that roads are the one county service that everyone uses every day. I'm, I'm really excited about um, some of the proactive work we're doing. I mean, in addition to thank you for the 122 storm damage sites that have been completed. I mean, Soquel Drive, that project is going to be transformational as well. Uh, really excited to see where that goes. Um, you know, I, I want to highlight a couple of things that you said. So on the planning side um, around the permit center, you know, I consistently hear from constituents saying like, why is it taking so long? not feeling like they've gotten the level of service that they should. And I think what you highlighted is, well, that's because they're literally not getting the service that they're paying for. We're siphoning funds away from the permit center, away from people paying those permit fees to pay for, you know, other larger planning level stuff that yes, we need to do, but should we be compromising uh, our permitting process in order to do that? And if we funded permitting better, maybe we would actually solve this problem. I mean, you highlight two positions that I, mean, I believe they're under that uh, umbrella, um, the chief building official, um, which we can't really effectively build anything <laughs> at a chief building official. I mean, sooner or later, he, I mean, he's got to come in and make sure that, uh, you know, there's someone going out to inspect what's built these 5,000 units that we're going to build, bring online here within the next eight years, in theory, if we have someone to inspect them and say that they're move-in ready, right? So it's critical that we hire this position. And I know that we've uh, allocated a little bit more for a hiring bonus over the next few years. Um, hopefully that does the trick. But I mean, we got beat out by 40% 
uh, for a building official that we had before, 40%. I mean, we need to be ready to allocate the necessary resource to make sure that we fill this position. And of course, it's not only this position, but the one right under that, the senior building inspector, right? That I understand that's unfunded at the moment and you're not asking for it in this budget. Is that right? That's correct. Yeah, I mean, we've got to fund that position. I mean, that's the only way that we're going to build the internal team to approve these 5,000 new units. And even if you're, you know, someone frustrated with, uh, you know, the permitting review process and plan check and everything, well, the answer to that is more robust building inspections on the other end of the, the permitting cycle. So, I mean, this is critical. I mean, I think one basic place we could start here is say, all right, all the money that we get from permit fees are going to stay with permitting. And we're going to put another, it's about a million dollars of general fund revenue towards planning to cover the larger umbrella services. And of course, as you said, the, the four leaf service that everyone's so thrilled with, I mean, we're spending 150% of, you know, what we, we $6 million is spent. We're receiving 4 million in permit revenues from that. So yeah, people are delighted with the service at that point. <laughs> um, we should get a little bit closer to that. So that's on the planning side. I mean, and, and if we don't appropriately fund housing, I mean, all the rest of the services we've talked about are for not, I mean, right, we cannot hire behavioral health workers. We cannot hire, uh, you know, attorneys and, and the district attorney or uh, for the public defender's office. Like we're just, we can't hire correctional officers. If we don't solve housing, we're, we're, we're can't go anywhere, right? We're not gonna have any momentum into a better future. I, I, look, now let's talk about roads. <laughs> Right. I mean, that's really, um, you know, I, I want to, uh, I think you brought up a slide that talked about how much general fund money we spend on roads. Could you just repeat how much general fund revenue we're spending on roads? Uh, in, it's zero in general. I mean, sometimes the general fund bails out emergencies, but it's to zero, zero budget. Well, I want to, I want to point out that we did spend $5 million last year. $5 million general fund last year. We we funded SoCal Avenue with general fund. We've made a significant right. contribution there. Right. There's, but like I said, there's zero all general fund this year in all capital. Mm -hmm. And that, that's how we're balancing our budget. I mean, again, the alternative, I mean, $5 million, $7 million is a general fund contribution to parks. Mm -hmm. Right. So I hear you. But, yeah. you know, so, so we contributed five million to a special project. Great, super important project. Totally agree. Uh, great use of funds. But ongoing road maintenance, we're spending zero dollars. As a property owner paying property taxes, you'd kind of think the first thing your property tax money was going to go to was maintaining the road to your house. Zero. You know, maybe I could see like. Okay, 50%. I understand there's other things in, in the county to spend money on. 30%. All right, I don't love it, but but zero. I mean, yes, the climate crisis is exacerbating the condition of our roads and leading to hundreds of storm damage sites with every significant event. But it's also the consistent lack of investment in our road network that we've made over the last 40 years. We can't go on like this. First of all, I don't I, I tell you, as the one who is closest to an election cycle, <laughs> I have just been out there talking to voters on the other side of it now. They want their roads funded. It's the number one thing I hear about every single day. I mean, I could give you a list of the regulars right here. Um, you know, the, the and it's not just like the failure of our roads in the mountain areas, it's the safety of our roads in the urban area, too. And of course, we have we're, we're one of the you know worst uh, counties in the whole state as far as bike and pedestrian collisions for safety. Um, we're not going to change that. We're never going <clears> to <throat> achieve our Vision Zero goals if we're not making consistent investments in our road infrastructure. Even you know we talked about new. You mentioned new new funding sources. Well, we just passed a new funding source, and in fact, we advertise it to voters by saying we are going to spend money on roads. We also passed a funding measure back in 2018 called Measure G, a sales tax, where roads was one of the things we'd spend that money on, but apparently we're not because zero, that goes into the general fund budget and we're spending zero dollars from our general fund budget on consistent road maintenance. 
that Measure G expires in 2030. And we're going to have to go back out to voters and ask them for another measure. How are we going to do that with a straight face if we don't do what we say we're going to do? And if we don't uphold the most basic service that people expect us to uphold. So this is the biggest problem I see uh, in our county budget. Frankly, I don't know if, I mean, we're even if we choose not to allocate another dollar here other than what's asked for, uh, which which is not enough. I mean, we're not even taking advantage of, you know, some of the potential FEMA money for these remaining storm, dam storm damage sites. We always say, oh, well, we should invest in health and human services because that's where the matching dollars are. We can get a four to one match on that. But here we've got a, we've got a four to one match that we're going to leave on the table. So um, we, we've got to make a larger investment in roads, um, even just to have the money on hand to respond to these disasters. I mean, we are razor thin right now. I mean, between the contingency fund going down, not having, I mean, what happens with another storm if like three or four roads go out? We're gonna be facing lawsuits is what we're gonna, it's gonna happen. And whether we like it or not, we're gonna have to start spending money to now be on the defensive. I mean, and frankly, I'm, I'm worried about my own liability, right? As a fiduciary, uh, make sure that we maintain the integrity of county infrastructure. How could I sit here and not allocate a single dollar of general fund money to county roads and honestly say that I'm fulfilling my duties as a county supervisor? So I think it's got to be 10 million bucks as a starting place in this budget. We thought, okay, fine, let's say 6 million of that will come out of Measure K when uh, that's finally made available. We'll carve out four from the rest of the general fund budget. And if that sounds like a lot to you, consider that $80 million is coming from property tax money and 40 million is coming from vehicle license fees. And guess what vehicles need people? Roads. So it's a drop in the bucket, but at least it would be a starting place. So all my comments for now, and uh, when a motion's ready, I'm happy to make it. <laughs> all right, Supervisor McPherson. Yeah, I can't disagree with what uh, Supervisor Koenig said. And it's through no fault of the staff that we have or what we have. It's just the re the financial resources aren't there. And we, we realize on how do we get there. Um, and I have some extended comments, too, about, uh, first of all, uh, a couple of thank yous. I want to thank the CDI uh, staff once again for its work in getting the sustainable uh, plan uh, over the finish line with the Coastal Commission and uh, getting our housing element certified. Uh, that was a big lift uh, under the crises that we're facing. And uh, that's that's great. Um, we've a, a identified uh, additional opportunities that is related to housing uh, along the rail corridor. And that's, uh, that. I think we're gonna be looking at more of that too, as we go along on the Regional Transportation Commission. Uh, and we've made some recent progress though, too, I think, in, in the area of housing with uh, enabling third party plan checks. I think that's that's important, seeing the Unified Permit Center become functional and permitting tiny homes uh, and accepting more permit applications. Uh, uh, and I think it's it's interesting to know, we, people say they, they haven't, you know, not much has been built up there. And there's a reason I think it, the, the the criteria, the the numbers that I saw as I think up to last the first of the year was that 100 in my district had not even applied for a permit. Uh, what's the reason? Um, I don't know. Uh, is it cost of housing? Uh, they don't want to deal with this anymore. There's a lot of trauma involved. Uh, there's new uh, road uh uh, requirements and fire requirements that are being made. Septic systems are costing more and more and, and the state requirements over there. Um, so I, I think that, um, uh, you know, there, there hasn't been enough done and I get it. Uh, we, we need a chief building official to start with. Uh, and I know you've been trying to get one, but it's really not an easy task. And I think we need a, a vision to show how the community, the county is truly doing its part in being active to build more housing. Um, under the circumstances, it's gonna be very, very difficult for us to, to meet the new arena standards that the state has put down on Santa Cruz County and the unincorporated area you know, over triple what it was the previous eight year cycle. So I think um, 
the, we also have a great deal of work to do on our roads. And I think one warning I want to say is uh, Measure D of 2016, there's been some talk about putting a sense. Well, first of all, it's one of those who uh, put together that, that measure back then. Uh, the, the top priority was local roads, 30% of that. And there's some talk about some folks saying, let's take a little from that and put it somewhere else. Boy, I'll tell you, we better, we, we're not getting enough. We're far short of that. So we should not mess with Measure D of 2016 and its obligation to put seven, uh, what, 30% uh, of its revenues into uh, roads. And I think that, does that amount to about three million, six, what is it? How many? It's about three and a half, million. three and a half million. That's it. Uh, so, yeah, we, we just shouldn't mess with that. And I, I just, uh, I think we ought to stand up and talk about that with somebody who suggests that. Um, and with the um, the outstanding federal requirements, we uh, we see a very, very uh, modest improvement or vision for the future. Um, and I, I think uh, we've, and then we've had some things like um, really severe things. Paulson Road, we've heard about that. I was up at Mount Charlie with, and I want to tell you that Steve Wiesner is phenomenal. What he's done, and he, I went up with him just earlier this week and talked to these folks, and there's nothing in line for them immediately in the next few years, probably. But boy, that thing is going to take a lot of effort and money. And Congressman Panetta was there, and he's going to see what he can do. But boy, it's going to take a lot of cooperative effort to get our those types of uh, really substantial, uh, uh, really uh, dilapidation of roads, uh, any money go to that. But um, I just think that um, th th you're right. I think uh, your supervisor Koenig's right. More than anything else I hear probably is that do something on the roads that are in front of my house or on, on the way to my working place or to the grocery store or whatever the case may be. That is the number one thing I hear day in and day out up in the San Lorenzo Valley in particular, but in the fifth district in general. Um, I know that I, I think this should not be viewed as criticism of our CDI. It's just a situation where we don't have enough to do with what's before us. And um, we'll do the best we can. We have to move toward a better process if we can to speed things through. And I know that we're going to have a change with the uh, with uh, uh, four leaf moving up to the fourth floor. I think that's going to be some improvement so we can get permits moving as quickly as possible. But uh, I, um, as, as downcast it is, there's, there's some very good things. 20, what you say, 26 miles of road have been approved. Uh, since those disasters, uh, the big basin water situation, which is a small number of parcels, but it was absolutely essential that these pe people have a lifeline that, that they can uh, stay in their homes. Uh, there's been a lot of things that have been accomplished under some very tight restrictions, but um, we're going to just have to keep trying as you are. And I appreciate what you're doing. Um, I can't tell you how much I do appreciate some of the work that your public work staff and getting out there and getting uh, as much road work done as possible under the limited resources that we have. Thank you. Supervisor Hernandez. So uh, I'd like to say, you know, first of all, I would also support Supervisor Manu Koenig's um, you know, is uh, the, the need for more more supporting permitting and funding roads. Um, but first, I want to commend uh, CDI on the housing element. Of course, we need more housing in our county. Green Valley Road, uh, Holohan. But, you know, back to roads, you know, since the heart closure of Paulson, we've had a uptick in both District 4 and District 2 of complaints um, about Paulson, both by phone, email. And I, I served for the RTC for about two years with my predecessor, and I know he talked about Paulson Road for the last 12 years. You know, I think Paulson Road is situated in a more of a suburban area of unincorporated Santa Cruz County. It serves as a vital route for thousands of individuals daily, as people heard today. 
you know, including farmers, farm workers, parents dropping off their children at Alianza Charter School and Charter School of the Arts, as well as teachers, school administrators, and local residents. And in the near future, access from the Southeast to 181 Whiting Park. I think among the current eight fully closed roads that we have in the county, Paulson does stand out with significant traffic counts. On May 1st, 2019, the average daily traffic counts were recorded at 3,758. And since then, traffic has likely increased. Funding for Paulson Road would address critical infrastructure needs in South County, benefiting a large Latino population and limited income populations. Additionally, with the county's largest new park in the vicinity, Paulson Road's closure would impede access to the park. Now, I wanna mention about the traffic counts. If you keep in mind, the traffic counts were, were in May 1st of 2019. Keep in mind that it was in the middle of the pandemic and schools were actually closed. In our county, the schools closed on March 16th, 2019. And many people at work had a telecommute and we still had nearly 4,000 vehicles daily on that road. You know, I fully support that we do fund roads, but I think it's time that we, I'd like to see direct staff to allocate 2 million as a budget addition for Paulson Road to repair it, but to, to repair the damage caused in 2023 and 2024 storms, but also to provide for the planning of long-term solution to the flooding of Paulson Road. So we begin the planning process to actually find a solution to Paulson Road. Okay, well, I will just start by um, thanking CDI for, um, you know, all the thing directly entitled for the work that you've been doing over the past few years and for your staff. <laughs> and um, I guess I'm just going to start with just highlighting, um, you know, as as someone who comes from biological biological sciences, as someone who spent an extensive amount of my life studying climate change and what the future impacts of climate change would look like, for a long time, people have been saying that it's going to get things are going to get worse things are going to get bad and we're going to start seeing you know increased impacts around floods fires drought sea level rise etc and santa cruz is in a very challenging place because we have impacts from fire we have erosion and landslides and we have impacts to our coast um, through sea level rise we're in a very geologically unstable area. And, you know, I think that in many communities, what was anticipated was that when we would be faced with these disasters, that, you know, there would be support coming from the federal government to help us when we we're in need. And, you know, during COVID, for example, just to remind folks in the community, we were told that if we go and stand up all these shelters for people experiencing homelessness, we will make you whole. And that didn't happen. And maybe Carlos, you could speak maybe briefly about, you know, that situation and scenario when we were told that we'd be reimbursed by the federal government, what actually happened? Yes, this was um, Project Room Key during the pandemic. Um, the state of California um, asked us to shelter uh, vulnerable unhoused persons uh, to prevent what they were very worried about was um, a massive un amount of deaths in that community. There was a lot of um, people in fragile health in among the unhoused population. The fear was that in some of these encampments, the virus was very um, potent and would result in massive amounts of death, death in that community. So the governor came to local counties, asked us to house as many of these folks as they as we could in local in hotels, 
hotels were empty at that time because of COVID, right? So this was seen also as a, a way to fill up the hotels. So we did that. Uh, we had over 10 sites. We ended up housing more than 1,300 people. Um, at that time, both the governor and then FEMA also assured us that we would be uh, reimbursed 100% for those costs. And then um, two years, three years later, FEMA made a ruling saying that no, those reimbursements were li limited to 20 days. And many of the individuals who stayed in Project Room Key stayed as long as a year, maybe some even longer. So um, FEMA three years later says, no, it's just 20 days. That's what the ruling is, uh, despite the assurances we're given. So we're on the hook for almost $10 million of lost general fund money. So if, again, you look at where, why are we not putting any general fund money into that? Well, there it is. Uh, that's general fund money. Um, and the state of California as a whole is $300 million. Uh, so anyway, that's just one example. There's many other examples where the general fund is left holding the bag on emergency response. Um, CZU fire, there's other cases as well. Uh, that's an, There's an example of a debris removal that we made in emergency response. We've appealed that. Uh, we lost the appeal to FEMA. It's another eight or $9 million. Again, the general fund be on the hook for that. Um, and there's other uh, COVID costs also that are not covered besides Project Room Key. So um, right now we still have 20 some million, 26 million, I believe, of COVID costs still outstanding. So anyway, just examples of the general funds under a lot of pressure right now. Thank you. And that just also, you know, bringing it back to the comments that were just made, you know, it's not for a lack of trying on behalf of our our community development and infrastructure and the fact that they went out and repaired Soquel Road as quickly as they did demonstrated their, you know, dedication to ensuring that people had roads fixed when they're damaged. But the reality is that we have $143 million worth of FEMA claims that are still sitting at the federal level going back to 2017. We have exhausted our resources to the point where we we're now bonding, issuing bonds for money so we can keep up with the projects that are in the queue. So it's not for a lack of trying on behalf of the county and the Department of, of Community Development and Infrastructure. It's the fact that we are being now hit with disasters at a rate that's happening so quickly and so intensely that we are unable to keep up with it as best as we're trying. And if we had all the money in the world, that would be great, but partly why when we issued these bonds, and I asked for the support of the board to send a letter, which, which I'll still be working with CAO's office on to our federal partners, is to let them know how hard we're trying on this front and to get them to expedite refining the FEMA process and getting our, our claims filed and our claims and reimbursements um, settled. Because I think we can all talk about, you know, wanting to see 10 million here, 2 million there, like millions of dollars um, to go towards this, at the same time, when we come back, it might result in, for example, more positions in CDI getting cut that we need in order for folks to get their permits, um, to get the permits reviewed and approved. Um, it's gonna, it will likely lead to cuts in many of the other departments. And then I think that we're gonna open a Pandora's box of, you know, who gets funding for what. And I think when, when it comes to smaller amounts of funding that can help go a long way, that's one thing. But if we're saying $10 million to roads in, for example, District 1, then I would imagine that everybody's going to start asking for millions of dollars across all the districts. And I'm just, you know, if that's the direction folks are going to go in, it'll be interesting to see how that plays out. But I personally they think that, you know, we need to, I think it would be important that we're coming up with plans. And so if folks can identify the roads that are of greatest concern, if they're not already on that list, seeing if we can reprioritize them, that might be a way that we can try to see how we can get some of these road repairs done more efficiently and, and more quickly. But um, the, the lift that you all have provided to help support us during times of great uncertainty and um, the safety issues that have come along with that to help repair our roads, I think has been has been great. And I just want to thank your department for all the work that they've done during these tremendously unanticipated and unexpected times. Um, as it, with, with planning and um, with the planning department, so I'll, I'll end there on roads, but um, when it comes to the planning department, um, I, I'm, 
I'm happy that we got our housing element certified. I know that there was a lot of, you know, back and forth and confusion around, you know, when to get started, what needed to happen, I guess. Um, but when the next housing element cycle comes around, I hope we can be on top of it a little bit more quickly. The fact that we have Builders Remedy projects underway that are coming into the county and that we likely can't stop them um, is concerning because I have been hearing, I mean, it's not my district, but I have been hearing complaints and I would hate to see that happen in my district at, if it, during the next cycle and us not be able to do anything about it. Um, the one thing that I will point out with that I've heard after, from, after meeting with um, staff and CDI is that these projects will be 20% inclusionary for the builder's remedy. And if that's the case, I think that that demonstrates that we are able to have a 20% inclusionary rate for affordable housing and new developments. If the state has language that says in builder's remedy projects, you're going to have 20% inclusionary, I don't see why we're continuing to have that conversation. I also want to say, I want to ensure that if this Nexus study is going forward, that we are still considering Section 8 vouchers to help increase the amount of affordable housing and new developments to 20% at a minimum. Um, because when I, when prior to me being on the city council, a Nexus study was done to see if we can do 15%. And the Nexus study came back and said, no, you can't even do 15%. We imposed 20% back in 2020, I believe. And we didn't have any objection from developers and we, it has not stopped development from happening in the community. So I would just say that, you know, at a minimum, we should be considering moving the inclusionary percentage up to 20% and trying to figure out how we can make it happen rather than saying it can't happen because to Supervisor Koenig's point, you know, we're going to need affordable housing in this community if we want to you know, have the workforce that we need. I think he said housing, but I'm, I'm going to say that we, we're going to need affordable housing because with the market rate units that are going in in the city of Santa Cruz, 425 square foot studio starting at $3,000 a month. That's not going to help anybody who, like, that's not going to help county workers, right? Maybe some department heads, but not your average worker here in this community. So um, I think it's really critical that we're trying to maximize affordable housing to the great extent possible, that we're trying to, you know, push the envelope on what can be done in terms of affordable housing. And um, I think we need to be innovative thinkers on how we're going to actually provide the housing that our community needs, mm -hmm. not just build housing and hope that it's going to drop prices. Um, and so, you know, with that, um, I do share the concerns. I hear the concerns from the, my colleagues about roads and the need for us to get our roads repaired. And at the same time, I think that we really need to do what we can to put pressure to get our money back from the federal government that they owe us in order for us to make that happen. And so with that, somebody's got to make a motion here. I'll entertain the motion to move the um, staff recommendation. But, uh, you know, I, I'm going to change my little direction here that I have. I want to make sure that we do have a planning, a plan for Paulson Road. You know, I'm not putting a monetary um, number on it, but I'd like to see a real plan that we have for a long-term solution for the flooding of Paulson Road. But does that, uh, with the criteria that you have that you mentioned, there was four or five points. I mean, doesn't that include the importance of how many people at Paulson Road serves comparatively to some of those other eight, what was it, eight major projects? So I'm just trying to think, uh, I, I I understand your, your concern, but I, I just don't know how we're going to change what we have. And I think what you have done and to try and put those criteria together to say what's first. Um, is that going to help or how can, is that going to you know, confuse it more? Well, it's a good question. And um, I think I mentioned earlier that that criteria that we use for prior disasters, 2017 and 2023, we are looking to modify that criteria to add additional important elements. And so I do think uh, to Supervisor Hernandez's point and Supervisor Cummings' point, looking at the prioritization of roads, we'll continue to do that. And I think if, as we develop modified criteria, we'll see how that results. And I think uh, it could change the change the, the the lineup a little bit. Yeah, when do you think that might be done? Yeah. We're hoping to um, develop this criteria more in this coming calendar year. 
And I would say by the end of the calendar year, we'll have the some ideas. End of 25 or this year? 20, this year. Okay. I, I mean, I think that's, um, I think that's the way we should just go. What you're doing, I think is, is right on. And I, um, I just don't want to specify anything. And believe me, I know we've all got roads in our area that, uh, and Paulson's one of the top on the list, but I'd like to see that before I specify anything else at this point. You know, it'll be included in what. Yeah, I'm saying to be included in, yeah. but, you know, also just to have a plan for it, you know, a real plan for it. That's all I'm saying is, you know, there's, I know there's different sources of funding. You know, you got the SB1 funding, um, Measure D, you've got the county roads funds that we could find um, for this, you know. And so I, I, I think I'd still like to move in that direction. Uh, Chair, if I could offer an, an alternate motion. Um, so I, I'd move the recommended actions with additional direction that at the June 4th budget hearing, we see options to A, keep all permit fee revenue within the permitting division of CDI and allocate additional general fund money to the department to cover planning, zoning, and administration divisions. And then B, allocate an additional $10 million of general fund revenue to road maintenance, including $4 million of current general fund revenues and $6 million from Measure K. And including in that, look at uh, how those additional revenues could lead to an expedited project plan for Paulson Road. Second. If I could just comment on that, I appreciate the desire um, and your uh, frustration of not having enough funding. Uh, we can certainly bring back revenue options. That's one thing. We could certainly bring back budget cut options, but all of those will be very painful. And would it, if we do that, this June 4th meeting is going to have 300 people here. Because mm -hmm. There's no magic here. This is a zero sum game. And I get it. You folks set the priorities and you guys, you folks are the ones who do this direction. But that direction at this point in the budget process is going to cause 300 people to come out here. All You saw how many people were fighting. We had testimony about various programs here today, contact visits, um, you've, uh, core, um, the uh, different priorities uh, that for parks. Um, and those aren't not with those aren't even taking into consideration massive cuts, because what that is talking about is pretty massive cuts. So before you do that, if I I can come back, I can balance the budget, and that's my fiduciary responsibility is to give you a balanced budget. And Edith Driscoll and her capacity have to certify that it's a balanced budget, but it will be painful. And I've tried to present you a budget that you know, is as balanced as can be, uh, that continues to make progress in all the areas that are a priority to the, to the county. But if we want to blow up the budget, we can do that. I can do that. And we can have 300 people here and we can have a massive, you know, um, food fight here. And I don't think anything's going to change. Now, if long-term you want to make those changes, then I think that's the direction to go. And the direction would be with Measure K. That's that's an example that this you know the board can allocate those funds, and that's future funds, right? That would be, I think, where to do it, not with the existing budget. Other than, and if you want to do existing budget, then I would give me give me six months to work on that and start coming back with options, not two weeks. So would SB one be a source, or everything is allocated? Every cent of our funds is allocated to. SB1, Measure D, gas tax, everything's allocated. And that's how we're doing these projects, right? That we're, you know, we have, um, you know, just next year, we have multi-million dollar projects for storm damage report, as well as road repair. All of that has been allocated. So there's no new funding, at least right now. Now, in terms of prioritizing for future, that's something different. But right now, everything, every cent's allocated. Well, I think that's what I was asking for is that we prioritize, but, you know, make a plan because we're not going to get funding for doing it, even have a plan for Paulson Road. Sure, if I, if I may. I, I mean, I, I appreciate uh, 
what you're saying, uh, CEO Palacios, um, and yeah, it certainly would be a, a big, a big fight and a long, long day. Um, I don't know that there's an easier way to do this. I mean, it's like, do you have that fight uh, on June 4th? Do you have it in September? Do you, I mean, whenever these kinds of shifts in budget are discussed, there's going to, I mean, we have scarce resources. We're an underfunded county. And, you know, to the chair's point, yeah, we're dealing with two major issues. We're not getting our FEMA reimbursements in a timely way, and we don't get the property tax percentages that we should. But there is one thing that is in our control, and that is how much money we allocate to our critical basic infrastructure. And right now, zero dollars is just not enough. I mean, I can tell you we could probably just as easily have 300 on the roadside as the human services side. Um, we've already seen plenty of folks here, you know, asking for that Mount Charlie get get fixed. I mean, I, like I said, we and like Supervisor McPherson said, we hear about it every day. And if you have a suggestion for a different timeline, um, fine. But I don't think it can be Measure K funds alone. I mean, we have to look at. I mean, I, otherwise, we need a plan for. I mean, what, what's what's the next twenty years look like, right? I mean, again, this is the largest source of our general fund revenues being property taxes and, and easily half of those properties are, you know, we know that they're in the wildland urban interface, which means they're probably in a more rural area or at least close to it. So maybe, you know, at least 25 to 30% of our property tax base is on one of these roads that could wash out. I mean, that's the issue that we're gonna have to deal with sooner or later if there's all a different uh, timeline that you suggest and I'm, I'm open to hearing it, but we're gonna have to have that fight and that make that change sooner or later. Supervisor McPherson. Um, you know, I think if we could, if additional direction to, to provide more clarity uh, about the criteria on road repairs, uh, which is underway now and policy initiatives for planning once the bud budget picture improves, uh, and maybe no later than the adoption in September, the final adoption, once uh, Measure K and the state budget are more certain. I mean, the state budget is is a mess too, as we know, and I don't think we're going to get a lot of help from the, the state. But uh, um, so maybe we'll know if there's going to be more federal reimbursement then. I just think we need to, uh, we're, we're uh, in a crisis now, uh, but I think we need to get more information as stabilization uh, once we know, um, you know, what if maybe Measure K, what that situation is, and then what the state budget is as well, and uh, if there's any federal movement as well. I, I think we ought to wait until September before we start moving, you know, you know down the road. Excuse the pun. Supervisor Hernandez. No, I think uh, CEO wanted to. Yeah, you. Um, so there's two things. One is you do have a motion on the table right now, and you had a second, so that was the motion. So that has to be dealt with. Um, the other thing I would suggest is along the lines of what Supervisor McPherson said is uh, Measure K, uh, we hope to have it resolved for sure by September. That's a good test of your theory. If you, if you think that is the priority of this board to put $6 million on Measure K, now, right now, a million is for affordable housing, a million dollars for homeless services, a million dollars for parks. So if you can get three votes to say, put it all towards roads, that's a good test, right? And then that shows that, okay, that would be, and that would be relatively painless because it's new money, right? So I think that's the start. And then uh, if the board wants to do that, then I think in September, we would have more information about how we've been uh, how we're doing financially, what the state cuts are, and then you could give us further direction to start looking for other funds in the general fund. Again, if there's three votes to want to do that. Um, but I, I don't think trying to blow up the budget right now is the right thing to do. So I would hope that we would draw your motion <laughs> and put one on the table that says, let's uh, look at, let's approve this budget. Let's come back in September with the, hopefully by then we would have Measure K allocated. It may be sooner, whenever we get information on Measure K, and then take the, at that point, uh, allocate Measure K funds towards roads or other. Right now, the existing direction is $1 million to roads out of Measure K. And out of the seven and a half that we're anticipating, $1 million. The other three, again, affordable housing, homeless services, and parks. Um, so, and then there's three and a half that's going into our contingencies, which is trying to help us balance the budget, basically. So I would, 
I would hope that you would do something along those lines. So I wasn't, you know, necessarily saying that we need to, I seconded the motion, but I wasn't saying that I'm full support of that, right? But for me, it's about making sure that we have in the budget that we're going to begin a planning process for Paulson. That's all I wanted. So are you going to withdraw your second to the motion? Well, uh, can I, I'll make a, Say I guess a substitute motion. Yeah. Uh, or wait, I think for, in terms of process, you can withdraw your motion, your motion make, and then make a okay. new motion. I'll withdraw my previous motion okay. and make a new motion, um, which is to move the recommended actions with the additional direction that at the September, I'm not sure the exact date, but September budget hearing, uh, we hear options to keep all permit fee revenue within the permitting division and allocate additional general fund money to the CDI department to cover planning, zoning, and administration, and allocate an additional uh, $4 million of general fund revenue to road maintenance um, out of current general fund revenues. And of course, this would assume that we'd have a separate discussion around Measure K. I'll second that. Now, when you say current, I mean, we don't have anything to spend now you mean with when we find out more in september well this is in september to consider yeah, okay. this not not in june well let me let me get some clarification on this still, as well i mean i get it we'll come back in september but you're still asking me to come back with options to make massive cuts in other departments okay so just to be clear yeah mm -hmm. the only way i can do that is to cut other departments well, so if you want to do second, that uh, have that debate at that time that's fine i'm right, trying I mean, to the, think uh, uh, maybe um what what would be what would meet you know where where we're trying to go trying to get a, a clearer picture in September of what we should do, so should we just make a motion that we uh, move this discussion on what we should do uh, regarding roads and Measure K revenues if it should come to pass uh, at the September meeting? Would that be pretty cut and dried? Yeah, I think the. The best thing would to be to do is to talk about Measure K funds because those are exist; those will be new funds. And right now, the direction of the board is to allocate only one million dollars to roads. So, if you want to change that, that would be the point. By then, we'll know if their, their lawsuit is resolved. We should be getting ready to implement Measure K, and then that's a good test to say if we're going to have uh, yeah. the votes to change the allocation of Measure K from the existing direction. And so that's what I'm suggesting, come back with Measure K. As far as going into the existing budget, I think you can do that, but it's a messy, it'll be messy. And again, there will be 300 people out here, all advocating for the public defender, all advocating for CORE, all advocating for homeless services that I'll be suggesting cutting, which I don't think you want to do at this point. So can I bring back and since I was a new motion, can I do an alternate motion to do staff recommendation, but just make sure that we have uh, a presentation on a plan for for Paulson on September? Yeah, there the, there's a motion that Supervisor Koenig made. There's not a second yet. Oh, so, okay. Unless you now, made a second. Oh, there wasn't. There wasn't, but I mean, oh. um, I, I think it's, I would be support, um, you know, except removing uh, the $4 million dollar figure uh, to sit more funding is based on circumstances in September. Um, I mean, we're, we're not committing one way or another right now to allocate okay. funds, right? We're simply asking, I mean, yes, it is a plan that would ultimately require cuts in other departments in order to provide some funding for roads uh, out of the general fund budget instead of zero uh, and to increase our support of the planning division in order to build another 5,000 units in the eight in the next eight years. I mean, but ultimately that's what, you know, budget discussions are for. They're not easy, especially on a limited budget like this. And so all we're asking, I mean, as you said, we could, you know, it could take six months, could take a year, but I mean, this is a way to consider, um, you know, some of the very real needs of our community. And I hear you, 300 people could show up. I got 300 people in my inbox uh, every day asking me to fix their roads. So, um, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be uh, being a good representative if I didn't say at this that we better start planning for just that. Now, is that, excuse me for interrupting, Chair. Um, um, <laughs> is that going to put you in a bind to say to propose cuts if we're talking? It's just dependent on Measure K becoming uh, workable. Uh, I just want to make that clear. I don't want to. There's two issues. One is the allocation of Measure K funds, which are new funds, right? Yes, right. So that's one discussion. 
And again, that the board direction at this point is to allocate 4 million, 1 million for affordable housing, 1 million for um, homeless services, 1 million for parks, 1 million for roads. The remainder, 3.5 million, is going to be allocated into contingency funds. So that's the existing direction of the board. So I would come back in September. By then, hopefully, we otherwise we could be having the discussion right now. But Measure K is frozen, right? Yeah. So by September, we would know. So that's one issue. The second issue that Supervisor Koenig is bringing up is actually reallocating the existing budget uh, to provide more resources to planning and to roads. So that's taking money from other. It's a zero sum game. There's only so much general fund money, and so you're talking about. Uh, an additional four million of what, as I understood, four million dollars to an, an additional four million reallocated from the general fund <clears throat> to roads, plus an unknown number for planning staff. But if we so, do that, excuse me, but if that we would do be that, budget cuts. We don't know where the four million we're going to take from. No, that's going to be budget cuts. I don't think we should go there. That's I, what I'm saying. I mean, core is five and a half million dollars. So I can propose here's four million dollars of cuts, cut core. Yeah. I mean, again, that's a discussion. We've gone through, you know, two days, full days of budget discussions and approved every one of them, but this yeah. one at the end here. So I, I just don't think we should uh, pinpoint where you should have to go to cut it. I just think we ought to get the criteria and then just with the indication of should Measure K uh, be uh, sustained, um, that that $4 million be allocated to roads of that. Would that work? Yeah, well, that's up to the board, right? If you, I, yeah, mean, I mean, yeah, we can come back and measure K, but that will be the discussion but that the board to have. Make you have to come back and say that we're going to cut four million someplace else, right? Because there was two issues. One is how to allocate measure K, and the other is taking more general fund money from other departments and giving it to roads and to planning. Yeah, that's it's a reallocation. So that means that you have to cut somewhere, right, from the general fund. Yeah. And I, that's the part I don't think it's a good idea to do. I think yeah. if you want to talk about Measure K, um, that's fine. And that's the board's direction. And if you want to talk about reallocating general fund, I think you should start that in September and work towards the next year's budget and make sure that there's three votes to with that direction, right? Because it's going to be painful. And like you said, that's what you folks are here to set priorities. But, you know, in the past, uh, the board has made those priorities and we have funded core. We have funded the public defender. We had funded parks. You know, we've done all those things. It's a tough, tough discussion, but certainly we could have that. But I would say you should build it, give us more time to work on that part. So to get there, uh, what do we have to take uh, a motion away then? Or is there anything on the, what's on the table? Uh, that's the motion that I would like to make that you come back in September, using the criteria, uh, the base of criteria that we have, that should Measure K uh, be uh, substantiated, that we we uh, commit four million dollars to road repairs in Santa Cruz County. That's in, I'm trying to get. I think so. A, so hang on a second. Motion. Hang on a second. second. As, as the chair, just step in. So there's a motion by Supervisor Koenig. There's a second by Supervisor McPherson. If Supervisor McPherson, if you'd like to make a, if you'd like to change the motion, I would say that I'd recommend you withdraw your second. If no one's willing to second, maybe the uh, maker of the motion, if they'd be willing to withdraw their motion, you would be able to make your motion. If the maker of the motion doesn't wish to withdraw their motion, we would see if there's a second. If there's no second, the motion fails, and then you would have the opportunity. Can you repeat the motion? I would. Oh, good. I would withdraw my second. Okay. Let's make it straightforward as can. Okay. Okay, so there's no motion on the floor, Supervisor McPherson, and then I'll, I have some comments that I want to make as it relates to Measure K, um, but I'll go ahead if you'd like to make your motion, or I can make my comments first. Um, yeah, if it's going to be uh, not messing with, uh, if it's going to be uh, bringing Measure K funding into place. It's, it's not necessarily because I do want to speak to Measure K as well. Okay. And so. Well, I'd like just to make the motion that we, um, Except this budget, um, with additional direction for the CAO and CDI to come back in September with the 
assuming that Measure K uh, is substantiated, that $4 million be committed to road improvements. Is there a second? Second. <laughs> okay, so a motion by Supervisor McPherson, seconded by Supervisor Koenig. I just want to make some um, brief remarks on this. Um, of the members of the board, I was the one who led the effort of all the supervisors on Measure K. I met weekly with the consultants. Um, we came up with the plan, we met with community members, went out and did the bulk of the fundraising along with some other folks um, from the county. And we were able to get the word out to voters and have this be a successful sales tax measure. And I will say that that measure was not equally supported by this board. We had four out of five board members who endorsed it. And now we have people who wanted, who weren't supportive of the tax measure, wanting to take the funds from that measure and allocate it to things that we did not outline within the sales tax measure. And that for me is really concerning because one of the things that I worked hard to do was to really see how we could convince the voters that if they allocated and wanted to move forward with the sales tax, that we would do our responsibility to spend that funding correctly and spend the money on what we said we're going to spend our money on. I understand that roads are really important, um, but that wasn't the number one thing that we went after. When we did our polling, we looked at what people wanted to see in terms of how they wanted their sales tax money passed or spent. You know, we saw a variety of these different items that have been brought up by the CAO homelessness, affordable housing, yes, roads and infrastructure, parks and environment. And I do believe that there was one other one around um, workforce and workforce retention. I'll have to go back and look at what we had, but there was definitely, if I remember correctly, there was a million dollars was supposed to be allocated towards supporting county workers. And I just wanna put it out there that if we come back in September, we're allocating 4 million to roads. We just have to remember that we have labor negotiations that are going to start in June. And the number one asset that we have here in our county is our workers. I understand that people want to get in and out of their houses and that people want to have access to their roads. But if we don't have the workers here to actually go out and do that work, then it doesn't matter how much money we put towards roads. And I would imagine that, you know, if they can't get their, their, their raises and there's the potential and then they want to push for a strike, then we have... We have to, but the money's going to have to come from somewhere. If we've already allocated the majority towards roads, we're going to have to make cuts to the general fund, and that might mean we have to do layoffs. So this is a very complex situation that we're in, given that we're not getting the money back from FEMA. Measure K is tied up. We're doing the best to allocate the resources right now. And so, and the, the voters just passed this, and now we're we have a number of other initiatives that are going to be on the ballot asking voters to tax themselves once again. And so I, I think that if we start moving in this direction that, you know, we're going to start undermining our ability to have the voters feel like they're supportive in investing in their local government. And so I think that maybe what, what we could do is have, have this conversation come back, approve the staff recommendation, and then revisit this conversation with in September when uh, we vote on the final budget and and then that way we can start talking about plans for moving forward with roads. In other words, withdraw the four million dollar figure from the motion. Yeah, I could be. That's fine. I mean, that just gives us time. We're going to have to make that decision one way or the other anyway. Come September, uh, so I uh, I would to make her the motion. I would be willing to not include the four million dollar figure in the motion, but just to have uh, the CAO and the CDI come back or the, the county come back with um, um, updated review of our county budget, uh, general fund budget. Thanks. I'm not going to second that. I'll let, you, let one of you guys second. I'll second. And, and I would just add as a friendly amendment, it sounds like there was interest in understanding the costs around filling some positions in the planning department, around building inspectors, what have you. There's been some expressive wanted to come back and have some information on coming up with plans for um, higher priority roads, which includes Paulson Road, and I would imagine Mountain Charlie as well. Um, but but I think that you get the overview is that people want to see a plan moving forward with some of these big disaster roads and how we're going to be able to improve housing um, in the planning department. So is that additional? 
I mean, it's just a recommendation. Recommendation? Yeah. Why don't we just leave it? Okay. We're going to get the overall picture yeah. of what we're facing yeah. if we have the extra $10 million. And right. We're seven and a half million for this the next fiscal year anyway. So I just I just like to leave it as simple as possible. Sounds good. Not designate anything for anybody. Sounds good. Before we vote, can I just make sure. a little, one comment? So, Measure K read a yes vote supported increasing the Santa Cruz County okay. sales tax by 0.5 percent, with revenue going to wildfire response and prevention, affordable housing, mental health and substance use programs, public safety, roads, parks, recreation programs to reduce homelessness. Now, wildfire response, because my understanding is that in this budget, we're actually reducing our mowing budget on county roads. Is that correct? Uh, we will see. We we will see a slight reduction in road maintenance. That's correct. I mean, roads are wildfire maintenance. They are wildfire prevention. You know, I, uh, anyway, I'll be voting no on the motion. I think we've discussed this enough. Okay. I think I won't be supporting it either. Well, um, so I would like to see if there's any recommendations on moving forward because what will happen now is that if there's two yes and two no, that means the motion fails. And if there's impasse here, I mean, I guess we would come back on June 4th to specifically vote on CDI's budget. But since we wouldn't have a finalized budget, then we'd have to come back again in June to vote on a different budget. I would actually support it with your additional uh, input, uh, Chair Cummings. Wait, uh, so what, what are you saying then? I mean, aside from... I just want to give us some flexibility. Uh, yeah. I think we're really, like I said, we spent two full days looking at a budget and you have to think you're going to cut something mm -hmm. that we're going to start this whole thing all over again. Uh, Let me see if I can. If you wanted to leave out $4 million figure, I, like I said, that'd be fine with me, but um, I think we just need to have that come back. And then... I, I just have to say, I, I also agree with the background on Measure K as well. You know, I think we talked with people that supported this this measure, and both nonprofits and everybody that worked on it. And you know, my even even my staff at eight a.m. to nine a.m. they would go out there and go to the meetings. But I think that um, let's be close. I think that that we have to find a middle ground. Is what we have to do. So let me see if I can try to get us moving forward. So I think like I'm comfortable with what Supervisor McPherson has recommended. And I, I think that what Supervisor Hernandez is wanting to see is as we have this discussion in September, that we're able to talk about a variety of things general, but it sounds like Paulson Road might be an example of something that would be brought up. The Hermit Center might be something that could be brought up. And so rather than identify specifics, I think, you all have heard from the board kind of what are some of the things that they want to hear come back at that meeting. So would that be sufficient for you all to be able to help address some of the concerns that are being mentioned right now? Yes. Yeah, so with regard to the like revised prioritization, we could certainly bring that back as part of the discussion. We could also bring back the, the desire to look at those that unfilled position in the permit center. So we could absolutely bring those back in full context to, to see how it fares safe with a Paulson or with a, a permit center service level. Absolutely. I'm, I'm thinking, I would like to see more uh, options provided actually for Paulson, right? So like funding options is what you're saying, right? Well, not funding, but just for the planning process. Scope? To begin, yeah. Scope. Sure, so we could certainly provide um, scoping options because we have been looking at that and talking about it. So we could bring some options for scope. Uh, I don't know that we could come in with a, a funding plan, but definitely scope of improvements, yes. Okay. Is that sufficient for you to be able to move forward today? Yes. All right, any further comments or questions? Okay, seeing none, I'll turn to the clerk for roll call vote. If I may, Chair, just sure. for the, the good of the record, Thank could you. we please have the motion on the floor currently restated? Sure. Thank you. Thank you. I, my recommendation is for the CAO and CDI to come back in September with uh, an overall viewpoint of where uh, the allocations of Measure K may be spent. 
in addition to moving the staff recommendation on the budget. Correct. Correct. Yeah. Thank you so much. And, is there anything missing? And the and the prioritization of projects around roads and or discussion about S scope of alternatives for Paulson. Right. Yeah. And and the planning. Right. Department. Right. Okay. All right. With that, let's have a roll call vote. One moment, Chair. No problem. If you get it right, God bless you. <laughs> Doing my best. Okay. Supervisor Koenig. No. Fernandez. Yes. McPherson. Aye. Cummings. Aye. With friend absent. Yes. So that passes with Cummings, McPherson, Hernandez voting in favor, Koenig voting in opposition, and friend absent. Okay. I was going to um, break for lunch, but you know we have one more item, which is capital projects. So I figure we can just go get through that one and then um, and we can be done for the day. All right, welcome, Elisa Benson. Thank you. I am thinking we will try and keep this brief. We will probably not cover all of the slides. Um, but uh, for the record, Elisa Benson, Assistant CAO, and I am the chair of our Capital Projects Review Committee. Um, so let's see. We have Damon, Brian, Michael, and Rebecca here to be part of this presentation. Um, we have the standard agenda that uh, you have been seeing throughout these. I will sort of jump to the punchline. As you've, as you've heard earlier, there is no new general fund funding for capital projects this year. So, so what we're presenting is really that overview of achievements and a little bit about where we're going from here. But as part of the financial situation we're in, there's no additional funding for capital projects this year. Uh, as you all know, this is really around uh, uh, improvements to our physical plant, whether it's buildings, parks, it, it's, that's what a capital project is. And we'll be covering county facilities and parks and open space. You had quite a longer discussion in the last item around uh, public works related uh, capital. Um, again, Capital Projects Review Committee, this is the uh, our organizi organizing structure for both um, the capital projects budget process, and also we uh, monitor the, de the delivery of capital projects along the way. Uh, and one of the key things that we've introduced is a scoring mechanism, a criteria, as you guys were talking about uh, with our CDI projects. These are the criteria we use in uh, capital projects funding that uh, are um, requested for general fund funding. So we have a, a score around equity and how it is addressing inequity in our community, county financial impact, health and safety, the community benefits are associated with it, and then how does it align with our environmental or strategic plans? I'm not going to go over this list. You've heard a lot about them um, in various uh, in various operating budget discussions. Two that we're very, very proud of are, um, well, proud of all of these, but excited for the June 11th opening of the South County Government Center. A lot of people on this team have been involved in that and making it uh, get to where it is finally today. And then the acquisition of 150 Westridge, we will actually be completing escrow on that in June. And then of course, really pushing forward and at the most accelerated pace we can on that children crisis uh, and residential center in mid county, critical, critical projects. With that, I'm gonna turn it to Ryan to briefly go over the, the non-budget of this year, but really the, the magnitude of the, the portfolio moving forward. Right. Uh, thanks, Elisa. Uh, I'm Ryan Friedrich. I'm uh, a senior a senior analyst in, in the uh, CAO's office, uh, and I uh, work on the capital budget. Um, what you see before year today is uh, a snapshot of our capital budget, which operates very differently than the operating departments that you see throughout these budget hearings. Uh, you see a, a really a dramatic difference between the current year budget and our current next year. And this because it's, this is the incremental ad additional value added to the portfolio or, versus the ad entire portfolio itself. So it's a bit of an apples to oranges comparison. Uh, a, a better way to look at our capital project budget is to look at it at, through the lens of an entire portfolio. You see uh, in our previous year, we had a 97 or 
uh, yeah, $97.3 million in total project value. We've completed over $43 million in projects this past year, which has been incredible. That number is going to rise as we get um, uh, towards the end of this fiscal year here coming up. Uh, just a modest uh, amount that is being proposed to be in addition to into our capital portfolio. That's related to parks dedication funds, which when I was thinking about is one of the few dedicated capital funding sources that is reoccurring. Just kind of an interesting fact uh, and observation there. Um, so we have a projected total portfolio going into fiscal year 25 of about $53 million. So while no new projects are being recommended in this budget, we still have a pretty robust portfolio that we are rolling forward into the next year. Uh, and then briefly, just wanted to highlight some of the community benefits uh, of our capital program, you know, related to bringing more services um, and equitable geographic distribution, you know, South County in particular, you know, investing in our, our uh, state-of-the-art, you know, uh, DNA lab, um, really looking at places where we are facilitating better community learning and gathering. And I think most importantly is we are, we maintain and are creating self safe welcoming spaces for the public and for our county workforce to operate and deliver their best services. Uh, as customary with the capital budget, budget uh, presentation, we bring a whole host of us um, up here as a team. Um, I want to introduce uh, next up is Michael Beaton, who's the Director of General Services, to talk more about our project management and delivery changes that we have coming up. Excellent. Uh, thank you, Ryan. Uh, thank you, board. Uh, again, Michael Beaton, Director of General Services for the County of Santa Cruz. Press the button. Press the button. Mm -hmm. How's that? Yeah, good. I'll just get closer. Um, one of the process improvements uh, implemented with this budget is the consolidation of the capital projects and real properties to the Department of General Services. The consolidation as discussed in part yesterday and today uh, um, today really operationalizes and streamlines property management, construction, and maintenance throughout the county's portfolio of buildings. This also establishes a single point of accountability for anything facilities related. With the vision of a single entity responsible for construction, maintenance, and management of the county properties makes it a single point of contact for anything facilities related. This consolidation will also help standardize project management throughout the county uh, to ensure compliance with federal, state, and local requirements. Over the past few years, the county has made some programmatic changes uh, to start addressing deferred maintenance throughout our county buildings. With the limited financial and personnel resources available to the county, the first was to establish of which buildings we should start investing into first and what projects we should start prioritizing this was accomplished through the completion of a facilities condition assessment of the majority of the county buildings owned and operated by the county. This assessment highlighted some of the significant deferred maintenance that exists within our county buildings. The report identified over $70 million of current deferred maintenance throughout our buildings. As such, this board has been gracious over the last few years to help fund some of those critical needs based on that report. Since we don't have the funding to fully address the deferred maintenance, we need to ensure what we do is a little bit smarter and what we do to our buildings will help them last longer. About eight months ago with the new county facility superintendent, Zach Hagler, uh, we have begun implementing a preventative maintenance program throughout our county buildings, which we have not seen in over 20 years in our county. This is considered a best practice in the industry because it will not only save our money, save money in the long run, it'll actually help extend the life of our assets that we currently do have in our county. So with that, I'd like to pass it over to uh, Director of Capital Projects, Damon Adlau. All right, thank you, Michael. Yeah, as uh, Michael mentioned, Damon Adlau, Director of Capital Projects. Um, currently, the, the Capital Projects section is man managing numerous projects in various stages of development. Uh, typically, our group will shepherd projects uh, from early conception and planning through design, permitting, bidding, and then through construction. Um, after construction, the closeout process occurs, and then we hand off the uh, projects to our county departmental partners and then GSD maintenance teams for maintenance. Um, the project types that we are primarily involved in are vertical projects, primarily building projects that range from major maintenance, infrastructure support buildings, large tenant improvements, and new facilities. 
uh, currently the capital project sec section is managing well over 32 different projects. Um, some of those highlighted projects, I think we mentioned them before, but I'm gonna go ahead and mention them again, are the Children's Crisis Center with first and second floors, uh, the Juvenile Hall Renovation Project, uh, the Behavioral Health Bridge Housing Project, which is uh, 32 units in Mid-County, and uh, uh, three different large CDI projects, including the Load Street um, building um, for the Sanitation District, uh, the Buena Vista and Ben Loman transfer stations. Some of the recent accomplishments and milestones include, as mentioned, the South County Government Center, which currently is having staff move-ins and is opening to the public. Uh, numerous libraries opening, uh, completing the Measure S uh, portfolio of projects. Um, acquisition and analysis of, of uh, ac acquiring new buildings, including 150 Westridge, and uh, design and permitting for multiple small and complex facilities for the county. Um, some specific uh, milestones. Uh, I know this sounds a little bit repetitive, but getting in, into a little bit more detail, Children's Crisis Center is currently on track um, to have the first floor open in late spring 2025 with the residential program opening in fall 2025. Um, the Bridge Housing Project, um, we're on track to be operational in early 2025. We'll be breaking ground on the Juvenile Hall project this fall, uh, pending final state approvals, which um, we're, we're optimistic about, and permitting for the CDI, permitting and design for the CDI projects that were mentioned earlier. A few of the challenges that our group is encountering, which we're all well aware of, um, are the um, in continued construction cost escalation. As we're aware of, since 2009, we've been on a pretty steady increase of about 7%. Now, none of us have crystal balls, but we're still essentially planning for that type of escalation. Um, in, in addition, we're uh, working on long-term capital planning and figuring out how phasing and sequencing of individual projects in our portfolio and how large capital projects relate to large um, major maintenance projects. Um, we're also encountering, still encountering material lead times that actually affects uh, projects directly. Um, and also, as you're all aware, well aware, the unique bidding climate for construction in the county, uh, which ultimately means a limited number of bidders for projects. Um, and I'll just get into a few of the solutions. So some of the solutions that my team's working on is alternative uh, project delivery methods. We're already utilizing JOC, which is job order contracting. We've already utilized in two projects over the last six years, design build. And then I'm interested in looking, we're interested in looking into uh, potential CM at risk and uh, private uh, public partnerships for larger developments. Uh, in addition to that, we're also developing standards so we can have flexible designs that uh, stand the test of time that are essentially trying to future proof our buildings. We know how um, the costs for buildings and we want to make sure that they're flexible spaces that can be reused differently in the future. These buildings are all gonna outlive all of us and we're gonna make sure that we, we leave uh, our future selves with a good product. And then um, also just using uh, standardizing processes and using uh, software so um, we're more flexible and efficient within our group. So with that, I'd like to hand it back to Michael. Yeah. Thank you, Damon. Right. Uh, uh, the projects and slides that uh, Damon just went over before are reflective of projects that were managed uh, previously by uh, CDI or under the direction of CDI. This slide uh, represents projects that were managed by the General Services Department. Through all, man, uh, through the consolidation, both departments get to combine their project management resources uh, for vertical projects. Over the past year, millions have been invested to address various projects with the majority driven by the facilities condition assessments. Some of those projects accomplishments were examples of the new boilers here at 701 Ocean Street, uh, replacement of boilers at the MOI campus, replacement of the lighting controls. So when you guys drive by at night, you'll actually see the lights are actually off here at 701. Uh, they've been broken for the last few years. And so we've had the lights on 24 seven at the government center for many, many years. So that's a that's a small, happy accomplishment uh, for the General Services Department. Uh, we've replaced the water line uh, to our main jail. We've replaced the boilers 
to our main jail. Uh, we also did the substantial completion for the sheriff's DNA lab, uh, which you heard today from uh, our sheriff. Um, as well, we have a brand new uh, generator at the main jail that powers 100% of the jail. Uh, previous to this generator being installed, we only powered about 50% of the jail operations. So to ensure that the jail can operate 24-7, uh, even in times of a power audit. Some of the Catonian projects that we continue to manage that will be ultimately moved over uh, under Damon's direction uh, with our consolidated project management team uh, are the new generators for the Roundtree Correctional Facility that's included in the budget or previous budget that will roll over. Also the MLI campus, creation of the Roundtree Correctional Dental Room and renovation of their shower facilities uh, due to age and decay and replacement of the HVAC system, a complete HVAC system replacement at 1400 MLI um, and 1430 Freedom Suite D. So it's just a little bit of a flavor of some of the projects that we have uh, that we're gonna have the benefit of consolidating uh, with project management to accomplish. With that said, oh, I'm sorry, I got my slide. Uh, uh, this slide basically depicts a lot of the upcoming milestones that we already talked about. So I'm not gonna spend too much time uh, discussing it. Uh, some of the challenges that we do have, uh, we have already mentioned that we have over $70 million of deferred maintenance throughout our county facilities. That, that's significant, and that number just continues to grow. But I'm excited with the work that we've been doing uh, to do things a little bit smarter, uh, to start prioritizing our financial resources, uh, that through our preventive maintenance program that we'll be able to extend the life of our assets a little bit longer and do things a little bit smarter. So. With that, uh, I'd like to transition over to Rebecca Hurley, uh, Assistant Director for Parks, uh, to hear about some of the Parks and Open Spaces programs. Good afternoon, Chair Cummings and Board. Nice to be back here again. Um, so I'm gonna quickly talk about some of the projects that I wasn't able to highlight earlier. So these slides should go by quickly. Um, overall, Parks has about 22 active projects in our capital projects purview. It's funded by multi a, a different multitude um, lines of streaming means, grants, um, park dedication fees, as we already stated, a little bit over $6 million there. Um, some of the projects I didn't mention is that we are for, uh, currently about to move forward with the storm damage repairs to the um, bank um, beneath, Soquel Creek, um, beneath Soquel Lions County Park adjacent to Soquel Creek. So this is a project that's funded by FEMA. Um, an additional pro project that we're looking forward to trying to move forward on is phase two of the renovations at Simpkins Family Swim Center. This is specific to um, replacing the currently closed and inadequate uh, water slide. And we're currently looking to go out for new plans and specs and cost estimates as the previous ones were to, from 2019. Next slide. So I always like to end on a positive, as most of you know. So some of the challenges have already been spoken about, um, you know, by my colleagues here is that we are anticipating increasing construction costs. We also at parks have staffing restraints as our um, park staff that manage projects also manage some of the non-infrastructure projects and endeavors that the parks department undertakes that I spoke about earlier in the parks presentation. Um, some of the upcoming milestones that we like to look at is we are anticipating in the July or August, we will do the groundbreaking ceremony for floral park reno um, playground renovation, as well as we are about to reopen the Simpkins Family Community Center um, meeting rooms, as that was a um, component that parks funded as a part of the capital projects Live Oak Library Annex build. Um, and so we're about to open those back to the public for reservations. I will now pass it back to Elisa Benson to wrap up the presentation. So the team's pretty much covered what's on this slide, so I don't need to cover it for you all again. But I would just summarize that in the last, you know, four to five years, even through COVID, some significant sort of best practices have been implemented around facilities management, including the long range facility plan, including the facility condition assessment work. This is where you start using data to really drive the limited decision funding spending decisions we can make around facilities. Uh, in the long term, you know, we do hope that through the internal service fund transition for general services, we will be able to develop a, a, a more strategic approach to funding facilities in the long run. With that, we would go to the last slide and just ask your approval of our no new money, 24, 25 uh, uh, parks and uh, general county facilities budget. If I could just add uh, real quick, um, although we're not asking for any new general fund 
um, allocations in this budget, because again, this is a very difficult budget year. We're in the middle of a major uh, budget cuts at the state, as well as all the issues we're facing locally. But many of those projects that were funded um, and that were listed, many of them did come out of the general fund. Uh, many of the sheriff projects were from the general fund and some of the parks project also were funded on measure G. We talked about measure G earlier. A lot of it was used for parks. So anyway, in the past, we have used quite a bit of general fund this year. We are not allocating any because we're trying to balance the budget. All right. Thank you very much. And thanks for the presentation and, you know, investing in our facilities is always critical. And so with that, um, I'm going to open up to the public to see if there's any member of the public here today who would like to speak to us on this item in chambers. Seeing none, I'm going to move it to online, see if there's any member of the public who would like to speak to us on capital projects. No speakers online, Chair. Okay, I'll bring it back to the board um, for any questions, comments, actions. Um, Supervisor, do you have any questions or comments? Sure. Yeah, well, a lot, a lot of great projects in the works here to look forward to. Looking forward to the opening of the Live Oak Library Annex and the community room at Simpkins, um, the um, groundbreaking and then ribbon cutting at Floral Street Park. Um, you know, even the repairs at SoCal Lions Park are going to be great. Um, you did mention that we've got about 70 million in deferred maintenance today, Director Beaton. How much is that growing by a year? Uh, sorry, say that again. You said we have seventy million in deferred maintenance today on county facilities, and that that grows every year by about how much? Yeah, so the uh, the facility condition assessment really looks at all the systems throughout the different county buildings, and some systems have a lifetime, uh, life a lifespan. Uh, some of the systems are changed because the building code changes, and the building may not be updated, such as fire, life safety. Uh, so it's not like a linear. Uh, projection. Um, but I do know looking at the graph over the next five years, I believe it does increase by about 15 million uh, at a five year picture. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. That's uh, nice to take better care of our facilities. I know you really, uh, within general services, try mightily to, to keep up um, with those maintenance requests. And um, yeah, at least we have the lights working here at, <laughs> at 701. It's great. Thanks. So, All right. Supervisor Hernandez. <laughs> You know, I'm excited about the uh, several things from, you know, the Sheriff's DNA Center, uh, the fact that it could bring possible positive impact, fiscal impacts for them and resolve crimes for victims and their families, um, and, uh, you know, to expedite that process. And the Children's Crisis Center, of course, it's very much needed in our communities, and it's the absolutely right thing to do. Of course, I'm excited about 500 West Ridge, the South County Government Center, and 150 West Ridge as well. You know, there's a large number of uh, South County employees, and hopefully this will reduce the vehicle miles traveled and increase the quality of life for our county employees as well. And, uh, of course, you know, the cost savings that we get from the West, West Beach uh, lease that we had and, of course, the 150 West Ridge lease that we had will also be a cost savings. Uh, the purchase will be a cost savings from the lease. Uh, and, you know, I'm glad that we got round tree improvements lined up in the future. And so we, um, and of course, 181 Whiting Park, um, 181 Whiting Road Park. I'm excited about that project. So, uh, you know, uh, I would be supporting that recommendation. Thank you. With you. Well, I'll make the I'll move uh, staff recommendation for proposed budget two and twenty five for capital projects. Second. Okay. We motion by Supervisor Hernandez, um, second by Supervisor McPherson. Supervisor McPherson, do you have any further comments on this item? Okay. Um, I just want to appreciate you all for your work. I actually, for whatever reason, thought that because the lights are energy efficient that are used in this building, that was part of why maybe you guys were keeping mind. I was, I was also confused because <laughs> when I first got on the board. There was, you know, our, 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 um, you could go in and kind of yes. use your ideas to go to different parts of the building. And so, but I had been getting a lot of questions from members of the community about why are the lights on all the time? And, you know, uh, it's good, good to hear that that issue has been solved. Um, so with that, uh, I'll take it to the clerk for a roll call vote on this item. Supervisor Koenig. Aye. Cummings. Sorry. Hernandez. No. <laughs> Aye. McPherson. Aye. Incoming. Aye. That passes with Supervisor Friend absent and concludes our 2024-25 uh, budget hearings. Looking forward to seeing you all on June 4th to conclude our budget.